The Tycoon. A Keeper at Heart Romance, Book 6. Written by Melissa McClone. Text Copyright 2020 by Melissa McClone. Production Copyright 2023 by Melissa McClone. In Memory of Chaos aka C.H. Janers 1 for the Road. July 2, 2005 to December 24, 2020. To Jan Herrings for introducing us to chaos and the world of dog showing. Special thanks to Terry Reed, Jennifer Shirk, Jennifer Short. And the Immersion Crew, Margie Lawson, Elizabeth Cockle, and Lori Freeland. Chapter 1. The incessant barking from the backyard of his grandmother's palatial estate confirmed Caleb Fairchild's fear. Dogs had taken over her life. His jaw tight, he pressed the doorbell. A symphony of chimes filled the air, drowning out the irritating barks. Forget Mozart and Bach. Only a commission piece from a respected New York composer would do to announce a visitor for Gertrude Fairchild. Not that it was out of her means. His grandmother had founded a billion-dollar skincare company with his late grandfather in Boise, Idaho. If Caleb didn't do something fast, her four-legged hobby might get in the way of Fairface's success and profits. That was the reason he was here, to put an end to her frivolous infatuation with man's best friend. The company didn't have the money to enter two new markets this year. Not if they wanted to do it the right way, as Fairface always did. The front door opened greeting him with a blast of cold air and a whiff of his grandmother's floral scent perfume. Grams. Short white curls bounced. She looked to be in her fifties, not her eighties, thanks to decades of using her own skincare products. Caleb. I saw your car on the security camera, so I told Mrs. Harrison I would answer the door. The words rushed from his grandmother's mouth faster than lobster tails disappeared from the buffet table at the country club. What are you doing here? Your assistant said you didn't have any free time this week. That's why I mailed you the dog care prototypes. He hadn't expected Grams to be so excited by his visit. He kissed her cheek. I'm never too busy for you. Her cornflower blue eyes danced with laughter. This is such a lovely surprise. Sweat trickled down his back. Too bad he couldn't blame the perspiration on the warm June day. He adjusted his yellow tie and then smoothed his suit jacket. No matter how professional he appeared, she wouldn't like what he had to say. I'm not here as your grandson. I need to speak with you as Fairface's CEO. Oh, sweetheart. The warmth in her voice added to his discomfort. I raised you. You'll always be my grandson first. Her words hit him like a sucker punch. He owed Grams everything. She opened the door wider. Come in. Nice sorry. Graham struck a pose. Just something I had in my closet. He entered the foyer. Better add Bollywood to your bucket list. Already have. She closed the door. Let's go out on the patio and chat. Chat, not speak, or discuss, or talk. Not good. Caleb glanced around. Something was off. Museum-worthy works of art hung in the same places. The squeaky dog toys and ravaged stuffed animals on the shiny hardwood floor were new. But the one thing he expected to see, what he wanted to see, what he longed to see was missing from its usual spot. His throat tightened. Where are the... In the living room. Caleb turned the corner and saw the three-foot U.S. Navy aircraft carrier replicas showcased on a new wooden display case. He touched the deck of the USS Ronald Reagan. Familiar. Soothing. Home. I've been making some changes, Graham said from behind him. They deserved a nicer place than the foyer. He faced her. Gramps would like this. That's what I thought, too. Have you eaten lunch? I grabbed something on my way over. Then you need dessert. I have cake. Made it myself. She touched Caleb's arm with her thin, vein-covered hand. Carrot, not chocolate, but still tasty. Grams always wanted to feed him. She wouldn't give up until he agreed to have a bite to eat. I'll have something before I leave. A satisfied smile graced her glossed lips. 
at least one of them was happy. Back in the foyer, he kicked a tennis ball with his foot. It's a miracle you don't break a hip with all these dog toys lying around. I might be old, but I'm still spry. His grandmother's gaze softened. She placed her hand over her heart. Heavens. Every time I see you, you remind me more and more of your father. God rest his soul. Caleb's stomach churned as if he'd eaten one too many spicy buffalo wings. He strived hard to be nothing like his feckless father. A man who'd wanted nothing to do with fair face. A man who'd blown through money like a hedge fund manager's mistress. A man who'd died in a fiery speedboat crash off the Côte d'Azur with his girlfriend du jour. His grandmother's gaze ran the length of Caleb. She clucked her tongue. But stopped dressing like a high-class mortician. Not this again. I'm not wearing black. It's the style. He raised his chin, undaunted, and followed her out of the foyer. You'd have me dress like a rugged, action-adventure movie star. A shirtless one, given the pictures you share on social media. They passed the dining room where two elaborate chandeliers hung above a hand-carved mahogany table that sat twenty. You're a handsome man, Graham said. Show off your assets. I'm the CEO. I have a professional image to maintain. There's no corporate policy that says your hair can't touch your collar. The cut suits my position. Your suits are another matter. She pointed at his chest. Your tie is too understated. Red screams power. We'll go shopping and turn you into a dapper tycoon. Women are looking for the whole package. That includes having stylish hair and being a snazzy dresser. And not taking your grandmother's fashion advice. They walked into the kitchen. A basket of fruit and a covered cake stand sat on the marble counter. Something simmered on the stove. The scent of basil filled the air. Normal things, but this visit home seemed anything but ordinary. Women only care about my net worth, he said. Some. Not all. She stopped and squeezed his hand, the way she'd done for as long as Caleb remembered. Her tender touch and her warm hugs had seen him through death, heartbreak, and everyday life. You'll find a woman who cares only about you. Difficult to do when he wasn't looking, but he wouldn't tell Grams that today. One piece of bad news a day met her quota. I enjoy being single. You must have one-night stands or friends with benefits. He flinched. You're spending too much time online or watching reality TV shows. A disturbing realization formed in his mind. Discussing sex might be more comfortable than talking to Grams about her dog skincare products. She placed her hands on her hips. I would like great-grandchildren one of these years while I can still get on the floor and play with them. Why do you think I created the organic baby line? Everyone at the company knows you want great-grandchildren. What's a woman to do? She put her palms up. Gold bracelets clinked against each other. You and your sister are in no rush to give me great-grandbabies while I'm still breathing. Can you imagine Courtney as a mom? She has some growing up to do, Grams admitted, but with no accusation or disappointment. She walked into the family room with its leather couches, huge television, and enough books on the floor-to-ceiling bookshelves to start a library. Though I give you credit for at least proposing to that money-grubbing floozy, Cassandra. Cassandra. Unwelcome memories flooded him. His heart cried foul. Cheat. Sucker. The woman had introduced herself to him at a benefit dinner. Smart and sexy, Cassandra knew what buttons to push to become the center of his universe. She'd made him feel more like a warrior than a businessman. She'd jokingly called him a tycoon, pretending his money hadn't mattered to her. Marriage hadn't been on his radar screen. Still, when she gave him an ultimatum, he'd played right into her hand with a romantic proposal and a stunning three-carat engagement ring, only to find out everything about her and their relationship had been a scam, a ruse, a lie. Cassandra Fitz. Grams held up three fingers. Not signing the agreed-upon prenup and two-timing you. Then, hiring a divorce attorney before saying I do. No wonder you're afraid to date. He squared his shoulders. I'm not afraid. 
not afraid of Cassandra or of any woman. But he was cautious. When Cassandra wouldn't sign the prenup, he'd called off the wedding and broken up with her. She'd begged him for a second chance, and he'd been tempted to reconcile until a private investigator proved she was a gold digger in the same league as his mother. Grams waved a hand in the air as if she could brush aside all of the bad things in the world. Light reflected off her three diamond rings, anniversary presents from his grandfather. I shouldn't have mentioned the Jezebel. At least Caleb had escaped relatively unscathed except for a bruised ego and a broken heart. Unlike his father, who'd wound up with two kids he'd never wanted. She exited the house through the family room's French doors. He followed her outside to see new furniture, a large, gleaming teak table surrounded by matching wood chairs, a hammock, and padded loungers. The sun beat down. He pulled out a chair for his grandmother, whose Saturday it's hot. Let me put up the umbrella. Grams picked up a black rectangular remote. I've got it. She pressed a button. A cantilevered umbrella opened, covering them in shade. He joined her at the table. What do you think about the dog products? Grams asked. No birds chirped. Even the crickets seemed to be napping. The only sounds were an occasional bark and his grandfather's voice in his head. Do what must be done. For fair face. For your grandmother. Caleb would rather be in his office dealing with end-of-quarter results. Who is he kidding? He'd rather be anywhere else right now. They are interesting prototypes, he said. The fragrance and texture are appealing. Grams whistled. Wait until you see them in action. Dogs ran full speed from around the corner, a blur of gray, brown, and black. The three animals stopped at his grandmother's feet, mouths panting and tails wagging. Feel how soft they are. Pride filled her voice as if the dogs were as much a part of her gene pool as Caleb was. He rested his hands on the table, not about to touch the animals. Most fur is soft if a dog is clean. Not dozers. She scooped up the little brown dog, whose right eye had been sewn shut. Not an expensive show dog. A rescue or foster. His hair was bristly and dry with flakes. Doggy dandruff? Allergies. Animals have sensitivities like humans. That's why companies need to use natural and organic ingredients. No nasty chemicals or additives. Look at Dozer now. She stared at the dog with the same love and acceptance she'd always given Courtney and Caleb, even before their father had dumped them here after their mother ran off with her personal trainer. That's why I developed Fairface's new line of animal products. As he ignored the gray dog brushing against his leg, Caleb held up his hands to stop her. Fairface doesn't manufacture animal products. Her grin didn't falter. Not yet, but you will. I've tested the formulas on my consultant and myself. We've used them on my dogs. I didn't know you hired a consultant. Which meant she was paying the woman personally, or Caleb would have had to approve the expenditure. Her name is Becca. You'll love her. He doubted that. Most consultants were only looking for a big payday. He'd have to check this Becca's qualifications. You realize Fairface is a skincare company. Human skin. Skin or fur. Two legs or four. Change, expansion is important for a company to remain relevant. Not in this case. He needed to be careful not to hurt his grandmother's feelings. We've tied up our resources with the launch of the organic baby care line. Now isn't the time to expose ourselves to more risk. Lines tightened around her mouth. Your grandfather built fair face by taking risks. Sometimes you have to put yourself out on a limb. Limbs break. I have 1,133 employees who count on me to make sure they receive paychecks. What I'm asking you to do is not risky. The formulas are ready to go into production. Put together a pilot sales program, and we're all set. It's not that simple, Graham's Fairface is a multinational company. We have extra product testing and research to ensure ourselves against liability issues. The words came out slowly, full of intent and purpose and zero emotion. 
his grandmother was the smartest woman he knew and used to getting her way. If he weren't careful, he would find himself not only manufacturing her products but also taking a dog home, likely the one-eyed mutt with soft fur. I won't expose Fair Face to the additional expense of trying to break into an unknown market. You agreed we should go all in with the baby line. Graham sighed, a long, drawn-out breath he hadn't heard since Courtney lost her passport in Prague when she was supposed to be in Milan. Sometimes, I wish you had a little more of your father in you instead of being so buttoned down and by the book. The aggravation in her voice matched the tension cording in Caleb's neck. The tightness seeped to his shoulders before spilling down his spine. This isn't personal. I can't afford to make a mistake, and you should be enjoying your retirement, not working in your lab. I'm a chemist. That's what I do. You didn't have this problem with the organic baby line. Frustration tinged each of her words, matching the I wish you'd drop it gleam in her eyes. I see what's going on. You don't like the dog care products. I never said that. But it's the truth. She studied him as if she were trying to prove a hypothesis. You've got that look. The same one you had when you said it didn't matter if your father came home for Christmas. I never needed him here. I had you and Gramps. Caleb would try a new tactic. He scooted his chair closer. Remember Gramps's marketing tagline. The fairest face of all. His words continue to define the company today. Fifty years later. Caleb leaned toward her as if his nearness would soften the blow. I'm sorry to say it, but dog products, no matter how natural or organic or aromatherapeutic, have no place at Fair Face. It's still my company. She enunciated each word with a firm voice punctuated by her ramrod posture. Disappointing his grandmother was something his father did, not Caleb. He felt like a jerk. One with a silk noose around his neck, choking him. I know that, but it's not only my decision. A plane flew overhead, and a dog barked. But neither sound kept the silence at the table from deepening. He prepared himself to say what he'd come here to say. I met with the department heads before coming over here. Showed them your prototypes. Ran the numbers. Calculated margins. And. Everyone has high expectations for your baby skincare line, he said. But they agree, moving into animal products will affect Fairface's reputation, not enhance our brand, and lead to loss of revenue, anywhere from 2.3 to 5.7%. Caleb expected to see a reaction, hear a retort. But Grams remained silent, nuzzling the dog against her neck. Everyone thinks this, she asked. He nodded once. Disbelief flickered across her face. She'd looked the same way when she learned of his grandfather's Alzheimer's diagnosis. But then something sparked, a spark of resignation. No, a flash of resolve. Well, that settles it. I trust you know what's best for Fair Face. She sounded doting and grandmotherly, not disappointed and hurt. Becca and I will figure out another way. For what? Gramza's eyes darkened to a steely blue. To manufacture the products. You and those suits at Fair Face are wrong. There's a market for my dog skincare line. A big one. Chapter 2 The sun's rays warmed Becca Taylor's cheeks. The sweet scent of roses floated on the air. She walked across the manicured lawn in Gertie's backyard with Maurice, a Norwegian elkhound, and Snowy, a Bichon Frise. The show dogs sniffed the ground, looking for any dropped treats or a place to do their business. She tucked her cell phone into her shorts pocket. Don't get sidetracked, boys. Gertie is waiting for us on the patio. Becca had no idea what her boss wanted. She didn't care. Gertie had rescued Becca the same way she'd rescued the foster dogs living at the estate. This was only a temporary stopping place, but being here gave them hope of finding a forever home. Becca had a similar hope for herself. Morris's ears perked. Do you hear Gertie? The two dogs ran toward the patio. Becca quickened her pace. She rounded a corner. Gertie and a man sat at the teak table underneath the shade of the umbrella. Five dogs vied for attention, paws pounding on the pavement. 
Gertie waved. The man next to her turned around. Whoa. Hello, Mr. Gorgeous. Tingles skittered from Becca's stomach to her fingertips. None of the dogs growled or barked at the guy, points in his favor. Dogs were the best judges of character, much better than her. She walked onto the patio. He stood. Another wave of tingles made the rounds. Most guys she knew didn't stand, didn't open doors. Didn't leave the toilet seat down. Someone had raised this man right. He was attractive with classical features, high cheekbones, straight nose, strong jawline. The kind of handsome that women showed off to girlfriends. The man stepped away from the table, angling his body toward her. His tailored navy pinstriped suit accentuated broad shoulders and tapered nicely at the hips. He moved with the grace of an athlete. Very nice packaging. Well, except for his hair. His short, cookie-cutter, corporate hairstyle was typical of men walking out of every high-rise in downtown Boise. With such a gorgeous face, the man's light brown hair should be longer, a little must, sexy, and carefree, instead of something so, businesslike. Not that his hair mattered to Becca. Or anything else about him. His top-of-the-line suit shouted one thing, best in show. She might be a dog handler, but she didn't handle his type. They didn't belong in the same ring. He was a champion with an endless pedigree while she was a mutt without a collar. She'd tried playing with the top dogs, the wealthy dogs, once before and landed in the doghouse, aka jail. Never again. But just looking never hurt anybody. Gertie glanced up from the dogs. Becca. There's someone I want you to meet. He was tall, over six feet. The top of her head came to the tip of his nose. Becca took two steps closer. Hello. His green eyes reminded her of Jade, a bit cool for her taste, but hey, no one was perfect. His eyelashes more than made up for whatever reserve reflected in his gaze. If she had thick, dark lashes like his, she would never need to buy mascara again. She wiped her hand on her shorts and then extended her arm. I'm Becca Taylor. His grip was firm, his skin warm. A burst of heat shot up her hand and pulsed through her veins. Caleb Fairchild. His deep voice reminded her of melted dark chocolate, rich and smooth and tasty. Wait a minute. Fairchild. That meant he was. My grandson, Gertie said. The man who would make Becca's dream of working as a full-time dog handler come true. If the dog products sold as well as Gertie expected, Becca would have the means to travel the dog show circuit without needing to work extra part-time jobs to cover living expenses. Caleb Fairchild. She couldn't believe he was here. That had to mean good news. Oh. Ogling him was the last thing she should be doing. He was the CEO of Fair Face and Wealthy. Wealthy, as in she could win the lottery twice and not come close to his net worth. Nice to meet you. Becca was still holding his hand. Oops. She released it. Gertie's told me lots about you. Caleb's gaze slid over her as if he'd reviewed the evidence, passed judgment, and sentenced her to the not worth his time crowd. I haven't heard about you until today. His formal demeanor made Jane Austen's Mr. Darcy seem downright provincial. No doubt, Mr. Fairchild thought he was too good for her. He might be. But she wouldn't let it bother her. Her career was not only at stake, but also in his hands. Tell me about yourself, he said. His stiff tone irritated her like a flea infestation in the middle of winter. But she wouldn't allow her annoyance to show. She met his gaze straight on, making sure she didn't blink or appear weak. I'm a dog person. I thought you were a consultant. A what? Becca struggled for something to say and came up empty. Still, she had to try. I, I. Becca is a dog consultant, Gertie said. She's a true dog whisperer. Her veterinary knowledge has been invaluable for product development. I don't know what I'd do without her. If Becca wasn't already indebted to Gertie Fairchild, she was now. Gertie shot a pointed look at Caleb. 
Perhaps if you dropped by more often, you'd know what's going on. Caleb's smile, directed at his grandmother, redefined the word charming. Not that Becca was about to be charmed. The dogs might like him, but she was reserving judgment. I see you every Sunday for brunch at the club. Caleb's affection for his grandmother wrapped around Becca like a thick, warm comforter, weighing the scales in his favor. But you never talk about yourself. Gertie shrugged, but hurt flashed in her eyes so fast Becca doubted if Caleb noticed. Oh, it just seems like we end up talking about you and Courtney. Well, I'm here now, he said. Gertie placed her hand over her heart and closed her eyes. To dash all my hopes and dreams. Becca's gaze bounced between the two. What do you mean? Caleb touched Gertie's arm. My grandmother is being melodramatic. As she opened her eyes, Gertie pursed her lips. I'm entitled to be a drama queen. You don't want our pet products. No. 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 If that were true, it would ruin everything. Gertie wouldn't go forward with the products without her company backing them. Becca forced herself to breathe. I don't understand. Gertie shook her head. My grandson, the CEO, and his closed-minded cronies at my company believe our dog skincare line will devalue their brand. That's stupid and short-sighted, Becca said. Caleb eyed her as if she were the bounty, a half-eaten mouse or bird, left on the porch, by an outdoor cat. That's quite an opinion for a, consultant. Not for a dog consultant. The words came out more harshly than Becca intended, but if she couldn't change his mind, she would be back to living in a single wide behind Otto. Otto, her parents' longtime trailer park manager, wore stiletto heels with his camouflage and skinned squirrels for fun. Do you know how much people spend annually on their pets? Billions. Over $50 billion. Food and vet costs are the largest portion, but analysts project over $4 billion will be spent on pet services. That includes grooming. Gertie's products are amazing. Better than anything on the market. Gertie nodded. If only my dear husband were still around. He'd jump on this opportunity. Gramps would agree with me. Caleb frowned, not a sad one, more of a do-we-have-to-go-through-this-again frown. Fair face is not being short-sighted. We have a strategic plan. Becca forced herself not to slump. So, change your plan. Where did you get your MBA? He asked. Try an AA degree. I didn't study business. I'm a certified veterinary technician, but my most valuable education came from the School of Hard Knocks. A.K.A. the Idaho Women's Correctional Center. As I explained to my grandmother, the decision about manufacturing the dog skincare line is out of my hands. Caleb's polite tone surprised Becca but provided no comfort. Not after she'd poured her heart and soul into the dog products. If the decision was all yours? His hard, cold gaze locked on hers. I still wouldn't manufacture them. The words slammed into Becca like a fist to her jaw. She took a step back, but she couldn't retreat. Instead, her gaze narrowed. How could you do this to your grandmother? Caleb opened his mouth to speak. Gertie placed her hand on his shoulder. I'll help Becca understand. He muttered a thank you. This decision is in the best interest of fair face. Gertie sounded surprisingly calm. It's okay. But it wasn't. Becca had thought this time would be different. That she could be a part of something, something big and successful and special. That maybe, just maybe, dreams could come true. She should have known better. Things never worked out for girls, women, like Becca. And never would. Her heart in her throat, Becca walked to where the grass met the patio, so her back was to Gertie and Caleb. She picked up a ball and tossed it. One dog retrieved it, but the others panted with eagerness, waiting for the ball to be thrown again. And again. And again. If she kept playing fetch, Becca's shoulders wouldn't sag. She would rather curl up in the kennel with the dogs than be here. 
Dogs gave her so much, loyalty, companionship, and most importantly, love. Dogs loved unconditionally. They cared, no matter what. They accepted her for who she was with no explanations. Unlike people. Come sit with us, Gertie said. Us. A sheen of sweat covered Becca's skin from the warm temperature, but she shivered. Caleb had multi-millions, and Gertie had over a billion. Becca had $8,428. She didn't want much, a roof over her head, a dog to call her own, and the chance to prove herself as a professional handler. Not a lot to ask. But those dreams had imploded, thanks to Caleb Fairchild. Becca didn't want to spend another minute with the man. She glanced at her boss. Please, Becca. The words were drawn out with the undertone of a plea. Gertie might be more upset about Fairface not wanting to take on her new products than she acted. Becca whipped around. Forced a smile. Took a step onto the patio. Sure, I'll sit for a few minutes. Caleb remained standing, a tall, dream-crushing force she never wanted to reckon with again. As she walked to the table, she didn't acknowledge his presence with a second glance or an excuse me as she passed. Gertie had to be reeling, the same as Becca, after what he'd said. I still wouldn't manufacture them. Her blood boiled. She touched Gertie's thin shoulder, not knowing how else to comfort her employer, her friend. The luxurious silk beneath Becca's palm would soon be a thing of the past. She wouldn't miss the trappings of wealth. She would miss this amazing woman, the one who had almost made Becca believe anything was possible. Almost. I'm so sorry. A lump burned in her throat. Her eyes stung. She blinked. You've worked so hard and wasted so much time for nothing. Gertie waved her hand as if her arm were an enchanted wand that could make everything better. Diamonds sparkled beneath the sun. Prisms of lights danced. If only magic existed. None of this has been a waste, dear. Gertie smiled up at Becca. Not the trying hard to smile and not cry of someone disappointed and reeling, but one full of light and hope. The products are top-notch. You said so yourself. Nothing has changed, despite what my grandson thinks. He gave a barely perceptible shake of his head. Obviously, he disagreed with his grandmother. Gertie didn't appear deterred. That made little sense to Becca because Caleb was the CEO and had the final say. She sat next to Gertie. But a fair face doesn't want the products. You and I will start our own company. Gertie spoke with a sing-song voice. We'll manufacture the products without fair face. Our own company. It wasn't over. Becca's breath hitched and her vision blurred. She touched her fingers to her lips. The dream wasn't dead. But she didn't understand. Gertie had always spoken as if working with fair face on the products was a done deal. But if going into business was their only option, that would have to do. Okay. Your consultant doesn't sound very confident, Caleb said to Gertie. Face it. You're a chemist, not a businesswoman. His gaze traveled to Becca. Please talk some sense into my grandmother about this crazy idea of hers. Becca clenched her hands. She might know nothing about business, but she didn't like Caleb's condescending attitude. The guy had some nerve discounting his grandmother. Forget Jade. The color of his eyes reminded her of cucumbers or fava beans. Not only cool, but uninspiring. Change and taking a risk weren't part of his vocabulary. But they were hers. Makes perfect sense to me. I'm in. Wonderful. Gertie clapped her hands together. We'll need an advisor. Caleb? A horrified expression distorted his face as if he'd been asked to battle the zombie apocalypse alone and empty-handed. He took a step back and bumped into a lounge chair. Come on, Grams. You know better than anyone I don't have the time, even if I wanted to. His words, or perhaps, an excuse, didn't surprise her. The guy kept glancing at his watch. 
Becca would bet five bucks he had his life scheduled down to the minute with alarms on his phone set to ring, buzz, or whistle reminders. You wouldn't leave us on our own to figure things out. Gertie fluttered her eyelashes as if she were some helpless female, about as helpless as a charging rhino. You must find the time. His chin jutted forward. No doubt walking across burning coals on his hands would be more appealing than helping them. Sorry, Grams. I can't. Good. Becca didn't want his help any more than he wanted to give it. We'll find someone else to advise us. Gertie grinned, the kind of grin that scientists got when they made a discovery and were about to shout Eureka. Or. Or what? Becca said at the same time as Caleb. We'll see if another company is interested in partnering with us. Gertie listed what Becca assumed to be Fairface's main competitors. As Caleb's lips tightened, his face reddened. His nostrils flared. Well played, Gertie. Becca bit back a smile. Not a scientific breakthrough, but a way to break Caleb. Gertie was not only intelligent, but was also skilled in getting what she wanted. That was how Becca had ended up living at the estate. Caleb didn't stand a chance against his grandmother. You wouldn't, he said. They're my formulas. Developed with my money in my lab here at my house, Gertie said. I can do whatever I want with them. True. But Gertie owned the privately held fair face. Becca didn't need an MBA from a hallowed ivy-covered institute to understand Gertie's actions might have repercussions. Caleb rested his hands on the back of the chair. One by one, his fingers tightened around the wood until his knuckles turned white. Say no. Becca didn't want him to advise them. She would rather not see Caleb again. An unwelcome physical attraction kept her gaze returning to him. Strange. She preferred going out with a rough-around-the-edges and not-so-full-of-themselves type of guy. Working class, like her. Any attraction to a man who had both money and power was stupid and dangerous. Men like that would ruin her plans. Her life. One had. Of course, Caleb hadn't shown the slightest interest in her. He wouldn't. He would never lower his standards except for one night at best. No, thanks. Becca wanted nothing to do with Caleb Fairchild. Chapter 3 Caleb was trapped by the patio furniture and by his grandmother. This was not how he'd expected the meeting to go. He was outnumbered and had no reinforcements. Time to stop her before he ended up manufacturing her dog products. His narrowed gaze would have told her he knew what she was doing, except she was more interested in the tail wagging, paw prancing dogs at her feet. No problem, he was an expert at handling grams. Her so called consultant was another matter. Becca seemed pleased by his predicament. She sat with her shoulders squared and her lips pursed as if she were looking for a fight. Not exactly the behavior he would have expected from a professional, even a dog one. He would bet Becca was the one who talked Grams into making the dog line. Nothing else would explain why his grandmother had strayed from developing products that had made her and Fairface a fortune. Becca had to be behind all this nonsense. The woman was likely a con artist looking to turn a consulting gig into a big payoff. She might even steal things when Grams wasn't paying attention. A heist of artwork, jewelry, and silver was likely in the works. His wealthy family had always been a target for people wanting to take advantage of them. People like Cassandra. Grams could be in real danger. Sure, Becca looked more like a college student than a scammer. Especially wearing a no outfit is complete without dog hair t shirt and jean shorts that showed off long, smooth, thoroughbred legs. She had great legs. He would give her that. But looks could be deceiving. He'd fallen for Cassandra and her glamorous facade. Not that Becca was anywhere close to glamorous. With her short, pixie cut brown hair and no makeup, she was pretty in a girl next door kind of way. If he'd had a next door neighbor not separated by acres of land, high fences, and security cameras. But she wasn't all rainbows and apple pie. Her blue eyes, tired and hardened and weary, contradicted her youthful appearance. She wasn't innocent or naive. 
not one of the princess types he'd known at school or the social climbers from around town. She had an edge to her, and that intrigued him. Worried him, too. He didn't want anyone taking advantage of Grams. Speaking of which, he faced his grandmother. It won't work. Grams glanced up from the dogs. The five animals worshipped at her feet as if she were a demigod or a large slice of bacon dressed in pink. What won't work, dear? A smile tugged on the corners of Becca's mouth, not hiding her amusement at the situation. Caleb pressed his lips together. He didn't like her. Any consultant with an ounce of integrity would have sided with him. But what did he expect from a woman who wore sports sandals with neon orange and green toenail polish to work? He bet she was covered with tattoos and piercings beneath her clothing. Images of her filled his mind. Focus. He rocked back on his heels. If you partner with a fair face competitor, the media will turn this into a firestorm. Imagine the employees' reactions. You're the creative influence behind our products. How will you reconcile what you do for one company with the other? Animal products for the new one. Human products for fair face. A sheepish grin formed on his grandmother's lips. It's only a thought. A dog tried to get his attention, first rubbing against Caleb's leg, and then staring up at him. It seemed as if everyone was giving him the soulful puppy eyes today. A ploy. Gramst sked. I would never resort to such a tactic. Yeah, right. Caleb remembered looking at colleges to attend and his grandmother's subsequent reactions. Naval Academy, too dangerous. Harvard, too far. Cal Berkeley, too hippie. She'd steered him where she'd wanted him, Stanford, her alma mater. I'm sure you'd resort to worse to get your way. That earned him a grin from Becca. Glad someone found this entertaining. Though her pleasant smile reminded him of springtime and fresh flowers. An odd comparison, given he had little time to enjoy the outdoors these days. Maybe because they were outside. I shouldn't have to resort to anything, Graham said. You promised your grandfather you'd take care of us. Something Caleb would never forget. That promise directed the course of his life. For better or worse, given that his grandmother, his sister, fair face, and the employees were now his responsibility. He grimaced. I'm doing the best I can. Grams rubbed a gray dog named Blue, but she didn't say a word. He recognized her trick, using silence to make him give in, the way his grandfather had capitulated in the past. But Caleb wouldn't surrender. Grams. Gertie, didn't you mention the other day how busy Fairface keeps your grandson? Becca interrupted. It might be better to find a different advisor to help us since Caleb is so busy. Whoa. Becca wanted to be his ally. Caleb's hinky meter shot into the red zone. No one was that nice to a total stranger. She must want him out of the way so she could run her scam in peace. Good idea. He would play along and catch Becca in a lie or trip her up somehow. I'm not sure I'd have a few minutes to spare until the baby product line launches, if then. You understand how it is. Yes, I do. Grams tapped her fingers against her chin. But, I prefer keeping things in the family. So much for taking her formulas to a competitor. You wouldn't want me to ignore the company, would you? His grandmother's gaze narrowed as if zooming in on a target, him. Who's trying to guilt who now? He raised his hands in surrender. Fair enough. Maybe Caleb knows someone who can help us, Becca said. He would rather they drop this whole thing but once Graham saw what starting her own business entailed, she would decide retirement was a better alternative. He would get someone he trusted to advise them, monitor Becca, and steer his grandmother properly. Caleb would still be in control by proxy. I'm happy to give you a few names. There's one person who would be an excellent fit. I suppose it's worth a try, Graham said. Definitely. Enthusiasm filled Becca's voice. We can do this. We? Us? Caleb straightened. Becca acted more like a partner. He needed to talk to his grandmother about what sort of contract she had with her consultant. 
Something about Becca bothered him. She had to be up to no good. I'll text you the names and numbers, Grams. Send Becca the list. As you said, I'm a chemist, not a businesswoman. Will do. Caleb glanced at his watch, bent, and kissed his grandmother's cheek. Now, if you ladies will excuse me, I need to get back to the office. Grams grabbed hold of his hand. Her thin fingers dug into his skin. You can't leave. You haven't had cake. The carrot cake. Caleb had forgotten, but he couldn't ignore the pile of work waiting for him on his desk. He rechecked his watch. Gertie baked it herself. You need to try a piece. Becca's voice sounded lighthearted, but her pointed look contained a clear warning. Caleb had better stay if he knew what was good for him. The consultant was protective of his grandmother. Usually, that was his job. Becca's concern might be genuine or a ruse, most likely the latter, but she was correct about one thing. It wouldn't take that long to eat a slice of cake. No reason to keep disappointing Grams. He would also use the opportunity to ask Grams for more information about her dog consultant. Caleb placed his arm around his grandmother. I'd love a piece of your cake and a glass of iced tea. Dogs raced around Becca, jumping and barking and chasing balls. She stood in the center of the lawn while Gertie went into the house to have Mrs. Harrison prepare the refreshments. Becca played with the dogs. That was more fun than sitting with Caleb. She saw no reason to make idle chit-chat with a man eager to eat his cake and get out of there. She much preferred four-footed, fur-covered company to dismissive CEOs. Dogs were her best friends, even when they were a little naughty. You're a mess, Blue. She picked strands of grass and twigs from the Carrie Blue Terrier's gray hair. Let's clean you up before Gertie returns. Dogs, no matter a purebred like Blue or a mutt like Dozer, loved to get dirty. Gertie didn't mind, but Becca tried to keep the dogs looking half decent, even when playing. Blue licked her hand. She kissed his head. Such a good boy. You like dogs. Becca jumped. She didn't have to turn around to know Caleb was right behind her, but she glanced over her shoulder, anyway. I love dogs. They're my life. His cold gaze examined her as if she were a stock he was deciding to buy or sell, making her feel exposed. Naked. Her nose itched. Her lungs didn't want to fill with air. He stepped forward to stand next to her. Your life as a dog consultant? Gertie came up with that title. But I am a dog handler, groomer, and certified vet tech. A Jill of all trades. That was one way to describe it. Desperate to make a living working with animals and to become a full-time professional dog handler was another. When it comes to dogs. Snowy and Maurice chased each other, barking. Dozer played tug-of-war with Hunter, a 13-inch beagle, growling. Blue sat at Becca's feet, waiting. I need to put the dogs in the kennel. Confusion clouded Caleb's gaze. He might as well have spoken the question on his mind aloud. Yes, Gertie has a kennel, she said. Lines appeared on his forehead. How did you know what I was thinking? Your face. Becca almost laughed. I'm guessing you don't play poker. Unless you prefer losing money. Caleb looked amused, not angry. That surprised her. Hey, he said. I used to be good. If the other players were blind. Haha. -ha. Well, you don't have much of a poker face. At least not with his grandmother. Or with Becca. He puffed out his chest. We're not playing cards. But you're looking at a real card shark. She liked his willingness to poke fun at himself. I believe you. No, you don't. Heat rushed up to her neck. Okay, I don't. Honest. I try to be. He wasn't talking about cards any longer. She picked up a ball. It's important to play fair. Caleb's eyebrow twitched. Do you have a good poker face? You figured out what I was thinking, so probably not. No aces up your sleeve? 
Not my style. What is your style? Strategy over deceit. Becca couldn't tell if he believed her, but she hoped he did because he was Gertie's grandson. That's why I'd never sit at a poker table with you. You're too easy to read. It would be like stealing a bone from a puppy. A puppy, huh? A manly pup. If that makes you feel better. He grinned wryly. Wouldn't want to be a girly dog. His gaze held hers. Becca stared, mesmerized. Something passed between them. A look. A connection. Her pulse quickened. He looked away. What was happening? She didn't date guys like him. Even if she did, he was too much of a boy scout. And it was clear he disliked her. I have to go. I want to see the kennel. Uh, sure. But being near him unsettled her. She pointed to the left. It's down by the guest cottage. Caleb fell into step next to Becca, shortening his stride to match hers. How did you meet my grandmother? She called the five dogs. They followed. At the Rose City Classic. He gave her a blank stare. It's in Portland. One of the biggest dog shows on the West Coast. Your grandmother hired me to take Snowy into the breed ring. Ended up with a group third. A very good day. Blue darted off as if he were looking for something, a toy, a ball, or a squirrel. Becca whistled for him. He trotted back with a sad expression in his brown eyes. Caleb rubbed his chin. I have no idea what you just said. Dog show speak. Snowy won third place in the group ring. In his case, the non-sporting group. Third place is good? The result pleased Gertie. She offered me a job taking care of her dogs, including the fosters and rescues, here at the estate. And the dog skincare line? She sprang that on me after I arrived. Surprise filled his eyes but disappeared quickly. Sounds like you're a big help to her. I try to be. Your grandmother's wonderful. She is. He looked at her. I'd hate to see anyone take advantage of her kindness. Not anyone. Becca. The accusation in his voice made her feel like a death row inmate. Each muscle tightened in preparation for a fight, and the balls of her sandals pressed harder against the grass. She fought the urge to mount a defense. If this were a test, she didn't want to fail. I'd hate that to happen, too. The silence stretched between them. His assessing gaze never wavered from hers. Disconcerted, she fiddled with a thread from her short's hem. Caleb reached out to Dozer, who walked next to them. Funny, considering he'd ignored the dogs before. Dozer nudged his hand. With a tender smile, he patted the dog's head. Becca's heart bumped. Nothing was more attractive than a man being sweet to animals. A good thing. Caleb's physical appearance was easy to overlook, given his personality and suspicions. You helped me with my grandmother, he said. Are you trying to get me out of the way? At least he was direct. She wet her lips, not liking how he raised both her hackles and temperature. It's obvious you don't want to work with us. I don't have time, he clarified. There's never enough time. Dozer ran off, chasing a butterfly. It's a valuable commodity, Caleb said. Easy to waste when you spend it unwisely. Experience talking? Mostly an observation. Maurice approached Caleb. The dog loved attention and went up to anyone with a free hand to pet him. He bent over. And then Becca remembered. Wait. Caleb touched the dog. He jerked back. A cereal bowl-sized glob of dark and light hair clung to his hand. What the? Maurice brushed against Caleb's pant leg, covering the dark fabric in hair as well. Oh, no. She bit the inside of her cheek. This overweight husky is shedding all his fur. The frown on Caleb's face matched the frustration in his voice. Enough to stuff a pillow. Maurice is a Norwegian elkhound. He's blowing his coat. 
The guilty expression on the dog's face reminded her of the time he'd stolen food out of the garbage can. She motioned him over and patted his head. This wasn't the dog's fault. Unlike Caleb, she was used to the shedding, a small price, to pay for his love. They do that a couple of times a year. It's a mess to clean up. Now you tell me. His tone bristled as if she were the one to blame. Becca was about to tell him if he spent any time here, with his grandmother, he would know about Maurice, but decided against it. If she lightened the mood, Caleb might stop acting so, upset. Look at the bright side. His mouth slanted. What is that? You're wearing navy, instead of black. He said nothing, and then a smile, cracked open on his face, taking her breath away. I guess I am lucky. Though it's only dog hair, not the end of the world. If he kept grinning, it might be the end of hers. Caleb brushed the hair away, but he ended up spreading it up to his sleeve and onto the front of his suit. Be careful. She remembered he had to return to the office. Or you'll make it. Worse. He glanced down and half laughed. Too late. It was her turn to smile. I have a lint roller. I can clean up your suit in a jiffy. Amusement filled his eyes. I thought you liked dog hair. Huh? Your t-shirt. She read the saying. Oh, yes. Dog hair is an occupational hazard. Yet, you keep a lint brush. It comes in handy at times. Do you make a habit of cleaning men's clothing? His tone sounded playful, almost flirty. That made no sense. Caleb wouldn't flirt with her after he practically accused her of stealing his inheritance. Was he trying a different tactic? Best to stay on her guard. She rubbed her lips together. Not, um, usually. Something, interest, or it might be mischief, flared in his eyes. I'm honored. Nerves overwhelmed her. A guy like Caleb was nothing but trouble. She took a deep breath. Do you have other clothes with you? It's easier to get the dog hair off if you aren't wearing your pants. Easier, but not impossible. Becca pictured herself rolling the lint brush over his pants. Her temperature shot up 10 degrees. She crossed her arms over her chest. You can use the roller brush yourself. He grinned wryly. My gym bag is in the car. An image of him in a pair of shorts, and a t-shirt, stretched across his muscular chest and arms, rooted itself in her mind. Wait a minute. Did he say gym bag? That meant he had time to work out, but no time to spend with Gertie. Becca's blood pressure rose, but she wouldn't allow it to spiral out of control. She shouldn't judge him. People did that with her, and usually got it wrong. Maybe his priorities had gotten mixed up. She would give him the benefit of the doubt, for now. Go change, she said. I'll put the dogs in the kennel and grab the lint brush out of the guest cottage. Are you using it as your office? I live there. His mouth dropped open. He closed it. Why? The word dripped with so much snobbery Becca felt as if someone had dumped a bucket of ice-cold water on her head. He waited for her to respond. A hundred and two different answers raced through her mind. She settled on one. Because Gertie thought it would be for the best. Best for you. Yes. But there was more to it than that. Best for Gertie, too. Confusion filled his gaze. My grandmother lacks nothing. He sounded so confident, not the least bit defensive. A good sign, but still. She shouldn't have brought this up, but her affection for Gertie meant not backing down. Becca wanted Caleb to stop blowing off his grandmother. Gertie said living here would make it easier for me to do my job without having to drive back and forth all the time. But I also think she wants me here, because she's lonely. My grandmother, lonely? The disbelief in his words irritated Becca. If she realized this, so should her grandson. Yes. That's impossible. Gertie Fairchild has hundreds of friends. She's a social butterfly who turns down invitations, otherwise, she'd always be gone. 
She has the means to go out whenever she wants. She has an entire staff to take care of the house and the grounds. No way is she lonely. What Caleb said might have been true once, but no longer. Gertie has a staff, but we're employees. She has lunch twice a week with friends. But she hasn't attended any parties since I moved in. She prefers to spend time in her lab. The lab is keeping her from her friends? Your grandmother would rather spend time with her family, not friends. He grimaced. My sister and I. See her every Sunday for brunch at the club. But since I arrived, neither you nor your sister has stopped by. Not until today. As I said. You've been busy, Becca finished for him. Caleb shot a sideways glance at the house. All Grams has to do is call. I'll do whatever she asks. Gertie asked for your help with the dog care products. That's different? A vein at his neck throbbed. You've got a cush job living here at the estate. I'm sure my grandmother's paying you a bundle to care for a few dogs and prance them around the ring. What's it to you, anyway? He sounded defensive. She would, too. Realizing you'd screwed up was never easy. Boy, did she know that. Gertie's helped me a lot. I want her to be happy. Trust me, she's happy. But you have some nerve sponging off my grandmother, helping her with her wild dog product scheme and then telling me how I should act with my family. Not defensive. Overconfident. Cocky. Clueless. Caleb Fairchild was no different than the other people who saw her as dirt to be wiped off the bottom of their expensive designer shoes. At least she'd tried for Gertie's sake. Becca reached out her hand. Give me your jacket. You'll help me after trying to make me feel like a jerk, he asked. Mission accomplished, but he had only himself to blame. I said I'd help. I only told you the truth. His eyes narrowed. He didn't believe her. That made them even, because she didn't trust him. As you see it, he said. She met his gaze straight on. I could say the same about your truth. They stood there, locked in a stare down. Stalemate. At least we know where we stand, he said. Becca wasn't so sure, because being with Caleb was like riding a gravity-defying roller coaster. He left her breathless, scared to death, and never wanting to get on again. She hated it. Him. She held up his jacket. And I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing it for Gertie. Chapter 4 Caleb changed into shorts and a t-shirt. When he returned to the patio, china, crystal glasses, and a glass-blown vase filled with yellow and pink roses from the garden were on the table. Very feminine. Very much as grandmother. You've gone all out. I enjoy having company. With a beaming grin, Grams patted the seat next to her. Sit and eat. As Caleb sat, he stared at Becca. What was she doing here? He wanted to speak to Grams alone, to discuss Becca and his concerns about the so-called dog consultant and if she was exploiting his grandmother's generosity. Sneaky scam artist or sweet dog lover. Becca seemed to be a contradiction, and that confused him. On their way to the kennel, he'd sensed a connection. Something he hadn't felt in a couple of years. Not since Cassandra. But he no longer trusted those feelings about a total stranger. Besides, Becca wasn't his usual type. Caleb dated high-powered professional women, but he'd flirted and had fun until she'd ruined the moment with her ridiculous grandmother is lonely spiel. Becca was wrong. He couldn't wait to prove how wrong. He sliced through his cake with his fork. The silver tines pinged against the porcelain plate. You must be hungry, Graham said. He nodded before taking a bite. Becca drank from her glass of ice water. Do the dogs usually stay in the kennel all day, he asked. A rivulet of condensation rolled down her glass. She placed it on the corner of the yellow floral placemat. No, they are outside most of the time, but if they were here, they would be out of control over the cake. Dogs eat cake, he asked. Becca refilled her water from a glass pitcher with lemons floating on the top. 
A guilty expression crossed his grandmother's face. I never give them much. Never any chocolate. But when they stare up at me as if they're starving, it's too hard not to give them a taste. Those dogs are skilled in getting what they want. Laughter filled Becca's eyes. They're spoiled rotten. Nothing wrong with being spoiled and pampered, Grams agreed. Not at all. Becca sounded wistful. I'd love to be one of your dogs. Her words surprised Caleb. She didn't seem like the primping and pampering type. He sipped his iced tea. She picked up a bite of cake with her fork. Her lips parted. Fairface made a lipstick that plumped lips, making them fuller and, according to the marketing department, more desirable. Becca's lips were perfect the way they were. She raised the fork. Like a moth to a blowtorch, Caleb watched her, mesmerized. He placed his glass on the table. She brought the cake closer to her mouth until her lips closed around the end of the fork. Over the past ten seconds, the sweat at the back of his neck had made his t-shirt collar shrink two sizes. She pulled out the empty fork. A dab of enticing frosting sat on the corner of her mouth. A very lickable position. Stop. Caleb wasn't into licking. Especially not his grandmother's employee, who claimed to know more about Grams than he did. The woman was dangerous. He stared at his plate. If making him feel worse had been Becca's goal, she'd succeeded. He was also aggravated. Annoyed. Attracted. No, not attracted. Distracted. By the frosting. His gaze strayed back to the creamy dab on Becca's face. Yes, that was it. The icing. He placed his fork on the plate. Not the lick. You can't be finished. Graham sounded distressed that he hadn't eaten the whole slice. The last thing Caleb wanted was to eat more cake. He needed to figure out what was going on with Becca and then get out of here. I'm letting the food settle before I have more. He sneaked a peek at her. The tip of her pink tongue darted out, licking her top lip to remove the bit of frosting before disappearing back into her mouth. Caleb stuck two fingers inside his collar and tugged, hard. The afternoon heat was making him sweat. He should go to the gym instead of back to the office. A workout would clear his head and help him focus on the right things. He wiped his mouth with a yellow napkin. Becca should have used hers instead of her tongue. Was she trying to be provocative and flirty? Becca might see dollar signs when she looked at him as Cassandra had. No, that didn't match what Becca had said. She didn't want him to object to her involvement with Gertie. His grandmother had to be the mark, not him. The cake is delicious, he said. The frosting has the right amount of sweetness. Eyes bright, Grams leaned forward over the table. I'm so happy you like it. I've been working hard on the recipe. With a sweet grin that reminded him of cotton candy, Becca motioned to her plate. Only half the slice remained. You've perfected it. Grams chuckled. Took me enough attempts. I've enjoyed each slice. Becca patted her trim waistline. As you can tell. Nonsense, Graham said. You have a lovely figure. Not that a few slices of cake ever hurt anybody. Men like curves, isn't that right, Caleb? He choked on the cake in his mouth. Becca's curves were the last thing he should check out. Mmm. See. Graham said lightheartedly. Warm affection filled Becca's eyes. I'm sold. Caleb's gaze darted between the two women. Graham's treated Becca more like a friend than an employee. That was typical of his grandmother's interactions with her staff, including the dowdy Mrs. Harrison, a fifty-something widow who preferred to go by her last name. Still, Graham's and Becca's familiarity raised more suspicions, given the differences in their social status personalities, and ages. His grandmother always took in strays and treated them well. Becca played her role flawlessly in that scenario but added a twist by becoming indispensable and irreplaceable. Something was off here. Grams is an excellent baker. You should have been here on Monday, Becca said. Gertie knocked it out of the park with her black forest cake. Seriously to die for. 
Black Forest cake, he asked. Gramps nodded with a knowing gleam in her eyes. Your favorite. That had been only three days ago. Caleb stared at his plate. Carrot cake was Courtney's favorite, and Gramps had made his favorite a few days ago. Puzzle pieces fell into place like the colored blocks on a Rubik's Cube. A seven-layer lead weight settled in the pit of Caleb's stomach. How many cakes do you bake a week? It depends on how long we take to eat one, she answered. The question ricocheted through him. We? Becca. The estate staff. My lab assistants. Whoever else is here, Grams explained. Sometimes, Becca takes the leftovers to the vet clinic when she covers shifts there. Wait a minute. He assumed his grandmother paid Becca well and allowed her to live in the guest cottage rent-free. Why would Becca work at a vet clinic, too? Especially if she was running a con? Sounds like a lot of cake. Caleb tried to reconcile what he was learning about Becca with his grandmother's cake. I didn't realize you enjoyed baking so much. Grams raised a shoulder, but there was nothing casual or indifferent in the movement. Can't have one of my grandchildren stop by and not have any cake to eat. But I also think she wants me here because she's lonely. His chest tightened because Becca was right. Grams was lonely. Regret slithered through him. As he thought about the number of cakes baked with anticipation and love and a big dose of hope, Caleb struggled to breathe. He figured Grams would be out and about doing whatever retired women did to pass the time, lunches, museums, fundraisers. He'd never expected she would go to so much trouble or imagine she would sit at home and wait for her grandchildren to visit. His promise to his grandfather and his efforts blew up like a 50-megaton bomb. So much for taking care of Grams, Caleb had failed. He hadn't taken care of her but let her down. Just like his dad had. Guilt churned in Caleb's gut. He opened his mouth to speak, but he wasn't sure what to say. I'm sorry wasn't enough. He pressed his lips together. Did you have something you wanted to say? Grams asked. Caleb glanced up. His grandmother was speaking to Becca. Of course, that woman would say something, a smug remark or a smart aleck comment to expose his failure aloud. Anything so she could rub a ten-pound bag of salt into the gaping hole over his heart. No, Becca said, but that didn't soothe him, because she had an I-told-you-so smile plastered on her face. She looked pleased, almost giddy, that he'd proven her correct. How deeply had she ingrained herself in Grams's life? How well Becca read his family concerned him. He needed to find his grandmother a new consultant, one with a better education, wardrobe, and manners. One he trusted. Becca's silly, canary-eating grin made the Cheshire cat look as if he were frowning. She raised a forkful of cake to her mouth. Each movement seemed exaggerated, almost slow motion, as if waiting to make the next move so he would suffer. Good luck with that. Nothing would make Caleb feel any worse. He had to make this up to Grams. You can have another slice after you finish the first, Grams said. One is enough for today, he said. But please tell me when you bake another black forest cake, and I'll stop by. A dazzling smile on his grandmother's face, the kind that could power a city for a day, reaffirmed how lonely she must be despite her money and friends. That loneliness made her vulnerable to people like Becca who wanted to take advantage of her. I'll do that, Graham said. He ground the toe of his running shoe against the tile. Caleb had tried to be a doting grandson, but his phone calls, text messages, and brunch on Sunday hadn't been enough. Grams wanted to spend face-to-face -face time with her grandchildren, to chat with them, and to feed them. His overbooked calendar flashed in his mind. Arm and shoulder muscles bunched as if he'd done too many burpees at the gym. He was so screwed. No, that wasn't right. This was his grandmother, not some stranger. He'd made a promise, one he intended to honor if it killed him. And it might do that unless Caleb could figure something out. A way to spend more time with Grams, make more time for her. Fine time. Becca's fork scraped against the plate. Food. That gave him an idea. He had to eat. So did Grams. 
meal times would allow him to eat and appease his grandmother's need to see her grandson at the same time. The question was, how often? Brunch was a standing date. Dinner once a week would be a good start. Let's have dinner next Wednesday. Invite Courtney to come, he suggested. I'm sure your cook can whip up something tasty for us. You can make dessert. Graham shimmied her narrow shoulders as if she were a teenager bursting with excitement, not an older woman. Oh. Once a week might not be enough. His chest tightened. That sounds wonderful, Graham said. Do you think Courtney can make it? The anticipation in his grandmother's voice made one thing certain. His sister would be at the dinner if he had to buy her a pretty, expensive bauble or a pair of designer shoes. Graham's was worth it. Yes. She'll be here. Graham's appeared ready to float away like a helium balloon. Excellent, because I can't wait for Courtney to meet Becca. Caleb rolled his shoulders, trying to loosen the knots. He didn't want her at dinner. As far as he was concerned, the woman had overstayed her welcome. This meal was for his family, not employees. He flashed her a practiced smile, so practiced, people never saw through it. But the way Becca studied him made him wonder if she was the exception to the rule. He tilted his head. Join us for a glass of wine on Wednesday. Becca brushed her knuckles across her lips. I don't want to intrude on your evening. You aren't intruding, Graham said before he could reply. You're having dinner with us. No, he said at the same time as Becca. His gaze locked on hers for an uncomfortable second before he looked away. Only ice remained in his glass, but he picked it up and sipped. The woman was unpredictable. One more thing not to like about her. He was more of a load the dice ahead of time so he knew what he would roll kind of guy. He didn't like surprises. He would bet Becca thrived upon them. Grams's lip curled. Caleb. Becca studied her cake as if a magic treasure were hidden inside. It's okay, Gertie. No, it wasn't. He deserved his grandmother's sharp tone. What I meant is, Courtney is a lot to take in if you're not used to being around her. They'll name a hurricane after her one of these days. Your sister can be challenging at times, Graham said. Understatement of the year. Courtney was the definition of a drama princess. The rest of the Earth's population was here to make his sister look good or help her out. Nothing he tried stopped her from being selfish. Not even making her work at fair face to gain access to her trust fund. We don't want Courtney to overwhelm Becca and make her want to hightail it out of here. On second thought, getting Becca out of the picture was what he wanted to happen. Grams would never start a business venture on her own. Caleb might have to rethink this. Becca won't be overwhelmed. She's made of stronger stuff than that, Graham said. Thanks, but you need this time alone with your grandchildren. Becca's eyelids blinked rapidly, like the shutter on a sports photographer's camera. I can't make it, anyway. I'm covering a shift for a vet tech at the 24-hour animal hospital on Wednesday. That's too bad, he said. She toyed with her napkin, her fingers speeding up as if someone had pressed the accelerator. A good thing the napkin was cloth, or it would be shredded to bits. It is, Becca said. But I'm sure you'll have a wonderful time together. Her sugary sweet voice sounded relieved not to be a part of the dinner. Maybe she had seen through him, but that would be a first. You'll be missed. As much as a case of poison oak. A dismayed expression crossed Grams's face, washing over her like a robe wave. Her shoulders hunched. You're working that night, Becca? The tremble in her voice sent Caleb's pulse revving up like a race car engine. Unease spiraled inside him. He reached for his grandmother's hand, covering hers with his. Her skin felt warm, but her pulse wasn't racing. Good signs, he hoped. Grams? You okay? She stared at her hands. I forgot about Becca working on Wednesday. I have an assistant who reminds me of things, but... Graham shook her head slowly as if she were moving through syrup, not air. Caleb understood her worry. His grandfather had Alzheimer's, a horrible disease for the patient and the family. 
being forgotten by the man who'd held their lives together for so long hadn't been easy. But Grams had dealt with the stress with raw strength and never-ending grace and by making jokes. He'd never seen his grandmother act like this, not even when she'd been stuck in bed with an upper respiratory infection over a year ago. No worries. You've had a lot on your mind. That's right, Becca agreed. Caleb wondered if she knew something about his grandmother's health. Except Becca looked genuinely concerned. Grams gave his hand a feeble squeeze. I should remember Becca's work schedule. I never told you about next week's schedule. Becca's voice was soft and nurturing and oh so appealing. I received the call this morning about what shifts I'll be covering. You didn't forget. I didn't? Grams asked. Hearing the unfamiliar uncertainty in her voice worried Caleb. Nope, Becca confirmed. Whether or not his grandmother had forgotten, she seemed so much older and fragile. Time to call her doctor. He patted her hand. I'm sticking around this afternoon. This would wreak havoc with his schedule, but he needed to be here for his grandmother. He would use the time to figure out what was going on with Becca. I can finish up my work here, and then we'll have dinner. Graham straightened. All signs of weakness disappeared like a wilted flower that found new life. Her smile took twenty years from her face. Her eyes twinkled. She pulled her hand from beneath his and rubbed her palms together. That will be perfectly splendid. Ha! Huh. Her transformation stunned him. Mora, the new cook, is making lasagna tonight. She's using my recipe for the sauce, Graham said to him. Becca loves my sauce, don't you? Amusement gleamed in Becca's eyes. I do. Caleb didn't understand what she found so funny. His grandmother's health wasn't a laughing matter. Sounds great, but let's phone your doctor first. Nothing is wrong with me. Grams waved off his concern as if he'd asked if she wanted a slice of lemon in her iced tea. I had a complete physical two months ago. Dr. Latham said I'm healthy, with a memory an elephant would envy. That didn't explain what had happened with her only moments ago. A call won't take long. Grams's lips formed a perfect O. She leaned toward him. You're worried about me. No sense in denying the obvious. He nodded. She touched the side of his face. You've always been the sweetest boy. He blew out a frustrated puff of air. I haven't been a boy for a while. True, but I remember when you ran around the house naked. She looked at Becca while heat rose in his cheeks. He never wanted to wear clothes unless it was a superhero costume or camouflage. Forget the doctor. Might as well call the coroner. For him. Cause of death, embarrassment. I was what? Three? Three, four, and five. It seems like yesterday, Graham said with a touch of nostalgia. She stood. Please don't worry about me. I'm fine. Caleb wasn't sure about that. He rose. She motioned him to sit. Eat your cake. I'll tell Mrs. Harrison you're staying for dinner. I'll go with you, he said. Becca gave him the thumbs down sign. Caleb would have to be blind to misinterpret that signal. He Saturday or I can finish my cake. Do that. Then use the study to work. The words were barely out of Grams's mouth before she bounced toward the house. The French doors slammed shut. Caleb leaned over the table toward Becca. He might not like her. He sure didn't trust her, but she was the only one he could ask. What's going on with my grandmother? Chapter 5 Becca understood Caleb's concern. She'd been worried, too, until she realized Gertie was faking her memory loss. Becca glanced at the house, biting back a smile. I imagine your grandmother's in a mad rush to get to the pantry for the ingredients for a black forest cake. His eyes darkened to an emerald green. Make that the color of steamed broccoli. His mouth pinched at the corners. What? Remember how you talked about your grandmother using ploys to get her way? His gaze narrowed. Yes. Gertie played both of us by pretending to be a forgetful granny. She wouldn't. She just did. 
It was all Becca could do not to bust out in a belly laugh. You'd better work on your poker face or prepare for more of her antics since it worked. Huh? You not only stayed for cake, but you're also having dinner. He rubbed the back of his neck. Grams played me like a well-tuned Stradivarius, didn't she? Perhaps not that well-tuned. Touché. Your grandmother is the smartest woman I know. You seem sharp yourself. Warmth emanated from Becca's stomach. She hoped the heat didn't spread to her face. No one except Gertie had ever called Becca sharp. Thanks, but what she was doing wasn't hard to figure out. What tipped you off? He leaned back in his chair, looking relaxed and comfortable. Different. More approachable in the workout clothes. Becca? Oops. She'd been staring. Her cheeks warmed. A pale pink, she hoped. I hadn't told Gertie about my work schedule. But when she stared at your hand on hers, I knew something was up. I thought it was strange, but Grams knows how to push my buttons when she wants. She had me worried about her health. Desperation can drive a person to do things they normally wouldn't. He tossed Becca one of those UV got to be kidding looks. My grandmother is not desperate. I would be, if someone I loved kept blowing me off. You don't have to keep rubbing it in. I'll spend more time with her. Glad to hear it. She expected Caleb to be angry, not repentant. This softer side of him surprised her, given his suspicions. Appealed to her, too. You have no idea how lucky you are. Gertie is amazing. Don't take her for granted. You seem to care about Grams. Becca nodded. I wish she was my grandmother. Do you have family close by? He asked. Southern Idaho. I don't see them much. Becca didn't like the conversation turning toward her. She stood. I have to go. Caleb scooted back in his chair. Where? To get your suit. Before you leave. One question. What? Are my grandmother's dog products that good? Will you believe what I say? I asked for your opinion. He hadn't answered her question. Maybe he had a better poker face than she thought. The products are incredible. They'll sell themselves. You sound certain. Confident. I am, she said. The line will make a fortune, but fair face shouldn't manufacture it. His jaw tensed. But that's what you and Grams wanted. It was, but not now. Are you trying to get rid of me? Sort of. His eyes darkened. Why is that? If Fairface doesn't believe in the products, they won't put their resources behind them, she said. Fairface will do enough, just enough, to appease Gertie. The line might not fail, but it won't succeed as it could without the right backing and support. For a dog consultant, you have a lot of business savvy. Becca hated that his words meant as much as they did. They shouldn't. Not really. It's common sense. Not having fair face involved means more money for you. She hadn't considered that. More money would be great. I'm sure it would be. As if Caleb could understand what money would mean to her. The man had never gone hungry because there wasn't enough to pay for groceries. He'd never worn thrift shop clothes and duct taped shoes. He'd never left prison with nothing except a backpack and an appointment with a probation officer. Are you thinking about how you'll spend all that money? He asked. No, I'm wondering about our next step, she said. I'll give you my number. Text me the names and numbers of potential advisors. No need. Her heart dropped. What do you mean? I have the perfect person to help you in grams. She fisted her hands in anticipation. Who? Me. No. 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 Every nerve ending shrieked. You don't have time. That was before you made me realize I've neglected my grandmother and need to spend more time with her. Oh, no. Becca had brought this upon herself. You should do something fun with Gertie, not work with her. 
You said she liked to work. She does. But, Becca swallowed. You don't want to ignore fair face. I'll figure it out. This way, I'll be able to help you, too. He sounded so confident, as if nothing could stop him. I can answer questions you have, make sure things stay on track, perhaps provide angel funding. That should make you happy. The crooked smile on Caleb's face told Becca he expected her to be unhappy about this. Goal achieved, because she was. I. Trust me. She would never trust a man with so much money and power. She chewed the inside of her cheek. I hate to put you out like this. It isn't necessary. No worries. Honest. The charming smile, spreading across his face, made her breath hitch. Besides, I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing it for my grandmother. The next afternoon, Caleb left his office and headed to his grandmother's estate. He hoped the element of surprise worked in his favor today. Unlike yesterday, when he'd been caught off guard by most everything. His spending time with and advising his grandmother were the perfect ruses for Caleb's unannounced visit. He would keep an eye on Becca until he figured out her scam. The estate's housekeeper, Mrs. Harrison, answered the door. She told him Grams was in the lab, which he expected, and Becca was in the study, which he hadn't. Every nerve ending stood at alert. The dog consultant shouldn't be allowed free reign around the estate. She shouldn't sit in the same study where his grandfather worked. She shouldn't be here at all. He stood in the doorway to the study, watching her. With a laptop at her left, she was hunched over, pencil in hand, scribbling notes on paper. She wore a green t-shirt. He assumed she had on shorts, but only crossed long legs and a barefoot swinging showed beneath the desk. Looks like you're working hard? Or brainstorming ways to con grams out of money? Becca's gaze jerked up. As her eyes widened, she lowered her mechanical pencil. Caleb. I didn't know you were stopping by. I thought I'd see if you have questions about the business plan we discussed last night. That's what I'm working on. Convenient. Unless she was lying. He took a step toward her. Let me see what you've got. She frowned. I only started this morning. I'm your advisor, he said in an even voice. No reason to make her aware of his suspicions. It's my job to keep you headed in the right direction. And make sure she didn't hurt what mattered most to him. Becca eyed him warily. I didn't realize CEOs micromanage their employees. You don't work for me. If she did, he would have fired her yesterday when she gave away her actual intention. Are you trying to get rid of me? Sort of. Not sort of. She wanted him gone so she could scam Grams out of as much money as possible. That was why he'd agreed to advise them, why he'd taken part in a conference call on the way over here, why he would check in with them daily to protect Grams and fair face. But, I am advising you. For now. He'd hired a private investigator to dig into Becca's background, but until the man reported in, Caleb would stick close to her, even if it messed up his schedule. I take that role seriously. She straightened the papers and handed the stack to him. Here. He ran his thumb over the edges. Too many to count quickly. A lot of pages for starting this morning. Her mouth tightened. I didn't plagiarize if that's what you're suggesting. Her defensive behavior suggested she knew Caleb was onto her. Perhaps he shouldn't be so subtle about his suspicions. If he were more blatant, she might get scared and leave on her own. That would make things simpler, especially with Graham's. Tension, thick and unsettling, hung in the air. Underneath the desk, her foot swung like a pendulum gone wild. Back and forth, speeding up each time, the blur of fluorescent painted toenails came toward him. I wasn't suggesting anything. Caleb didn't trust Becca. But he couldn't deny she intrigued him. Only making an observation. I found a business plan template online, she said to his surprise. The website explains what to write where and gives you text boxes to fill in. You download it into any word processing software. Handy. Yes. 
Caleb read through a rough draft, making mental notes as he went. So, she asked, her voice full of curiosity. Not bad. He waited for a reaction, but he didn't get one. She either didn't care or had tight control of her emotions. He would go with apathy. Hold off on working on the executive summary until the business plan is complete. That way, you'll have a better idea of who and what the company is about. What else? Becca sounded interested, not apathetic, as if she wanted to know what was wrong and how to fix it. That was unexpected. Caleb scanned the pages again. He'd read enough of these over the years with his personal venture capital slash angel fund to offer quick fixes. This is an excellent start, but you need specific goals and a more concrete direction. The product descriptions are solid, but you're missing pricing information and market comparisons. You need hard facts, startup costs, projected balance sheets. The products will sell themselves isn't a sales and marketing strategy. Her shoulders slumped. There's so much more to this than I realized. That's what I told you and my grandmother yesterday. The more discouraged they got, especially Becca, the better. There are easier ways to make money than starting your own business. She stared at her hands. For some, but making money has never come easy for me. Or the people I know. My grandfather told me hard work always pays off. I've heard you he as a wonderful man but sometimes hard work doesn't put groceries in the pantry. Without a glance at Caleb, she wrote notes on another piece of paper. Anything else I should add? Make these fixes first, and then I'll review it again. He handed back her pages. A business plan is an iterative process. That sucks since Gertie wants it finished tonight. His grandmother could be impatient. When she presented the baby products, She'd wanted them on the market in less than three months. It had taken almost a year. I'm surprised she didn't want it done yesterday. Two dogs needed baths last night. Otherwise, she would have told me to finish it before bedtime. In a nice way, of course. Grams could be firm, but in a nice way described her perfectly. When did you move in? February. Four months ago. Had it been that long since he'd been to the estate? He couldn't remember. You've had time to figure out how my grandmother operates. She's the best boss. Ever. So adamant. Loyal. The woman deserved an Oscar nomination for her acting abilities. Grams enjoys getting her way. Becca stared down her nose at him. Most people do. You? If it ever happened, I'd probably like getting my way a lot. If. Probably. Her words raised more questions. But I never get my way, she added. And let me tell you. It sucks. Caleb had never met a woman like Becca Taylor. She might be a scammer, but the way she spoke her mind was at least entertaining. She added color and surprise into a predictable life. He would miss that when she was gone but he would survive. The next day, Becca finished her morning run with Maurice. She walked to the kennel with the dog at her side. Sweat covered her face and dripped down her neck. Her legs trembled from the exertion. Let's put you away so I can see what Gertie needs. My grandmother wants you up at the house. Caleb's voice sent goosebumps prickling Becca's skin. A strange sensation, given how sticky and hot she felt at the moment. But Strange and Caleb went well together. Three visits in three days. For someone claiming to be busy, he had plenty of time to check up on, make that advice, her. Though today was Saturday and based on his casual attire, a pair of cargo shorts and a t-shirt, he wasn't going into the office. You run, he said. The dogs run. She opened the kennel door. The blast of cold air refreshed her, keeping her temper in check. I hold the leashes and get dragged along. You're not a runner. Do I look like a runner? She glanced back at him. Don't answer that. Caleb smiled, but whether or not his smile was genuine remained to be seen. He followed her into the kennel, closing the door behind him. Why do you run if you don't like it? 
She not only didn't like running, but she also didn't like Caleb being underfoot. His broad shoulders and height made the spacious kennel feel cramped and stuffy. Some dogs prefer it to walking. Becca opened the door to Morris's space, complete with a pillow bed and a doggy door that led to his private grassy dog run. She unhooked his leash and let him loose inside. The dog hurried to his stainless steel water bowl. So we run. You really are a dog person. Muscle tone is important. Dog judges don't like to see flabby or fat dogs in the ring. You run the little ones, too? I walk them. She checked each of the dog bowls to make sure they had enough water to get them through the next couple of hours. How briskly depends on their legs. When do you walk them? I already did. Becca wished he would go bother someone else. She didn't think he was trying to turn on the charm and play nice. Still, he looked good today. He exuded confidence, and a part of her wanted to reach out and grab some for herself. Not good. Becca didn't want to notice anything about Caleb Fairchild. She thought about him too much. Loneliness might explain that. An animal control officer she'd met at the animal hospital had mentioned meeting for coffee. He might take her mind off Caleb. They'll get another walk later if it's not too hot. Sounds like they're lucky dogs. Anyone fortunate to have Gertie on their side is a lucky dog. Does that include you? I'm the luckiest. She motioned to the door. I need to see what Gertie wants. I'll go with you. Figures. I'm sure you want to spend as much time with your grandmother as possible. That's right. Liar. Becca bit her tongue to keep from saying the word aloud. Caleb spent twice as much time with her than Gertie. Okay, his insights on the business plan had been useful. Becca would give him credit for that. But the way Caleb watched her as if trying to catch her doing something wrong made her so self-conscious she had trouble sleeping. Something that hadn't happened since leaving prison. She didn't like it, didn't like him. If she kept working hard and proved herself with the business plan, Caleb might continue visiting his grandmother but leave Becca alone. She hoped so, because whenever he came close, physical awareness zapped through her like an electric shock. A few minutes later, she found Gertie, dressed in a lab coat and black pants, sitting on a bar stool at the kitchen's island. Mrs. Harrison washed vegetables. A young woman named Mora, who helped cook and clean, stood at the stove, stirring whatever was inside a saucepan. You wanted to see me? Becca asked. Yes. Gertie clapped her hands together. I have some news. A sort of good news slash bad news kind of thing. Becca had never known Gertie to have any bad news until today. Start with the bad, so we end on a high note. I can't go with you to the dog show in Oregon next weekend, Gertie announced. Becca's chest tightened. She took a step forward. Is anything wrong? Oh, no, dear. I'm fine, but there's a surprise party for an old friend. It's not something I can miss. That wasn't bad news. Not compared to some she'd dealt with in the past. She would miss Gertie's company, but her employer needed to get out of the lab more. Go have fun. I'm used to doing shows on my own. You won't be alone. Gertie bounced from jeweled slipper to jeweled slipper. That's my good news. Caleb will go with you so he can see the products in action. No. 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 Becca staggered back until she bumped into something solid and around six feet tall. Caleb. She jumped forward. Sorry. No worries. Not for him, but a weekend with Caleb watching her every move, waiting, and hoping she messed up wasn't good news. For some strange reason, he made her insides quiver. She couldn't let this happen. Have you been to a dog show before? No, but I need to know how the products work to help you. Caleb would hate wasting time at a dog show. She had work to do, but he would be bored out of his mind. She wouldn't have time to entertain him or be subjected to another of his inquisitions. There had to be a way to convince him not to go. 
Chapter 6 On Monday, the clip of Caleb's Italian leather wingtips against the estate's hardwood floor echoed the beat of his heart. As he worked with Becca on the business plan, he'd learned two things about her. She was from a small town outside Twin Falls, Idaho, and her father's first name was Rob. Information his private investigator had used to perform a background check. The jig was up. Caleb had known his instincts were right about her. His hand tightened around the manila folder containing irrefutable proof Becca Taylor was a scammer. He strode into the estate's solarium with one goal in mind, get Becca away from his grandmother. Hello, Grams. Caleb. She lounged on a chaise, holding a glass of pink lemonade complete with a pink paper umbrella. Thanks for letting yourself in. I've been standing most of the day and now my feet hurt. He kissed her cheek. You shouldn't spend so much time in the lab. It's what I do. Not for long. The crazy dog care line would soon be nothing but a footnote in Grams's life, a distant memory along with Becca. He creased the edge of the folder. Where's your consultant? At the animal hospital. Grams placed her drink on a mosaic end table she'd purchased in Turkey. You're stuck with me. I came to visit you. Grams placed her hand on her chest. I'm touched. What did you want to talk about? He sat in a damask covered chair next to the chaise. Becca. His grandmother's eyes softened with affection. Becca has spent so much time writing and revising the business plan. You'll be impressed. Caleb doubted that, but he reminded himself to be conscious of his grandmother's feelings. I learned disturbing news today. Becca Taylor isn't who you think she is. I know who Becca is. Graham sounded 100% confident. She's a sweet, hard-working woman and my friend. One who takes, takes, takes before hightailing it out of there. Your friend Becca, aka Rebecca Taylor, is a convicted criminal. She spent three years at the Idaho Women's Correctional Center. Caleb expected to see a reaction but didn't. Grams must be trying to take it all in. We're not talking shoplifting. Theft, trespassing, and vandalism. Grams tapped her finger against her cheek. How did you find out? A private investigator. He raised the folder in the air, careful to keep his excitement out of his voice. I know you consider Becca a friend, and she's been helping out, but she's taking advantage of you. Fire her. Get her out of the guest house. Out of your life. Before she hurts you and robs you blind. Just because a person makes a mistake in the past doesn't mean they'll repeat it in the future. She is a crook. He didn't understand why his grandmother was being so understanding. She should be upset, furious. Unless she was in shock. I'll bet Becca learned more ways to break the law while she was in jail. Grams picked up her pink lemonade and stared into the glass. Becca told me all about her time in prison. You knew about this? She told me everything before she accepted my job offer. Outrage choked him. Yet you hired her? Let her move in. She made a youthful mistake. He scoffed. That mistake landed her in jail. She paid the price for her actions and learned her lesson. We're not talking about an overdue library book. He stared at his grandmother in disbelief. You can't have a criminal working for you. It's not safe. Becca would never hurt me. She is a convicted. I respect her honesty and integrity, Grams interrupted. I won't hold the past against her. Neither should you. Don't make me out to be the bad guy here. I didn't break into someone's house, rob them, and then take a plea bargain, he countered. I'm trying to look out for you, Grams. That's what Gramps wanted me to do. You have a big heart. People have taken advantage of you in the past. People need the opportunity to make a fresh start. Caleb's jaw tensed. You gave my father plenty of fresh starts. He blew every single one. Becca is nothing like him. That's true. My father was never in jail. Your father had his own issues, Graham said. But even if he'd gone to jail, it wouldn't have changed the way I felt about him. People deserve another chance. 
people meaning Becca, and his father. A weight pressed against Caleb's chest, squeezing the air out of his lungs and the blood out of his heart. How many fresh starts did you give my father? If your father were alive today, I'd be giving him another chance the way I'm doing with Becca. That's what you do when you love someone. Rebecca Taylor is a stranger. To you. Not to me. I care what happens to her. Emotion filled Grams's voice. And I'm much more interested in the woman she is today than the girl she was at 18. Caleb pressed his lips together. This wasn't how he'd imagined the conversation going. You don't know if she's told you the truth. Read the report, and then you can decide. I've made my decision about Becca. Nothing will change my mind, but you talk to her about this and appease your concerns. You're that sure about her? Yes. Grams didn't hesitate to answer. I want you to be as certain about Becca as I am. Talk to her about your concerns. Let her explain what happened. That would be a complete waste of time. Nothing Becca had to say would change his mind. Absolutely nothing. Grams's eyes implored him. Please, Caleb. Speak with Becca. For me. Screw Caleb Fairchild for delving into her business. Becca balled her hands. The tenth floor of Fairface's corporate headquarters was the last place she wanted to be tonight. Mr. Fairchild will see you now, a middle-aged uniformed security guard said. Follow me. Becca walked down an empty hallway. The fifth draft of the business plan inside her gray and black messenger bag bumped against her hip. She adjusted the bag strap. She wasn't even sure why she'd brought the plan along. Maybe to show Caleb she'd been working, not plotting a crime against his grandmother. As if he would believe her. She glanced at the guard. It's quiet. Most folks have gone home, he said. The carpet muted their footsteps, unlike the correctional facility, where the sound echoed. Instead of passing walled cells with solid metal doors and slits for windows, she passed offices with mahogany wood doors and brass nameplates. No one whispered her name or called her something nasty. No one shot dagger-filled stairs or tried to beat her up when the guards weren't looking. But the memories hit her hard. The sounds. The smells. The bone-chilling cold she could never seem to shake, even during the long, hot summers. Becca crossed her arms over her chest. She wanted to forget about all that. Not relive the worst three years of her life, to appease Caleb Fairchild's curiosity. But she would talk to him, for Gertie's sake. At the end of the hallway, the guard pointed to an office, with its door open. A light was on inside. That's Mr. Fairchild's office. Becca wondered if Mr. Fairchild had asked the guard to stick around outside his office while they spoke. After all, she was a hardened criminal. She forced a tight smile. Thanks. She entered the office. Big. She hadn't expected the office to be this large, complete with a round table, surrounded by six chairs, a couch and coffee table, a large desk, chairs, bookcases along the right side and floor-to-ceiling windows on the two far corner walls. Then again, Caleb Fairchild was the CEO and a tycoon in his own right. He sat at his desk, a portrait in concentration as he stared at his computer monitor. Caleb looked every bit the handsome business executive, if you liked that type. Even though it was past quitting time, each strand of his hair was in place, his tie knotted tightly around his neck, and his sleeves unrolled. The only thing missing was his suit jacket. He looked clean-cut, respectable, and proper. But as with Wit, who'd gotten her in so much trouble, looks could be deceiving. Caleb was nothing more than a shark waiting to attack and take her out. Precisely the sort of person she tried to avoid. But tonight, Becca was venturing into his water without a harpoon. She had no weapon to defend herself against his suspicions, only her words. It wouldn't be pretty. Though he still hadn't noticed her, so maybe she had a chance of surviving. She cleared her throat. Caleb's cool, assessing gaze met hers. A chill shivered down her spine. He stood. Good evening, Becca. 
nothing about tonight was good. He had some nerve hiring a P.I. As if she would have lied about her past to his grandmother. She'd dealt with enough liars and fakes growing up and while she was in jail, to ever want to be one. Becca bit the inside of her cheek. Close the door, so we have privacy, he said. She hadn't seen another person in the building except for the security guard. Guess he's hanging around out in the hallway. Figured. She closed the door. Thanks. He motioned to a chair in front of the large desk. Have a seat. Standing wouldn't give her an advantage over sitting, seeing as she was out of her element and on his home turf. She crossed his office, removed her messenger bag, and sat, sinking into a chair. She ran her fingertips along the buttery soft leather. This furniture was more beautiful than anything in her parents' trailer. Gertie said you have questions for me. His gaze didn't waver from Becca's. You don't waste time. Her temperature increased. No doubt stress from his hawk-like eyes. He saw her as a vulture circling over his grandmother. You've made it clear you're a busy man. He walked around the front of the desk and sat on the edge. Becca picked dog hair off her clothes. She'd spent an hour trying to figure out what to wear, finally deciding on one of her dog show suits, teal skirt, matching three-quarter sleeve jacket, and a lace-trimmed blouse underneath. She wasn't sure what the proper attire was for explaining one's criminal record, but this was better than showing up in a pair of Daisy Duke shorts and a camisole. Tell me how you ended up in prison, he said matter-of-factly. Becca inhaled. She glanced around the room, not focusing on anything. She took another breath before meeting his gaze directly. I was an idiot. He drew back with confusion in his eyes. Excuse me? I did something foolish. She rubbed her face. I fell for a guy. I thought he liked me, so I trusted him. Big mistake. A corner of Caleb's mouth rose, but she wouldn't call it a smile. You're not the first to be led astray by their heart. He sounded as if he'd been there himself. But being misled and wearing prison garb for three years were totally different things. Becca had been so naive to think a rich boy like Whitley would want her from the trailer park. Yet he'd made her feel so, special. Glamorous. Trying to be cool had enticed her to be reckless. She raised her chin. I should have known better. Whitley was the brother of a girl I'd gotten to know at dog shows. They were wealthy. I wasn't. But he appeared not to care. Whitley is the man? Boy, she clarified. I couldn't believe it when he asked me out for a smoothie. I wanted him to like me, so I tried to be the type of girl he'd want to date, even if that wasn't who I was. I fell, hard. So hard, she'd imagined their wedding and wondered what color dresses the bridesmaids should wear. I'd recently graduated high school. It was summer. We went out almost every night, and then. Memories hit strong and fast. The flashing red and blue lights. The accusations. The tears. The handcuffs scraping her wrists. Being read her Miranda rights. Someone touched her shoulder. She jumped. Caleb held up his hands as if surrendering. His eyes were dark. Concerned. Sorry. You looked miles away. Not miles, years. She stood, needing distance from him. Just, remembering. This is hard for you. Becca nodded, not trusting her voice. A compassionate person would tell her to stop. Not Caleb. He didn't say a word but remained perched on his desk as if he might attack at any minute. Not so much a shark now, more like a dangerous hawk ready to swoop down on his prey. On her. A thrill fissured through her. So not the reaction she should have around him. Becca shouldn't react to him at all. Or notice all these little details about Caleb. She hated that she did. She walked to a bookcase, the one closest to the office's door and farthest away from Caleb. Oh, he was handsome and able to turn on the charm faster with a blink, but tonight she saw an edge to him that appealed to her. Except she knew his type all too well. 
whatever she told him would fall on deaf ears. He'd been suspicious of her since the day they met. Nothing would change his mind. He would attend the dog show, not to see the new products in action, but to watch her because of her past. Still, she wanted to say something. I'm not a bad person. I never said you were. But he hadn't said she wasn't, either. No one cared about the truth. Guilty was all that mattered to people. What happened would never be forgotten. It followed her everywhere. Or had, until she'd met Gertie. He wouldn't be as understanding. That was why talking to him was hard, for Becca. A black-framed photo of him and another man caught her eye. Both men were attractive. The other guy might not be as handsome as Caleb, but he was fit with a muscular, V-shaped physique. A triangle-folded American flag with military ribbons sat on the shelf above the picture. She was procrastinating. A glance his way showed he was watching her. Take your time, he said. I don't want to drag this out any longer. The only way to loosen the tension in her neck was to tell him what happened. Wood asked me to hang out with him and his friends. I said yes, because I thought things must be getting serious. A reasonable assumption. Yes, but a wrong one, she admitted. He wanted me there, but not as his girlfriend. He set me up to be the patsy. The scapegoat. The fall guy, to blame, if their plans to break into the bank president's house, to steal cash, to buy drugs went south. They don't sound like the honor society kids. Some were. Others were jocks. But they were no better than a gang of delinquents. They just wore designer clothes and drove nice cars. You were part of it. No. I didn't know what they planned. She read the titles on the shelf instead. A few military strategy-type books sat next to the marketing and finance ones. Witt said we would hop the fence and use the hot tub because the guy was on vacation. I wore my bikini underneath my clothing and had a towel crammed in my bag. But those things, including the panties and bra she'd brought to change into, hadn't mattered to the police. Once we were inside the house and not in the backyard, I realized their plans. But I thought Witt liked me, so I... Not wanting to say the words, Becca bit her lip. You went along, Caleb finished for her. She nodded, embarrassed, regretful, and ashamed. I wanted to fit into Wit's world, so I didn't speak up. I followed his lead. I take it things didn't turn out as planned. There was a high-tech security system. The police caught us inside, and then, her chest tightened with Wit's betrayal. Becca took a breath and another. It didn't help. Everyone turned on me. Pointed their fingers at me. Blamed me. They said it was my idea. That I picked the lock and stole the money. But the police should have. The police believed them. Why wouldn't they? My dad spent time in the county jail for getting into a fight. I was the resident trailer trash. It surprised no one to find me involved in something like this. Not to mention, they found my fingerprints all over the evidence. Caleb's eyes widened. How did that happen? She understood the disbelief in his tone. Her parents and lawyer had sounded the same way. Wit had me wrapped around his little finger. Open the door, gorgeous. Hold this tool, beautiful. Have you ever seen this much money before? Want to touch it? She hadn't, and she did. But the other kids were accessories to the crime. Wit, too. True, but their parents hired high-priced attorneys who got the charges reduced or dropped. That doesn't seem fair. It wasn't. But life has never been fair to people like me. Caleb's privileged upbringing would affect one's perspective as much as growing up in a trailer park had hers. Luck wasn't on my side, either. I'd turned 18 two days before, so I was legally an adult. My parents couldn't afford a lawyer, so they assigned me a public defender. Because of the evidence and witnesses. Witt and his friends cut a deal. Becca nodded. My lawyer recommended a plea bargain. You took it. I wanted to fight the charges, 
but my parents thought three years in prison was better than the alternative, so I did what my lawyer wanted. Caleb said nothing. That didn't surprise her. She stared at a photograph of him surrounded by bikini-clad supermodels. There was another picture of the Fairchild family. Caleb, a young woman who must be Courtney, Gertie, and her late husband. All four looked so happy and carefree with bright smiles on their faces. Just once, Becca would like to know what being so happy and content would feel like. That must have scared you, Caleb said. I was terrified. Some days, she still was, but he didn't need to know that. I understand if you don't believe me. But it's what happened. A hard lesson to learn. She walked back to the chair, but remained standing. I wouldn't wish the three years I spent locked up on anybody. Not even the kids who set me up that night. Regrets? People say you shouldn't have any, but I would love to change that one night. Being in jail, it sucked. But I learned my lesson. I won't try to be someone I'm not again. She waited for him to ask the inevitable questions about whether she belonged to a gang or if she had a girlfriend or something else he might have seen on television. I'm sorry, he said finally. Her gaze jerked up. Excuse me? I'm sorry you experienced that. Becca wasn't sure what to think of his words or the sentiment behind them. So what happened after you got out of jail, he asked. I tried to start where I left off. But it wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. Why not? I kept filling out applications and being turned down for job interviews. Even though I'd done my time, people viewed me as a criminal. He shifted positions on the desk. What did you do? I'd planned to go to college to become a vet tech before all this happened, so I applied to a few programs and eventually got accepted to one. I used the scholarships I'd won through dog showing and worked odd jobs to cover tuition. But after I received my degree, I ran into the same problem as before. No veterinary clinics would hire me. Your past. My past is very much my present. I fear it always will be. As our conversation tonight proves once again. He stared at the carpet. Was he feeling guilty? It didn't matter. Becca wouldn't back down. They say you can't be tried twice for the same crime, but that's only in a court of law. People don't forget, and they hold a grudge. I moved to Boise because I hope to have more opportunities here. Have you? A few, she said. I found a job at an animal hospital. A professional dog handler I'd known through 4-H as a kid and as a junior handler in AKC took pity on me and asked if I wanted to be her apprentice. That's how I met Gertie. My grandmother doesn't care about your past. Gertie is one in a million. Thinking about her made Becca want to smile for the first time since she'd left the estate earlier. I wish more people were like her. But they're not. They were like Caleb. One reason why she preferred the company of dogs to people. Dogs were more loyal, understanding, loving. Any other questions? she asked. I'm happy to give you the name of my former probation officer. Though he can't guarantee I'm not scamming your grandmother. A blush colored Caleb's cheeks. She told you. She warned me. This isn't personal. He sounded defensive. I'm trying to protect her. As you should. If I weren't your target, I'd say your chivalry is sweet, even if it's, misguided. But this isn't the first time it's happened to me. It won't be the last. You're resigned to that. Annoyed by it, too. But what am I going to do? Nothing she'd done so far had changed others' opinions of her. That hadn't stopped her from trying. From working the worst shifts at the animal hospital to doing whatever Gertie asked, Becca wanted to earn people's respect, to be accepted for who she was now. Not who she'd been before. You could move out of Idaho, he said. I'm far enough away from my parents as it is. Family is important to you. It's all I've got. Me, too. A warm glance passed between them. She found herself lost in Caleb's eyes. What was happening? 
she never imagined having anything in common with him. Well, except for liking chocolate cake and Gertie. But he was more complicated and different from what Becca expected. Grams told me you'd been revising the business plan. Did you bring it with you? he asked. Business plan? Becca blinked at the sudden change of topic. I have it. But I didn't think you would continue advising us. Why not? You only agreed because you doubted me. That's true. Her heart fell because spilling her guts had changed nothing. She shouldn't be disappointed. You still have doubts. I told my grandmother I would help her. I won't go back on my word. She respected Caleb for being a man of his word, especially when his agreeing meant so much to Gertie. But he hadn't denied having doubts about Becca. That had happened before. It would happen again. But she was surprised how much it hurt now. Chapter 7 Caleb was wrong about Becca. Wrong about her motives. Wrong about her past. He loosened his tie. He'd misjudged her. Completely. What Becca had said about struggling after leaving prison matched the private investigator's report. She'd admitted her father spent time in jail, too. Her education and experience wouldn't give her the knowledge to pull off a big financial scam. However, he didn't deny the possibility of a smaller-scale theft, so he would keep an eye on her. Caleb glanced up from Becca's business plan. In her teal suit, standing by one of his bookcases, she looked like a consultant. Professional. Knowledgeable. A world apart from who he'd met in his grandmother's backyard. But whether dressed to the nines or in bright orange prison garb, she was the same woman. A woman who was eager to rebuild her life. A woman he wanted to learn more about. Her story about wit sounded plausible to Caleb. His father was like that. His experience with Cassandra had been like that. Becca was most likely what she seemed to be, a hopeful dog whisperer caught up in his grandmother's scheme through no fault of her own. She pulled out a book, read the inside flap, and then placed it back on the shelf. She did the same with another. Con artists, like his Cassandra, told great sob stories, but Becca seemed too genuine, her behavior too natural and awkward and uncomplicated. She didn't appear to be a threat, but he would deal with her if that changed. For now, he would go along with his grandmother's gamble. A part of him admired Becca. That was rare. But he still needed to be careful for all their sakes. You're welcome to borrow any of the books, Caleb said. Is there one you recommend? Strategic marketing and branding. Becca touched each spine with her fingertip, searching for the title. She pulled out one. Here it is. You know the market and the industry, but having a branding strategy can make all the difference. The book will be a good introduction to the buzzwords and approaches being used. She studied the front cover. Thanks. You're welcome. He expected her to walk toward his desk. She didn't. Instead, she looked at the items on the shelves. The USS Essex. Becca studied a small replica of the aircraft carrier. Gertie has a larger version of this in her collection. Gramps was assigned to the USS Essex during the Korean War. He fell in love with aircraft carriers. Grams gave him the models on special occasions. What a wonderful gift. Becca bent to peer at the shelf containing the models. Her skirt rose in the back, showing off her long legs. The USS Vinson. He tried not to stare. Yes. I've seen that one, too. She straightened. Your grandfather had large replicas at home and small models here at the office? The smaller ones are mine. She glanced his way. Yours? Caleb nodded, a part of him wishing she was his. Whoa. Where had that come from? He'd been working too hard if his mind was going there. Grams never mentioned if Becca had a boyfriend, but he imagined she did. A man who thought nothing of carrying lint rollers, doggy treats, and poop bags. Someone opposite to Caleb. He couldn't keep a plant alive, let alone be responsible for a pet. It wouldn't be fair to a dog or cat or fish. Not that he wanted a girlfriend. 
he dated but kept things casual. It was easier that way, given his schedule. He secured her pages with a binder clip. The business plan is getting closer. A smile tugged at her lips. He waited for one to explode and light up her face. The right corner lifted another quarter of an inch before shooting back into place as if she'd realized she was traveling five miles per hour over the speed limit and needed to slow down before being pulled over. She smiled for Grams, but not him. That bothered Caleb. He wanted a smile. Becca bit her lip, gnawing at it like a piece of jerky. I don't think it will ever be ready. Iterative process, remember? She shrugged. Aha. A perfectionist. Caleb had a couple on his staff, hard workers, but they're never satisfied, not good enough tendencies made the end of the quarter more stressful. What you've done so far is impressive. Something, pride, maybe, flashed in her eyes. But the same wariness from before quickly took over. You think? He nodded. Your hard work revising the draft shows. That's what Gertie pays me to do. You do it well. He would have known that if he'd listened to his grandmother. Instead, he'd told her to fire her consultant. Grams wouldn't let him forget that, either. Becca straightened as if he'd finally gotten her attention. Or she liked what he'd said. A few areas need more research, he added. Like manufacturing, for sure. And the product containers are a real headache. She was one step ahead of him. The price is based on quantity, but making that initial order might take a magic wand. A magic eight ball, actually. Your, her gaze narrowed. Kidding. Had you going for a minute, he teased. Amusement gleamed in her eyes. Twenty seconds, tops. Forty, at least. Her smile burst across her face like the sun at dawn. He couldn't breathe. Thirty, she said playfully. Not a nanosecond longer. With her eyes bright and her face glowing, she looked gorgeous. It was his turn to speak, but Caleb said nothing. Instead, he stared at her. She studied him. Have you ever consulted a magic eight ball? No, but Courtney did. Swore it worked. And you kidded her about that. Of course, I did. That's what older brothers do. I'm not surprised. Becca said. You're not a person who leaves things up to chance, let alone a fortune-telling game. An interesting observation and dead on. Why do you say that? She motioned to the shelf. The business books mixed in with military ones. Strategy. War. That suggests you like to be prepared and understand what you're up against. Have a solid plan and an exit strategy. You take a tactical approach. At least you did with me. I may have had bad intel. It happens. She didn't sound upset. That was a relief. You're observant. Becca lifted one shoulder. I keep my eyes open, so I know what's going on. A lesson learned. No doubt because of her past. Caleb was the same way, thanks to Cassandra. It was interesting how people had used him and Becca in similar ways though hers had been much worse. It's not good being caught off guard. Nope. She motioned to the other shelf with his memorabilia. Was the flag your grandfather's? Yes. From his funeral. She pointed to one photograph. Who's this? Caleb crossed the office, picked up a framed photo of him with Ty Dooley. My best friend since third grade. He's in the Navy. The two of you look like brothers. Ty's like a brother. He was living the dream for both of them. Ty was downrange, somewhere classified. Caleb looked forward to seeing him again. We plan on serving together. A grin spread across her face. You wanted to follow in your grandfather's footsteps. His muscles tensed. He told no one except Ty. Becca's guessing stripped Caleb, leaving him bare and vulnerable. He didn't like it. He nodded once. She studied him, her gaze sharp and assessing. Military service is honorable, but you're following in your grandfather's footsteps by being Fairface's CEO. 
true, but that brought little satisfaction, even though he wanted to be a man like his grandfather had been and nothing like his father. Becca pointed to another photograph of Caleb with itty-bitty bikini-clad supermodels clinging to him. Most men would kill to be in your position. He wasn't most men. The decision to run fair face had never been his to make. His worthless father had wanted nothing to do with the family company. To say that everything had fallen to Caleb was an understatement. He had to grow up fast. What's the saying? The grass is always greener. I wouldn't have expected that kind of longing from you. Of course, she wouldn't. But this, he glanced around the office, was never who he'd expected to be growing up. He'd dreamed about being a Navy SEAL, not the CEO of a skincare company. I'm sure there's something you wanted to be when you were growing up. Becca nodded. A vet. But I was a kid then. Naive about how life worked. Me, too, he said. But that's what being a kid is all about. Dreaming of doing what sounds cool without understanding our places in the world. Too bad you can't trade jobs with your friend Ty for a week. Bet he'd enjoy hanging with supermodels while you swab decks on a ship or sub. Caleb nearly laughed. An M4 rifle was more likely in his best friend's hands, not a mop. Ty was one of the elite special ops guys, a Navy SEAL, stationed in Virginia Beach on a Tier 1 team. Caleb would love a taste of Ty's life. Fun idea, but I doubt I'd like swabbing decks. So you're more into adventure. Bet you'd like special forces kind of stuff. Best of the best. Caleb didn't understand how she kept nailing him. He moved away from her. What guy wouldn't? Some might not, given the danger and risk involved, but I see why it would appeal to you. Why is that? She tilted her chin. The leadership skills you've honed as CEO would be useful even if the arena differed. Teamwork, too. No more profit margins, but life or death stakes. Kick-ass missions would be more stressful than anything you've dealt with but exciting because of the physical and mental challenges. You'd be surrounded by smart people. I'd assume someone unintelligent wouldn't last long, but in corporate America, brainpower doesn't appear to be a prerequisite for rising to the top at least here at Fair Face. She might lack business experience, but she had what Grams would call gumption. Not liking my grandmother's dog products doesn't mean employees are stupid. If they liked the line, that would prove they were smart. Becca stared at the photo of him and Ty again. I think the real draw to your friend's lifestyle is loyalty. To the country, the service, your teammates. Heaven knows you're loyal to your family. Caleb couldn't move. Breathe. Blink. How had she realized this about him? A woman he'd known less than a week. One he underestimated. I suppose being in the Navy would be more interesting work than sitting in meetings all day wondering what SPF of sunscreen would sell best, she added. He nodded. My only question is, if joining the Navy was so important to you, why didn't you enlist, she asked. My family. Fair face, he admitted. They needed me. You wouldn't have been in the Navy forever. No, but they needed me here. What I wanted to do, he glanced at the photograph of Ty and him. It was secondary. Her eyes softened. You love your family. Everyone loves their family. Few would sacrifice their dreams. Caleb shrugged, but the last thing he felt was indifference. He rubbed the back of his neck, not wanting to have this conversation. He glanced at his watch, more out of habit than anything else. It's getting late. I'll walk you to your car. Thanks, but that's unnecessary, she said, a hint of a tremor in her voice. My car is at the park and ride lot. I rode the bus into downtown. Why? Gas is expensive. His grandmother had to be paying her well plus providing a free place for her to stay. Not to mention her job at the animal hospital. You can't have money trouble. She glared at him. Forget daggers, Becca was firing mortar rounds in his direction. He turned his hands, palms up. What? I never said I can't afford it. She shot him a get-a-clue look. 
why should I waste my hard-earned cash to drive into town so you can get me fired? Stubborn. She also looked cute when she was angry. It's good not to waste money. My grandfather taught me to save for a rainy day. Rain, thunderstorm, monsoon. Her fingers tightened around the strap of her messenger bag. You never know what the future holds. Caleb's life proved that it was true. It's best to be prepared for anything. Well, almost anything. He hadn't been ready for Becca. He should drive her home and see how deep her stubbornness ran. Come on. I'll walk you out. As they crossed the lobby of Fairface's corporate headquarters, footsteps echoed on the tiled floor, and questions swirled through Becca's brain. She eyed the guy next to her. Caleb Fairchild was Boise's hottest tycoon. He dressed like the perfect CEO in his gray suit. But underneath the pinstripes was a man who dreamed of adventure. A man who longed to serve his country. A man who sacrificed those dreams for his family. Did he show that side of himself to anyone except his best friend? She would like to see it, which surprised her. Ever since the judge dropped the gavel in the courthouse in Twin Falls, Idaho, Becca had become immune to pretty faces, charming smiles, and killer eyes. She occasionally dated, going out with working-class guys and cowboy types, but she kept things light and fun because she was afraid of being burned again. The truth was, Becca hadn't met anyone she wanted to date seriously. If she got close to a guy, she would make herself vulnerable, but Caleb interested her in a way she hadn't been interested in, well, forever. That was a problem. Her parents had a good marriage despite their financial struggles. She would love to have a relationship like theirs, but the odds of finding a man who would accept Becca and her past were slim to none. That was why she hadn't looked for the one. Another employee walked by them, the third in the last five minutes. Caleb greeted him by name. You impressed us with those new label designs, Anthony. Great work. Thank you so much. The older man with gray hair and wire-rimmed glasses stood two inches taller. He strode away with a proud grin on his face. Do you know every single person who works here? She asked. No, but people wear badges, Caleb said. That helps with the names. Considerate of him, even though he'd accused her of stealing from Gertie. The employees seem to appreciate your effort. They work hard. He opened a glass door for her. It's the least I can do. Thanks. The first time they'd met, his manners had impressed Becca. He impressed her now, despite his accusations. But Caleb Fairchild was the same as every other rich guy. She wouldn't be taken in by him. She headed outside into bright daylight and stifling heat, even though it was after seven at night. The temperature hasn't dropped at all. Two construction workers wearing paint-splattered coveralls and carrying hard hats approached them with tired smiles. Caleb removed his suit jacket and draped it over his left arm. Welcome to summer in Boise. A neon green food truck idled curbside with a line of customers waiting. The scent of garlic and rosemary filled the air. Becca's mouth watered. Through the window, she stared at the noodles and pork being plated. Hungry? Caleb asked. A little. She hadn't eaten lunch. Whatever their cooking smells good. It does. A siren wailed. Goosebumps covered her skin. She hated sirens. The sound brought back memories she didn't want to remember. Hearing the click of handcuffs lock around her wrists, sitting in a police car, and experiencing the heartbreak of betrayal. Becca crossed her arms in front of her chest and forced herself to keep walking. She wished she would forget. She wished others would forget, too. She wished people trusted her. Not just people. A person. Caleb. The realization disturbed her as much as the siren. His opinion shouldn't didn't matter. If she kept repeating that, she might finally believe it. Stop thinking about him. The sound faded into the distance. She lowered her arms and pointed to a white sign, ten feet in front of them. This is where I catch the bus. Caleb looked around at the few people waiting. Let me drive you to the park and ride lot. 
I'll follow you to my grandmother's place, and we can have dinner. Becca's breath caught in her throat. She opened her mouth to speak, except no words came out. She tried again. Thank you, but there's no need for you to go to so much trouble. I have to eat, too. He whipped out his cell phone. I'll see if Grams has eaten. Dinner with Gertie, not a date with Caleb. Becca should be relieved, not disappointed. The guy had serious doubts about her. He was everything she didn't want in a man. He was likely asking her to make amends. Of course, she'd never said yes. He flashed his phone, showing her a text exchange. Mrs. Harrison was going to warm up leftovers for Grams, but she would rather have pizza. Does that sound good? Yes. The word escaped before Becca could stop it. Ugh. She knew better. On the bright side, Gertie would be thrilled to have her grandson there again, and Becca wouldn't have to worry about making dinner tonight. He typed on his phone. Messages pinged. We're all set. Grams will have the pizza delivered. Becca glanced at the bus stop before looking at him. Back to fair face. My car is in the parking lot next door. Gertie said parking was available beneath the building. There is. This made no sense. Why aren't you parked there? I prefer to let the employees and visitors use the closer spots. Becca didn't want to like him. But she did, despite a growing list of reasons she shouldn't. The guy took his responsibilities seriously. She sneaked a peek at his profile. So handsome and strong and determined. A few minutes later, Caleb opened the door leading to a bank of elevators. Cool air blasted her. She stepped inside and waited for him to join her. Please don't think you have to add me to your list. What list? The list of people and things you take care of. His eyes widened, and his lips parted. Shock turned to confusion, followed by a blank expression. What do you mean? He might be better at poker than she thought. If Becca hadn't been paying attention, she would have missed the play of emotion across his face. It seems like you're responsible for your grandmother, your sister, fair face, and your employees. I don't want you to think I need someone to take care of me, too. I don't. You seem capable of caring for yourself. She nodded. But it makes me wonder. What? Who takes care of you? His eyes clouded. His posture stiffened. I do, but Ty has my six. Your friend in the Navy. Best friend, Caleb said. I wish I had someone like that. You don't? I haven't had a best friend since I was in seventh grade. Cecily Parker had lived in the trailer park for half a year. The best six months of Becca's childhood. She and Cecily did everything together, rode the school bus, ate lunch in the cafeteria, had sleepovers. Her mom met some guy online and moved to Cincinnati. I never heard from my friend again. What stopped you from getting a new best friend? No one wanted to be friends with the kid who lives in the trailer park. You don't live there now. No, but it's different when you're older. That's true. But some things hadn't changed. Becca hadn't spent the last few years trying to put her life back together just to make the same mistake again. He wasn't wit, but Caleb was rich, handsome, and powerful, a man who could get away with anything and who wouldn't think twice about breaking her heart. She needed to be smart about him. She'd agreed to a ride and dinner, but that was all. She would accept his advice on the new business, but keeping her distance from him would be Becca's smartest move. Even if that was the last thing she wanted to do right now. Chapter 8 After dinner, Caleb headed out onto his grandmother's patio. Becca Taylor intrigued him. He didn't need a PhD to realize she hadn't wanted to spend one more minute in his company. Her not saying a word on the drive to the park and ride lot had been his first clue. The way she'd sat as far away from him during dinner as possible had been his second. The way she'd scarfed down her pizza and salad as if a bomb was about to explode if she didn't eat fast enough and then excused herself without dessert had been his third and fourth clues. No other woman had been so blatant in their dislike of him. He was torn between being annoyed and intrigued. A door opened behind him. 
I thought you were going home, Graham said. Him, too. But something had stopped him from leaving. Someone. I wanted to check on Becca first. She acted preoccupied over dinner. That's my fault. It wasn't easy for her to tell me what happened. But that didn't stop her. Becca was open about her past. More so than he would have been. Do you still think she's trying to fleece me? You still have doubts. Earlier this evening, the hurt in Becca's voice had sliced through him, raw and jagged and deep. But she was correct. Doubts remained because she was a stranger, an unknown quantity. People have ulterior motives and hidden agendas. Like his ex fiance and his mother, the definition of a gold digger. That's human nature. Becca wouldn't hurt me or anybody. Caleb wished he had his grandmother's confidence. He should have learned from his father's mistakes. Instead, it had taken Cassandra to teach him that trust needed to be earned, not given freely to a stranger. Perhaps I'll feel that way after I get to know Becca. Though she understood him better than his family. Better than everybody else, except for Ty. Caleb didn't like that. If the wrong people knew too much, they would use that to their advantage, which usually ended up hurting him or someone he loved. You will. His grandmother touched his arm. It's getting late. Check on Becca and then go. Will do. He hugged his grandmother. And before I forget, thanks for the pizza and the cake. Grams beamed. This is your home. You're welcome anytime. Being here brought wonderful memories and feelings of contentment. Thanks. As Caleb followed the lighted path from the patio, he glanced up. Stars filled the inky sky. Satellites circled above, and the moon hung low. A beautiful night. One he would have spent alone in his loft working if not for Becca. Sure, he would have seen the sky from the twenty-foot windows, but he preferred being here. A cry sounded. Not a human. A dog. In pain. Adrenaline surged. Caleb ran. Becca. The moans continued. Dogs barked. A dog was hurting, but Caleb's heart pounded against his ribs. What if he was wrong? What if she was hurt? He quickened his pace, his breath coming hard and fast. Only the guest cottage's porch light was on, so he headed to the kennel. The door was open, and the lights on. He ran inside. Dogs stood at the front of their kennels, barking and agitated. He glanced around. Becca sat on the floor. A stethoscope hung around her neck. She wore an ivory-colored lace-trimmed camisole, and her suit jacket covered the dog lying across her lap. The animal was the one who'd shed all over Caleb. What was the dog's name? Morris? No, Maurice. The Norwegian elk hound. Caleb kneeled at Becca's side. As he touched her bare shoulder, he ignored her soft skin and the warmth beneath his hand. What's going on? Maurice. She rubbed the dog. His stomach is distended. He's gassy and in pain. The dog whimpered but didn't move. The others wouldn't stop barking. Is it serious? Caleb asked. I'm not sure what's wrong. The staff only uses products Gertie's made or approved, so it's not chemical poisoning. But if Maurice overate, there's the risk of bloat. His stomach might flip. Elkhounds aren't as prone as other breeds, but his pulse is high. Heart rate, too. I gave Gertie a call, but she didn't answer. She was on the patio with me. I'm taking Maurice to the animal hospital where I work. I'd rather not take any chances. Becca spoke calmly and in control, but worry filled her eyes. He wanted to kiss the concern away. I'll tell my grandmother. About to reach for his cell phone, Caleb realized he was still touching Becca's shoulder. He hadn't noticed. The gesture seemed so natural, so right. She was different from other women he'd known, especially Cassandra. Perhaps that was why Becca felt safe. He lowered his arm before pulling out his phone. Tell Gertie not to worry, Becca said. The door to the food cabinet door was ajar. 
Maurice might have gotten into there and gorged himself on whatever he found. The dog's groan sounded as if someone was rolling his innards through a pasta machine. The other dogs barked. Two howled. I'm sorry you hurt, handsome. She rubbed Maurice. I bet you got into the food. Is that what happened, boy? The dog's gaze didn't leave hers. Caleb thought that was one smart dog. Well, except for overeating. It's okay, Becca said. You're not in trouble. Not at all. Her soft voice was a caress against Caleb's face. Even though the words were for the dog's sake, he wished they were for him. You have to visit the vet tonight. She kissed Morris's head. You won't like that. Caleb touched the dog. I'll drive you. Thanks, but I've got a crate in the back seat. I need to move my car closer to make things easier on Maurice. I'll stay here with him while you do that. He'll shed on you. It's only dog hair. And you have a lint roller. The corners of her mouth curved in an appreciative smile. She stood. Thanks. Be right back. He took her place. The dog didn't seem to mind. It's okay, boy. He rubbed Morris's head. You're in good hands. Becca will take care of you. Two sad brown eyes met Caleb's. The look of total trust and affection sent the air rushing from his lungs. It was as if Maurice understood. Caleb took a breath before leaning over so he could whisper in the dog's ear. You're one lucky dog. I wish Becca liked me half as much as she cares about you. But she didn't and wouldn't. For the best, he told himself. Too bad a part of him wasn't so sure about that. Becca parked, left the engine idling, and then opened the car's back door. Maurice will be fine. Just fine. Mentally repeating the words, she drove to the kennel. If anything, she was wasting her time, gas, and Gertie's money. But Becca would happily waste all three if Maurice was okay. She went inside. Froze. Caleb sat on the floor, in his designer suit, with Morris's head resting on his lap. He rubbed the dog, talking in a soft voice. Her mouth went dry. The tenderness in Caleb's eyes sent Becca's heart thudding. Her pulse rate kicked up a notch. Wait a minute. This was the same man who didn't trust her, who didn't like her, who wanted her fired. But she couldn't help herself. He'd cranked up the charm without even realizing the effect this would have on her. Best to dial that down ASAP. She cleared her throat. How is he doing? Not feeling too well, are you, boy? The sweet way Caleb spoke tugged at her heartstrings. Ignore it. Him. Thank you for sitting with him. I can put him in his crate now. Before Becca blinked, he was on his feet and picked up Maurice. I'll carry him. At the car, they loaded the dog into the crate. She double-checked that the crate's latch was secure, all set. Caleb opened the driver's door. I appreciate your help. She hadn't known what to expect from him, but his assistance with Maurice hadn't been it. I'll call Gertie once I know more. I'll check on the other dogs and wait with Grams. She wants to go with you. It will be a long night. That's okay. Earlier, she opened the food cabinet to get dog treats. She's upset for not checking the door. Becca imagined how bad Gertie must feel. Tell her not to worry. We'll get Maurice fixed right up. If not, let's not go there. Their gazes met. Held. The same connection Becca had felt the first day they'd been introduced. But this wasn't the time to analyze things. Not with Maurice in pain. Caleb kissed her cheek. More of a peck, if she wanted to be technical, a brush of his lips over her skin. But warmth rushed through her. For luck, he said. Becca resisted the impulse to kiss him on the lips. No distractions. Maurice needed her. She climbed into the driver's seat and buckled her seat belt. Now wasn't the time for more kisses. Most importantly, he wasn't the man she should want to kiss. 
Not tonight. Not tomorrow night. Not ever. For hours later, Becca pulled into the guest cottage's driveway. She ached from tiredness. Her eyelids wanted to close, but she wouldn't sleep much. Not when she needed to watch Maurice. She glanced in the rearview mirror. We're home, handsome. The dog didn't make a sound. He must be exhausted after the tests and x-rays. Not to mention his stomachache. Becca grabbed her purse, exited the car, and locked the door. Want a hand? Caleb. Silhouetted by the porch light, he walked toward her. He'd removed his jacket and tie, undone two buttons at the top of his shirt, and rolled up his sleeves. Her heart stumbled. You're still here. I wanted to make sure Grams went to bed after you called. Becca wished she'd been the reason. Pathetic. But she was pleased Caleb understood the difference between his grandmother spending time with live-in staff versus her grandson. You should have gone home. It's fine. He spoke as if staying up half the night was no big deal. Maybe not for him, but she appreciated it. Too bad the dog gorged himself on so many treats. She nodded. You should have seen the x-rays. Half his stomach was full. Last time he does that. Oh, no. He'll do it again if given a chance. Becca opened the crate's door. Elkhounds will eat until they make themselves sick. They are food fiends. Maurice lumbered out of the car as if each step hurt. Poor boy. Caleb picked up the dog. Where do you want him? On my bed, she said. He's sleeping with me tonight. You are a lucky dog. Becca's cheeks heated. Thank goodness for the darkness, so Caleb couldn't see she'd blushed. Not that lucky, considering the diet he'll be on to get ready for the show this weekend. He'd mentioned nothing about going, so he might have changed his mind. She hoped not. Wait a minute. That wasn't right. She didn't want him to go. The cottage door was unlocked. She followed him through the living room and into the bedroom where a sheet covered the comforter. Dog spent so much time here that it cut down on laundry. He gently set the dog on the bed. Here you go, lucky dog. Thanks. She straightened the sheet and then touched Maurice. You should go. It's late. Caleb's gaze narrowed on her. You're exhausted. I'll sleep in a little while. She watched the dog curl on her side of the bed. I want to make sure he doesn't take a turn for the worse. Take a nap. I'll watch Maurice. A nap would be great, but she didn't want to impose on Caleb. Thanks, but you have to be at work in the morning. I'm the CEO. Grams won't complain if I show up late. This is my job. Caleb tucked a strand of hair behind Becca's ear. A tremble ran through her. She didn't want to react to him, but she couldn't help herself. He had a strange effect on her. It's mine tonight, he said. A part of her wanted to let him take over, so she wouldn't have to do everything herself. She'd been on her own for so long, she only depended on herself. But she couldn't. Not when Caleb took care of so many others. She raised her chin. I'm not your responsibility. No, but how about we say you and Maurice are for the next couple of hours? Her pulse quickened. You're making it hard for me to not like you. His eyebrows wagged. There's a lot to like. His light-hearted tone made her smile. Something she hadn't thought possible at this late, make that early, hour. It's hard to tell with dog hair all over you. His mouth quirked. You're covered in dog hair, too. I always am. Grab some clothes. He kicked off his leather shoes. Get comfortable on the couch. This is my bedroom. Not tonight. He crawled into bed with Maurice. The dog moved closer to Caleb. The boys have taken over. Are you always this bossy? Yes. Get some sleep. Us boys will be fine. Won't we, Maurice? 
As if on cue, the dog licked Caleb's hand. See? Tingles filled her stomach. Funny, or maybe not, but she could get used to the boys being here. Chapter 9 Flurp. What was that? Caleb opened his eyes. Daylight filled the room. A mass of black and gray fur stood over him. Flurp. A tongue licked his cheek. He bolted upright. Morris's moist nose and his warm, smelly mouth were right in Caleb's face. Morning breath is one thing. He turned away. But yours is toxic. The dog panted, looking pleased. At least you're up and about. You must feel better. Maurice stood with his paws pressed into Caleb's thighs. You're too big to be a lapdog. The dog plopped down, making himself at home on top of Caleb's legs. Okay, he relented. You can sit here for a minute. But no longer. Are the boys having trouble this morning? Becca asked. The sound of her voice brightened his day like the first rays of sunshine through the window. Caleb peered around the dog to see her standing at the foot of the bed. He shouldn't feel this way about her. Not considering how they started. But seeing her in striped pajama pants, a tie-dyed ribbed tank top, and hair like she rolled straight off the couch, he couldn't find it in himself to care. There were far worse things than being attracted to his grandmother's dog whisperer. He might have been in an even better mood if he'd woken to Becca licking his face. He wasn't in the market for a relationship, but something casual would be fun. She yawned, stretching her hands overhead. You didn't wake me. He was staring, gawking. Not good. He looked at the dog. You were tired. So were you. Caleb had checked on her in the middle of the night. She'd slept with a slight smile on her face. He'd imagined carrying her to bed, but that had bad idea written all over it. Instead, he'd covered her with the blanket she'd kicked off and returned to her room. I wasn't. You stayed up all night. Not all night. His gaze kept straying to her bare shoulders. Once Maurice settled down, I dozed. Becca moved closer. The scent of her tickled Caleb's nose. He inhaled deeper. As she touched the dog, her hand brushed his thigh, sending shivery sparks up his leg. He looks better this morning, she said. I'll take him outside. I took him out around three. Her lips parted. They were full and soft and kissable. If not for the dead weight on his lap, he would have kissed her. I didn't hear you, she said. We were quiet. He glanced at the digital clock on the nightstand. It's only 5.30. Go back to bed. You're in it. An awareness buzzed between them. A comfortable queen-size bed. A beautiful woman. Two hours to kill until he was due at the office. This was looking good. I'll scoot over. We don't mind sharing. Caleb moved closer to the edge. It would be better if Maurice gave up his spot, but the dog didn't appear to be the selfless type. Becca had that role locked up. She watched him. The dog's on my side. Caleb kept his tone light, half-joking so he wouldn't scare her off. He patted the mattress. Plenty of room for you now. Better be careful who you invite into bed, Mr. Fairchild. It's your bed. Then you should be even more careful. You wouldn't want to give away corporate secrets over pillow talk. He grinned. Who said anything about talking? She raised a brow. You're full of surprises this morning. He would be happy to surprise her more. All he needed was the opportunity and an invitation. You only see what you want to see. I'm seeing a pot and a kettle. Which one are you? Amusement twinkled in her eyes. I'd say the pot. But I suppose it doesn't matter since they're both the same color. Caleb shouldn't be so attracted to her, but she challenged him by keeping him on his toes. He enjoyed that. His ex fiancee had tried to sweet talk him. Most women went along with him, rarely disagreeing. Strange, because he'd never wanted a yes woman. He preferred someone who spoke her mind and pushed his buttons. Not that he wanted a woman, but he would take Becca for the morning. 
he would stretch his time here to lunchtime if she were game. That makes you the kettle. Works for me, she said. I love kettle corn. What was it about Becca Taylor that got him turned on talking about cookware and popcorn? If he wanted to avoid a complicated and messy situation, he needed to keep his distance. But leaving Becca's bed, especially if there was any chance of her climbing in it, didn't appeal to him in the slightest. A fling would be fun. Easy. Safe. And then Caleb remembered where he was. The guest cottage and his grandmother's estate. With Grams's employee. His advisee. A woman who made thinking straight impossible when he was around her. A woman who knew too much about him. A woman who defined dangerous. Alarm bells sounded in his head. Perhaps not so safe. It's all yours. Caleb moved the dog and then slid off the bed. I have to go. Okay. Becca bit her lip. Thanks. Again. For, um, everything. She appeared as confused as he was. No matter. Time to get out of here before he changed his mind and did something stupid, like kiss the confusion out of her eyes. Caleb patted Maurice before slipping on his shoes. He ignored how appealing Becca looked right now. I need to put an extra hours at Fair Face with the dog show this weekend. You don't have to go. The words rushed out of her mouth faster than the rapids on the Snake River. I can handle the show on my own. You can, but I want to see the products in action, and my grandmother wants me there. My grandmother is a worrywart with her dogs. And with Becca, too. Caleb was torn. As appealing as a weekend away from work sounded, spending more time alone with her wasn't smart. But he couldn't forget about his grandmother's wishes. I'd rather not disappoint Grams. Gertie will understand if you're busy and have other plans. Becca's mouth tightened. Say, a date or something. She baited the hook and cast the line. He didn't mind biting if only to see her reaction and appease her interest about his social life. No date. Work. The lines around her mouth disappeared. It's not a problem if you stay in Boise. Really. It was funny how her words didn't match her expression. Maybe she didn't know what she wanted. Courtney was sometimes like that, and humor often helped. Well, since you don't mind. I don't. The words rushed out. Okay, Becca didn't get the joke. He held back a smile, but he was relieved that she didn't care what he did though he must have misread her curiosity. I'll talk to Grams. Do. She seemed too adamant about his not going. Fine. I won't be around as much the next few days, possibly the entire week. Good. I mean, it'll be good to have time away. At fair face. It was interesting how Becca sounded nervous. Flustered. She seemed so natural and unstudied and artless. Perhaps he hadn't misread her interest. A smile tugged at his lips. Call if you have questions about the business plan. Will do. Thanks again for taking care of Maurice. As if on cue, the dog jumped off the bed. He nudged Becca's hand with his nose so she would give him attention. Too bad that trick didn't work for Caleb. You're welcome. She bit her lip again. You were on your way out? Yes. He grabbed his jacket and forced his feet to move toward the front door. He'd better leave, or he might be here all morning. Have a great day. Wait, she called out. He stopped, hoping she would ask him to stay. A long shot, but this was as good a day as any to try being an optimist. Becca handed him a lint roller. Take this. This was the last thing he expected. So much for optimism. Caleb laughed. You need it. I have more than one, including two in my car. Always prepared. I never want to find myself unprepared again. I feel the same. He wasn't prepared for how much he wanted to stay with the oh-so-appealing Becca Taylor. If I don't talk to you before the weekend, good luck at the dog show. More than once after Caleb left the guest cottage, Becca picked up her cell phone to call him. 
More than once, she put away her cell phone. It was better to leave him alone. Safer. That afternoon, she worked with Dozer on obedience training. The little guy needed to learn to behave and obey if he wanted to find a forever home. Gertie would adopt him before sending him to live at the rescue shelter, but she and Becca agreed he would thrive with a family. Sit. The dog sat. Stay. She walked to the end of the leash, approximately six feet away, and hit the timer on her cell phone. Dozer remained in place. Now, to see if he sat for the full 60 seconds, a long sit in obedience training. The seconds ticked off. Becca wondered what Caleb was doing. He'd been on her mind since he'd left. She wanted to discuss the business plan. As soon as she figured out one thing, more questions arose. But the answers were available online if she searched for them. The reason she wanted to call him was to hear his voice. Pathetic. Hadn't she learned anything? Even if Caleb was handsome, polite, hardworking, getting involved at any level with a wealthy man was a terrible idea. Like dumping water on an oil fire. Explosive. She'd done that experiment and been burned, no need to repeat it. Stop thinking about him. Becca needed to forget about Caleb and prepare to leave for the dog show on Thursday. She'd gotten her wish. She was going alone. If she needed a hand with the dogs, she would ask a junior showmanship kid for help. Many were eager to volunteer. She'd been that way as a teenager. Dozer rose to all fours and trotted toward her, as happy as a dog could be. She glanced at the stopwatch. 45 seconds. 15 seconds too short. She patted him. We'll have to try this again. Her cell phone buzzed. A new text message arrived. She glanced at the screen, Caleb. Her hand tightened around the phone with excitement. Caleb, how's Maurice? A ball of heat ignited within her. Caleb might have some faults, but he cared about the elk hound. She typed out a quick reply. Me, good as new. Hungry again. Maybe Caleb would find some spare time to stop by to see the dog. Maurice would like that. She would, too. Becca waited for a reply. And waited. And waited. She didn't hear from him. No texts. No phone calls. Nothing. Guess he was, busy. On Wednesday, Becca packed her suitcase and readied the RV for the trip to Central Oregon. She tried not to think about Caleb or ask Gertie if she'd heard from him. He told Becca he would be busy. No. Big. Deal. Thursday arrived. She packed the rest of the items she needed for the next three days. Gertie said goodbye to each dog. Don't cause Becca any trouble. They'll be fine, she said. Gertie hugged her. The woman smelled like flowers and sunshine and the color pink. Call me when you get there. Becca loaded the dogs into their crates. I will. I'm sorry you have to go alone. Caleb's a busy man. That was what she kept telling herself. Concern filled Gertie's gaze. Too busy. He'll wake up one day and not have anything to show for it. Becca thought a considerable checking account balance would show for a lot, but she'd never had money, so what did she know? But having so much responsibility thrust upon him at a young age had to be taking its toll. She wouldn't add to his burdens. Caleb will figure things out when he's ready. He's spending more time with you. Last week, yes. This week, not so much. But you're right. Any time is an improvement. I just wish. What? I hate to think of you being alone this weekend. I'm not alone. The dogs will keep me company. I'll be fine. The worry from Gertie's eyes didn't disappear. I know. You're quite capable, but humor an old woman. Becca's parents loved her, but they didn't have the luxury to sit around and be concerned about her the way Gertie did. Becca had been on her own from a young age because they'd worked multiple jobs. 
knowing Gertie cared so much, gave Becca a genuine sense of belonging. Something she hadn't found outside the trailer park, dog shows, or the animal clinic. How about I text you each time I stop to let the dogs out? I'll give you updates during the show, too. Gertie's features relaxed. That would help. Now, if Becca stopped thinking about Caleb and what would be keeping him busy while she was away, that would help her. Chapter 10 Why am I here? Caleb glanced around the fairgrounds in Redmond, Oregon. White fenced outdoor show rings, dogs of every color and size, bright sunshine, and green grass. Even though it was a Saturday, he should be at work today, not attending a dog show. But Grams had told him that showing the dogs and passing out samples of their products had exhausted Becca, and she still had two more days to go. His grandmother had begged him to fly to Redmond so she wouldn't miss her friend's birthday party. And here he was. Sucker. And Caleb admitted that. He was responsible for so much already, but now it appeared he needed to look out for his grandmother's dog consultant, too. Yes, he could have said no to Grams. He also could have sent someone else, but he'd wanted to see Becca. Unfortunately, he had no idea how to find her among the RVs, dogs, crates, grooming tables, rings, and people. He'd called and texted her, but no reply. He walked along the row of show rings. On his left, vendors sold everything from dog imprinted tea towels to doggy massage services. One booth had a dog treadmill for owners who couldn't, didn't want to, perhaps, take their animals for a walk. People passed out samples of food and treats. All these products made one thing clear Grams's stuff didn't stand a chance against the edible wares and dog inspired tchotchkes. Women and men dressed in business attire scurried around with combs, brushes, spray bottles, and raced from the grooming stands to the ten show rings set up at the county fairgrounds. Two big dogs barked at a group of smaller black and white dogs. Papillons, if he remembered the one his grandmother had rescued. Others from the show ring next to them joined in. Annoying, but they were dogs. Dogs barked and shed. Outside the fenced area of Ring 6 stood Becca. Her lime green suit showed off her curves nicely. She looked professional, as she had in his office on Monday night. But today, she appeared more confident. A puff of white was at her side. Snowy must have spent his morning being bathed and groomed to look like a cotton ball. As he walked toward her, Snowy saw him first and barked. Becca turned. Smiled. Her eyes widened. Twinkled. Caleb's heart slammed against his ribs. He hadn't expected her to be so excited to see him. She hadn't seemed to want him at the show, but her reaction now told him otherwise. Hello. What are you doing here? She asked with a breathless quality to her voice. My grandmother said you sounded exhausted on the phone last night. What? Graham said you were overwhelmed passing out samples, showing dogs, and needed help. Becca inhaled sharply. So she sent you to the rescue. He gave a mock bow. At your service, milady. Thanks, but I have no idea why Gertie said that. I'm fine. I've passed out samples and feedback flyers. The interest has been high. So far, 80% of the people I've spoken with have taken the packages. I only have a few left. Then, why am I here? The question flew out. Okay, seeing Becca was good. Thoughts of her had distracted him all week. So much so, he'd forced himself not to call her each day. But he'd come a long way for nothing. Becca scrunched her nose. Gertie must have a reason. But what? Grams did nothing without a reason. Well, except for shopping. Did my grandmother say anything to you? Just that she hated the thought of my being here alone. 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 The word echoed in his mind. His grandmother didn't want Becca alone. Grams didn't want Caleb alone. That meant she wanted them. Together. Of course. That explained things. My grandmother's up to her old tricks to get what she wants. That's a relief. For a minute I was worried Gertie didn't trust me. She does. 
So what's going on? Matchmaking. Matchmaking? Lines creased Becca's forehead. Her mouth gaped. With us? It's the only thing that makes sense. I don't think. Can you come up with a better reason? I. Well, the startled look in her eyes matched the way he felt. No, I can't. Grams has been vocal about wanting great-grandchildren, but I never thought she'd stoop to matchmaking. Caleb had to give his grandmother credit. She'd picked a woman who was the polar opposite of Cassandra. But she created a line of baby products, so who knows how far she'd go. Snowy pulled away to sniff a small terrier, but Becca tugged on the leash, stopping him. I don't think Gertie is playing matchmaker. Becca motioned to herself. I'm not corporate trophy wife material. Caleb took a long, hard look. Don't sell yourself short. I like what I see. I'm not talking about physical appearance. Imagine me schmoozing at a client party. Think about my past. I'm not a woman you take home to meet your mother. My grandmother thinks you're amazing. A satisfied smile lit Becca's face. The feeling's mutual. Your grandmother is a special person. That's true. Becca's lack of pretense appealed more than the pretentious poise of his ex fiance and mother. But you're in a class so high above my mother it's not even funny. Becca gave him a confused look. Gertie mentioned your mother died. She did, but if she were alive, I would never introduce you to her. My mother married my father for his money, and then she ran off with her trainer. Once the divorce was finalized, we never saw or heard from her again. Becca touched his arm. What a horrible thing for a mother to do to her kids. He shrugged. Even before she deserted us, my grandparents were raising us. It was them or a team of nannies. Sounds like you were better off with them. Caleb nodded, but this conversation was getting too personal. He wasn't sure why he'd shared the story with Becca other than she'd been so self-deprecating when she shouldn't have been. Dogs continued barking. People milled about. Applause filled ring seven. When do you go? He asked, changing the subject. After the Tibetan terriers. Snowy looks like a puffball. It takes time for him to be whitened, washed, volumized, combed, teased, and sprayed. Do you do that with every dog? Each breed is different, she explained. I have a schedule to know who to work on when. Snowy's grooming is intensive, but he loves going in the ring, so he's more patient than others. Maurice hates being on the grooming table. Blue doesn't mind it much. A man in a suit and red striped tie approached. Rebecca, isn't it? She nodded. Hi, Dennis. Caleb moved closer to her, unsure who this guy was or why he seemed so interested in Becca. Dennis smiled. Nice job with the elk hound this morning. I thought you'd get best of breed. Thanks, but Gertie's happy with select, Becca said. This is Gertie's grandson, Caleb Fairchild. I'm Dennis Johnson. The man shook his hand and then looked right back at Becca. Nice looking be shown. What products are you using on him? Prototypes Gertie developed with all natural, organic ingredients. I've been using them on all our dogs. Becca didn't miss a beat. Would you like samples to try? The man looked as if he'd hit three sevens on a slot machine. Yes, please. Find me at my RV. I have a package with the products and a form for you to give us your feedback. I'll be by later, the man said. Good luck in the ring. The exchange interested Caleb. The man recognized something different about the products Becca used on the dogs. Giving away samples with a feedback form is a good start, but it might be a little soon since you're not ready to manufacture products. Not on a large scale. But we can do smaller batches in the interim. Sounds like Graham's talking. Becca nodded. She's eager. More like a runaway train. Which was why Graham's playing matchmaker meant trouble. Not only for Caleb, but also for Becca. A woman in a purple apron walked past at a fast clip with an angry expression on her face. That bitch didn't want a free stack. Caleb waited for the woman to pass before looking at Becca. 
Bats. Dog speak. Laughter filled her bright eyes. I'm assuming you know that a bitch is a female dog. Stack means placing a dog in a position that shows off the breed standards. Hand stacking is when a handler manually positions the dog's paws. Free stacking is when the handler uses bait, calls, or signs to get the dog to position himself. Dog showing had its own vocabulary. A sociologist could have a field day studying these people and their interactions with each other and their dogs. But this was the most comfortable he'd seen Becca. Except at the kennel. She adjusted the chain collar around Snowy's neck. It's our turn. A tall, thin man with a beard and in a three-piece suit called her number. Becca entered the ring with the dog. Three other handlers and their dogs, replicas of Powderpuff Snowy, followed them. The judge studied each dog. The dogs looked the same to Caleb, but he couldn't take his eyes off Becca. She ran around the ring with Snowy and then positioned him in front of the judge. Caleb assumed that was hand stacking. They ran diagonally across the ring and back. One by one, the other handlers did the same until all circled the ring in a line once again. The judge pointed. Snowy won and was awarded a ribbon. A few minutes later, Becca and Snowy returned to the ring and went through the same routine. Snowy was named Best of Breed, B.O.B. for short, and Becca received a large ribbon. Becca skipped out of the ring. Gertie will be thrilled. I need to get Snowy in his crate so he can rest before group, then I'll call. Caleb didn't know why her voice trailed off. What? Would you mind holding Snowy for a minute? He had no idea what was happening, but he took Snowy's lead, a black leather leash with silver beads. Becca walked twenty feet away to a little girl, who appeared to be around seven or eight. The child sat on a folding chair. She held the leash of an Irish setter puppy with both hands and wiped tears from her face with her arm. Hello, I'm Becca. She knelt at the girl's side and put her hand in front of the dog's nose. What's your name? Gianna. You have a pretty dog. Gianna hiccuped. Thank you. Caleb had no idea what Becca was doing, but he moved closer to find out. The dog sniffed her hand. What's your puppy's name? P. Princess. Is Princess going to be shown today? No, Gianna sniffled. My mommy twisted her ankle, so she can't show her. This would have been Princess's first time in the ring. Becca looked around. Where's your mommy? She's getting ice for her foot. When your mom gets back, why don't we ask if she'd let me show Princess for you? Gianna's tears stopped flowing. Her mouth formed a perfect O. You're a handler? Becca petted the dog, and Gianna scooted closer to her. I'm a dog handler, and I'd be happy to show Princess. Caleb knew Becca had a full schedule, especially with Snowy winning, yet she wanted to help this little girl. Becca's kindness filled him with warmth. How many people had walked past the crying child without noticing or pretending not to see her? But she'd done something about it. The woman was special. He couldn't believe he doubted her motivations and accused her of being a scam artist. A thirty-something woman in a purple suit hobbled toward them. She carried a plastic bag full of ice. Gianna? The girl leaped out of her chair. She bounced from foot to foot, her ponytails flying up and down. Mommy, mommy, this lady can show princess for us. She's a handler. Becca rose and held out her hand. My name is Becca Taylor. Your daughter told me about your ankle. I'd be happy to show your puppy for you. Oh, thanks. The woman's gaze flitted from Becca to her daughter and the dog. That's nice of you to offer, but I can't afford to pay for a handler. No charge, Becca said with no hesitation. I wouldn't want Princess to miss her first time in the ring. Caleb's chest tightened with a mix of affection and respect at her generosity. One more attribute to add to Becca's growing list. But she wasn't being a smart businesswoman, given her priorities were his grandmother's dogs and the product samples. He assumed Grams wouldn't mind, but even if she did, Caleb wouldn't say a word. Becca was doing the right thing. Gianna tugged at her mother's arm. Please, mommy. Please, oh, please, oh, 
please. The woman looked stunned. Relief quickly took over. Th, that would be great. Thank you. Becca glanced at Caleb. Do you mind holding on to Snowy a little longer so I can work with Princess? Happy to. He would do whatever she asked. She was so genuine he wanted to help her, not make things harder. I'll put him into his crate. That would be great. Come on, Snowy. If Caleb hurried, he might make it back to watch her in the ring. I don't want to miss this. But whether Becca Taylor was in the ring or out of it, she was an extraordinary woman. There was no other place he'd rather be this weekend than right here with her. Chapter 11 Becca stood outside the ring where Best in Show, aka BIS, would be held in a few minutes. She wiggled her toes inside her black flats. The dogs, including Princess, had all placed in their events, and Snowy had won his group. The buzz surrounding Gertie's dog care samples kept increasing. Becca was beside herself with pride. Win or lose, the day would be perfect. You're so calm. Caleb stood next to her. Not the least bit nervous. As she glanced his way, her stomach somersaulted. She was so happy he was here. I'm more excited than anything else. Becca wanted to pinch herself to make sure her eyes were open, and she wasn't dreaming. She adjusted the lead in her hand. No matter how Snowy does, we've won. People are interested in Gertie's new line of dog products. It can't hurt your reputation, either. Or Snowy's. He's on his way to Grand Champion. But he's never won BIS. Today is the day. Caleb's words, spoken with sincerity, pierced her heart like an arrow. She double-checked Snowy to make sure he looked his best and then re-rolled his lead. I hope so. Good luck. His tender expression surprised Becca. He stared at her as if they were the only two people here. Her breath caught. Her temperature rose. Not that you need any, he added. Her heart melted. If only he'd given her a kiss for luck, like when she took Maurice to the vet on Monday night. Caleb's gaze lingered, tenderness turning to something resembling desire. Her pulse skittered. He might want to kiss her again. Please, oh, please. Stop. She was acting like a child. Becca didn't care. She parted her lips in case he wanted an invitation. Then she realized they weren't alone. Hundreds of people stood and sat ringside, many who knew Gertie. If she continued down this path with Caleb, it would be fruitless and dangerous. He might have decided Becca wasn't a scam artist, but a kiss would mean nothing to him. Even if she might want to kiss him, doing so wasn't right or smart. Stop. She was about to go in for best in show. She needed to concentrate on Snowy, not think about Caleb. Becca pressed her lips together. The ring steward announced the competition. She raised her chin. You'll kill them, Caleb whispered, his warm breath against her ear. No one stands a chance against you and Snowy. His words provided an extra jolt of confidence. Not needed, but appreciated. She fell in line with the six other handlers and their dogs. With a grateful smile, Becca squared her shoulders and then stepped into the ring with Snowy. It was showtime. Best in show. Snowy, registered name White Christmas in sunny July, had been named best in show. As pride flowed through Caleb, his chest expanded with each breath. A satisfied smile settled on his lips. The crowd applauded and cheered. He videotaped the award ceremony. Snowy pranced around as if he knew he was the top dog, but Becca's glowing smile and joy-filled eyes defined the moment for Caleb. A photographer snapped official winner pictures with the judge, and handlers shook Becca's hand. Then, she juggled the gift basket, flowers, and three-foot-long ribbon she'd won. Caleb stood away from the ring's entrance and waited. He wanted to watch Becca savor the win. People congratulated her, but she gave all the credit to Snowy, who soaked up the attention as if he knew he'd receive extra doggy treats tonight. Little Gianna and her mom hugged Becca. The crowd dispersed. 
Becca made her way to him, her arms extended outward with the basket and flowers in one arm and snowy sleesh and ribbon in the other. Best in show. Congratulations. Caleb wrapped his arms around her. The sense of rightness nearly knocked him back a step. But he didn't want to let go because holding her was the definition of right, natural, which was an odd way to think. He chalked it up to working too hard on the baby product launch and not going out on many dates, but he had to force himself to let go. You killed it. She blushed, a charming shade of pink. Thanks, but Snowy did all the work. Becca was too modest. That was something he liked about her. She waved the ribbon. This is also a fantastic marketing opportunity. We should see a surge of interest in the products and possibly hear from potential investors. He hadn't thought about that, but she was correct. We need to celebrate. Ben has some great restaurants. Thanks, but I don't want to leave the dogs alone in the RV. The dogs. He'd forgotten about them, even though he was surrounded by them. We can find a place that delivers. I'm set for food. I never leave the grounds of a show once I arrive. Gertie will want to celebrate when we're home. She's never had a dog win best in show. She'll probably throw a party. Sounds like Graham's. But Caleb didn't want to wait. He wanted to make today special for Becca. But we can still celebrate here. I thought you were flying home tonight. Don't you have to get to the airport? I was, am. But Caleb wasn't sure he wanted to leave now. Unless you want me to stay. Don't waste your entire weekend here. Fly home and have brunch with Gertie. Caleb did that every Sunday. He would rather be with Becca tomorrow. She juggled the items in her arms. He took the basket and flowers from her. I'll carry these. Thanks. A smile brightened her face. She walked with a playful bounce to her step. Neither of which he had anything to do with. He wanted to be the reason she was so happy, but only dogs got that honor. He was at a disadvantage without four legs and fur. The light fragrance of the flowers tickled his nose, teasing him as if the blossoms knew he wouldn't be there in the morning, but they would be. People streamed out of the fairgrounds. Engines roared to life. Horns honked. Dogs barked. People were returning to their hotels off-site. Others headed to their RVs parked in a special area. Becca placed Snowy into his pen under the shade of an awning and then checked the other dogs. Want a drink or a snack before you head to the airport? What makes you think I'm leaving now? Her eyes widened. I assumed you'd want to get home. Home is a 3,000-square-foot loft in downtown Boise. A quiet place, a lonely one, compared to the activity and noise here. He breathed in the fresh air. This is a pleasant change. No need to rush back. I'm grilling hot dogs. You're more than welcome to join me. He did a double take. You said you had food for the weekend, but I never thought about hot dogs. Does wiener dogs work better? Or how about docks and dogs, she teased. We're at a dog show. A themed meal makes sense. What else is on the menu? Laughter filled her eyes. Saluki slaw, bloodhound beans, and Pekingese potato chips. Oh, and corgi cookies for dessert. Corgi cookies, huh? There's also Bernie's brownies. A quick thinker. He liked that. Not a bad job coming up with those names on the fly. And turning a meal into fun. He needed to have more fun. Not bad? A corner of her mouth slid upward. Pretty good if you ask me. You've convinced me to stay. I'll fly to Boise after dinner so I can have brunch with Grams in the morning. Panic replaced the laughter in Becca's eyes. She shot him a what have I gotten myself into smile before tugging her bottom lip with her teeth. Win-win. She was a good sport. Those are the games I like. Except he wasn't sure what he was doing with Becca. There was no reason for him to stay. Hot dogs weren't his typical Saturday night dinner fare, but he was more interested in the company, Becca's company. And how could he turn down a corgi cookie? Win-win any way he looked at it. 
After dinner, Becca stood at the RV sink. She kept a smile on her face, but tension wreaked havoc inside her. Awareness of Caleb flowed down her spine and pulled at her feet. She slanted a glance over her shoulder. I'm almost finished. Caleb sat in one of the leather lounge chairs. His legs were extended and crossed at the ankles. His gaze was on her. I'm happy to help. She focused on cleaning up after dinner because that gave her hands something to do other than combing her fingers through her hair and straightening her clothes. Around Caleb, Becca was self-conscious about her appearance, about everything. It was nothing he did, he even offered to help prepare the meal and clean up. Or anything he said, he was easy to speak with and complimentary. It was just, him. She placed the now-dried pans in the cabinet above. There isn't much to do. Okay, there wasn't a lot in the kitchen, but what about the dogs? She checked the clock on the microwave. I need to take them for walks. Caleb rose. I'll go with you. What about your flight? He took a step toward her. His tall, athletic frame turned the spacious and luxurious RV into a pop-up trailer. It's my grandmother's jet. There's no set departure time until I tell them I'm ready. Must be nice. Becca was getting used to Gertie's top-of-the-line RV, explicitly purchased for dog shows. She held out a plastic container that held the leftover cookies. Want more? If I take another bite, it'll take a crane to get me out of here. He patted his flat stomach. I forgot how good hot dogs tasted. Must be a big change from the haute cuisine you eat. Prime rib is as fancy as I get, he said. I take after my grandfather with food. Gramps was a meat and potatoes man to the chagrin of Grams, who liked to experiment in the kitchen the way she does in the lab. We usually ended up with two dinners when I was a kid. One for Gramps that our cook made and one for the more adventurous appetites that Gramps provided. Which did you eat? Both. I took a bite of whatever Gramps cooked. Sometimes more. Only once did I spit it out. I made her promise never to tell me what it was. It must have been interesting to grow up with Gertie. Life was never boring. But no matter how busy my grandparents were with Fair Face, we ate dinner together. That was our special time. Sounds nice. She ignored the twinge of envy, even though her mom and dad loved her. My parents worked multiple jobs, so eating meals at the same time didn't happen much. That had to have been rough. It's all I knew. She put the lid on the cookies, before setting the container on the counter. My folks struggled to make ends meet, so it was difficult for me to complain. You get your work ethic from them. She nodded. I wish things were easier for them. Invite them to visit you at Grams's house. Gertie suggested that, but my parents don't have the same days off, Becca said. I emailed them pictures. They thought the estate looked like something from a TV show. The grounds impressed my dad. His dream is to have a lawn to mow. We've always had gardeners, but a riding mower looks fun. I take it your loft doesn't have a yard. No. There's a terrace with planters and a lap spa, but grass would be impractical. Caleb followed Becca out of the RV. The sun had disappeared beneath the horizon. Streetlights along the roads that now doubled as walkways around the RVs lit up the area. Well, if you ever want a lawn up there, there's artificial grass. He gave her a look. You can't mow that. Vacuum it. Uh, that doesn't sound like fun. Let me guess, you've never vacuumed. I haven't. Their lives were so different. Becca wouldn't allow herself to forget that even if she enjoyed talking and being with him. Try it sometime if you want to clear your mind. I might. She locked the RV door. That means you won't. A sheepish grin spread across his face. Wouldn't want to offend the team that cleans my place. Becca inhaled sharply. He lived in a different universe than her. You have more than one cleaner? I'm doing my part to stimulate the economy. Okay, that was funny. 
she enjoyed his sense of humor. My time with Gertie has given me a glimpse into how the other half lives. What do you think so far? His question didn't sound flippant, but why would he care what she thought? Except for her parents and Gertie, few people did. That bad, huh? he asked. No, not at all. So. He sounded genuinely interested in knowing Becca's opinion. Honestly, it's been nice. Gertie is eccentric and loves luxurious things, but she's more grounded than I imagined someone as wealthy as her to be. It'll be hard to leave behind. His gaze narrowed. Are you going somewhere? Not in the near future, but I want to be a full-time handler. Care for the dogs in between shows. Teach handling classes to kids and dog owners. You can make a living doing that? His disbelief didn't surprise her. The top handlers in the country earned six figures a year. I had no idea people did this as a career. A few do. Most work other jobs and handle part-time or as a hobby. Some save money so they can take time off. You're saving for a rainy day. She couldn't believe he remembered their conversation in his office. Yes. You could have a lucrative career working for Grams, especially if the dog care products are successful. You'd earn more than you'd make as a dog handler. Becca shrugged. I never set out to go into business. You care about what you do. You're not just out to make a buck. No, but having a few bucks in the bank doesn't hurt. He smiled. You belong here. In this dog show world. I think so. She hoped this was where she belonged. I appreciate Gertie allowing me to work with her dogs. Becca attached Morris's leash to his collar and released him from the pen. The dog ran to Caleb. You have a new friend, she said. He rubbed the dog's head. It's because I have no dog hair on me. Maurice needs to mark his territory. As long as he's not marking it another way. Caleb gave her a look. Don't give Maurice any ideas. Becca peeked in on Snowy. The dog slept soundly, his back leg jerking as if dreaming. She would take him out later. Come on, Blue. She removed the gray 18-month-old puppy from his pen. Time for your walk, boy. Caleb walked next to her with the dogs leading the way. A man, a well-known handler from California, walking four beagles, greeted them with a nod and a hello. Caleb watched them pass by. Some people show the same type of dog. Why doesn't my grandmother stick to one breed? Gertie loves all dogs, not a particular breed. She also owns dogs that others weren't sure about or gave up on. She had the pick of most litters, but she would rather choose a dog who needs a second chance. Why would they need a second chance? They're purebreds. Yes, but not every purebred meets the breed standard. Reputable breeders have those dogs neutered or spayed and placed in homes as pets. Becca pointed to Blue. This guy was the runt of the litter. No one expected him to be show quality, but your grandmother saw something in him and took a chance. Now he's on his way to being a champion. I'm not surprised. Grams has always been fond of strays. No kidding. She took me in. My sister and me, too. You weren't strays, Becca countered. You're her family. Caleb shrugged. Gertie treats her rescues and fosters the same as her show dogs. Becca could tell he didn't want to talk about this. Your grandmother has a big heart. So do you. His words meant more than they should. Becca downplayed the flutters in her stomach. It's easy with dogs. There was that little girl, Gianna, today. Just trying to be nice. Is that what you're doing now? He studied her. Being nice to me when you wish I'd left hours ago? Becca didn't know what she was doing. But she didn't like how Caleb saw right through her as if her every thought and emotion were on display, especially for him. They were too much in sync, able to understand each other even though they were in very different places in life. Around him, she was vulnerable, reminding her of the three long years in prison and hating it. 
She tightened her grip on the leash and looked up at the sky full of twinkling dots of lights. Lots of stars out tonight. You're changing the subject. You're supposed to pretend you don't notice and play along. He slowed to allow Maurice to sniff the grass. What if I don't want to do that? You're the kind of guy who plays by the rules. Normally, yes. He moved closer to her. But this isn't normal. She fought the urge to step back. Do you mean being at the dog show? Caleb stopped inches away from her. I mean being here with you. The light from the street lamp cast shadows on his face. He looked dark and dangerous and oh so sexy. Becca swallowed. The last time she'd thought that way about a guy, she'd ended up in jail. That might not be what would happen to her next, but she shouldn't take unnecessary chances and do something stupid again. His gaze locked on hers. Do you want to keep playing by the rules? Her heart slammed against her ribs. She should step back. Put distance between them. For her own good. And his. Except her feet wouldn't move. She remained rooted in place, waiting, hoping, anticipating. Caleb tilted his head down, bringing his mouth close to hers. Becca rose on her toes and leaned forward. Their lips touched. So much for rules. He wrapped his arms around her, pulled her close, and kissed her hard. Hot, salty, raw. His lips moved across hers, skillfully. His kiss possessed as if staking a claim and declaring she was his. Becca had never felt that way before. She shouldn't like it, either. She was independent and didn't need a man to give her value. But with tingles reaching to the tips of her toes and fingers, possession seemed a small price to pay. Pleasurable sensations pulsed through her, heating her from the inside out. He deepened the kiss. She followed willingly, arching toward him. Rough. Caleb jerked, backward. He let go of her. Becca stumbled to the right. Grohl. Maurice and Blue lunged toward two teeth-bearing Pekingese with satin bows on their ears. She yanked on the leash. Heel. Caleb grabbed Maurice by the collar. The other dogs didn't back down. Their owner, a petite woman with spiky white hair, a shimmery short robe, and flower-trimmed flip-flops, frowned. Next time, get a room. Becca's cheeks burned. Her lips throbbed. Oh, no. She'd been so wrapped up in Caleb she had forgotten about the dogs. What if they'd gotten into a fight and been hurt? Not acceptable. The woman marched away, dragging her wannabe fighters behind her. The dogs looked back and growled. That didn't turn out as I expected. Grams might know something we didn't. Desire flared in his eyes. We should try that again. Oh, yes. Becca would love another kiss. Make that kisses. But she couldn't. She glanced at Blue, who sniffed the grass as if nothing had happened. If only this situation didn't remind her so much of. The past. Who Caleb was. Who she was. I can't. Can't or won't. Does it matter? He set his jaw. If not for those bow-toting dogs. If it weren't for them, I'd still be kissing you. A sinfully charming grin lit up his face. Then, let's pick up where we left off. Temptation flared. Kissing you was, amazing. But I forgot everything. The dogs could have been hurt. They're my responsibility. I can't be distracted. Approval tempered the desire in his gaze. I understand and respect that. Respect was all she'd wanted until this moment. Now, she wanted more kisses. Oh. Thanks. She tried to remember all the reasons Caleb and his kisses weren't good for her. I appreciate it. Just know, when you're in Boise, and the dogs aren't around, I want to kiss you again. If that's what you want, too. Her heart lodged in her throat. She struggled to breathe, let alone speak. Heaven help her, but Becca couldn't wait to get back to Boise. Chapter 12 Two nights later, 
Caleb arrived at his grandmother's estate for her party. He handed his keys to a parking valet. Based on the number of cars, she'd gone all out despite it being a Monday. But he wasn't surprised. When Gertie Fairchild issued an invitation, few sent regrets because she served top-shelf liquor, delicious catered food, and the society pages took notice, making her parties the place to be seen. Inside the house, Caleb greeted people he'd known his entire life and made his way to the backyard. Leave it to Grams to pull together an impromptu gathering for 200 of her closest friends in honor of Snowy winning Best in Show. On the patio, a DJ spun music. Bartenders fixed drinks. Uniformed servers carried trays of delicious smelling appetizers. He searched for the women he wanted to see most, his grandmother and Becca. He glimpsed Grams, wearing pink capris and a sparkly blouse. He wove his way through the crowd. Caleb. She hugged him. I've been wondering when you'd arrive. I had a few things to finish up at the office. Take off your jacket and tie, she said with a smile. Get a drink. And relax. He glanced around. Are you looking for Becca? Grams asked. Yes. She's here. Courtney, too. His sister never turned down a party invitation, even if the average age of the guest list was twice hers. I hope Courtney's staying out of trouble. Probably not. His grandmother waved at someone who'd stepped out onto the patio. You should find Becca and see if you can get yourself into trouble with her. Grams. What? She feigned innocence. Thirty-one is too young to be so serious about everything. Becca would be good for you. Help you lighten up and enjoy life. Maybe in the short term. Caleb had enjoyed their time together at the dog show, talking, laughing, kissing. Best not let his grandmother know that, or she would hire a wedding planner to come up with the perfect proposal, one that would go viral on YouTube. Becca and I figured out you've been playing matchmaker. Grams pointed to herself. Moi? We, oui, Grandmere. Speak French to Becca. Women like that. Caleb shook his head but made a mental note to give speaking French a try. Becca is a special woman. Grams lowered her voice. But it will take a special man to break through her hard shell. Becca and I are friends. Friends who had shared a passionate kiss before being rudely interrupted by a pair of Pekingese dogs. He might want more of Becca's kisses, but he wasn't that special man. The last thing he needed was a girlfriend. He didn't want to be responsible for one more person. Nothing more. Your loss is another man's gain because she's a keeper. An image of Becca kissing someone else in Caleb's mind made his shoes tighten. He stretched his toes. I'm going to find Courtney. Have fun. Grams flitted toward the house, taking on a role as Boise's most gracious hostess. Caleb grabbed a bottle of beer from the bar and took a swig. Just what he needed after a long day at the office. Now, if he wanted to find Becca. Hey, bro. The scent of his sister's perfume surrounded him. Hello. He surveyed her outfit. Well, what there was of it. Courtney's ruffled miniskirt barely hit her underwear and the two tank tops she wore showed as much skin as a string bikini top. A clip held up her blonde hair with tendrils artfully placed around her face. As usual, her makeup was magazine layout perfect. Typical for his sister, but disturbing for an older brother who worried about her. I met your new girlfriend. He nearly spit out his beer, but he forced himself to swallow instead. I don't have a girlfriend. Becca. She's not. What has Graham's been telling you? Only that she found the perfect woman for you. A keeper. Courtney snagged a flute of champagne from the tray of a passing waiter. Becca is cute. With a wardrobe makeover, some highlights, and makeup, she will be totally hot. I'm happy to assist. Becca is fine the way she is. You like her. I don't, he lowered his voice. Becca is sweet. She doesn't need to be dragged into Grams's matchmaking scheme. Better her than me. Courtney sipped her champagne. The alarm on Grams's great-grandbaby clock is ringing. Don't look at me. 
I do enough as it is. Well, I'm not ready to be a mom. I've never dated a guy longer than a month. Caleb stared at her over the top of his beer bottle. Given your choice in men, that's a good thing. You should have Grams fix you up. Bet she'd pick a winner for you. Yeah, right. Someone respectable and boring like you. Courtney shook her head. Don't forget, I misplace everything. Imagine if I lost a kid. That would be bad. Terrible, he agreed with an amused smile. No worries. Grams will get over the idea of great-grandchildren eventually. I hope so, but we should be proactive about this. Let's buy Grams a kitten. Grams is a dog person. That doesn't mean she can't be a crazy cat lady, too. Kittens are cute and cuddly. Kind of like a baby, but you don't have to deal with diapers, only litter boxes. Caleb wasn't in the mood to understand his sister's twisted logic, especially after she'd called him boring. He downed what remained of his beer. Hold off on the kitten for a while and stay out of trouble tonight. Courtney stuck her tongue out at him. You're no fun. As he walked away, Caleb realized Courtney was correct. He used to be fun. When he was younger, he and Ty had had nothing but fun. But after Caleb took over fair face for his grandfather, his life revolved around the company and family. Nothing else. He followed the path past the guest cottage, only the porch light was on, to the kennel. A dog barked from inside. Caleb wasn't sure which one, but then he recognized the sound. Maurice. Caleb entered the kennel. More barks erupted, drowning out the pop music playing from a docking station. Quiet. Becca faced Dozer's kennel. Her floral skirt fell two inches above her knees, and the green sleeveless shirt showed off toned arms. Her white sandals accentuated thin ankles. We don't want Gertie's guests to hear you. The dog stopped barking. Maurice stood with his front paws on his door. What's gotten into you? Becca asked the dog. Caleb stopped two feet behind her. So, this is where you're hiding. She gasped and whirled to face him. Her skirt flared, giving him a glimpse of her thighs. Much more enticing than a super short hem that left nothing to the imagination. Her eyes were wide, and her cheeks pink. She placed her hand over her heart. Caleb. I didn't mean to startle you. She peered around him as if to see if anyone else was behind him. What are you doing here? I should ask you the same question. He couldn't believe they'd only been apart two days. It seemed longer. The party's on the patio. But you're down here. Alone. She motioned to the dogs, watching them intently from their stalls. I have company. You know what I mean. She nodded. It's a bit overwhelming. The party? All the guests, servers, bartenders, DJ, parking valets. Gertie introduced me to about a hundred people tonight. I can't keep the faces and names straight. So, you escaped here. Another nod. This is my favorite place at the estate. It's where I'm. Comfortable, he finished for her. Yes, I fit in here. The way he understood her was unsettling to him. He cut the distance between them in half with one step. You love the kennel and the dogs, but you also fit in at the house with everybody else. She ground the toe of her sandal against the floor. I don't know about that. I do. Caleb used his finger to raise her chin. You're smart, beautiful, kind. The pink on her cheeks darkened. You don't have to stop. I don't plan on stopping unless you want me to. He didn't want to frighten her away. I'd like to pick up right where we left off. Her lips parted. He grinned. I'll take that as an invitation. Please. Caleb kissed her. Something he'd wanted to do since he drove away from the fairgrounds on Saturday night. But he never expected her to melt into him. She seemed to have been looking forward to this moment as much as him. He pressed his lips against hers, soaking up the taste of her. So sweet. Warm. His. He wrapped his arms around her, pulling her close. 
she went eagerly until her soft curves molded against him. So right. His temperature shot up, fueled by the heat pulsing through him. Her hands were on his back and in his hair. He couldn't get enough of her. Well, isn't this the icing on the cake? Grams. He jumped back, his breathing ragged. Becca's flushed face and swollen lips were the last things he wanted anyone to see. Too late now. Caleb faced the woman who had raised him. Courtney stood next to his grandmother. Grams had her hands clasped together. She looked giddy, as if a genie had granted her three wishes. She needed only one because her silly grin told him what was on her mind, great-grandbabies. Her eyes twinkled. Nothing more than friends, huh? So, this is how it feels not to be the one in trouble. Courtney smirked. I kind of like it. Caleb positioned himself between his family and Becca. It's not what you think. Yes, it is. Grams rubbed her palms together. And I couldn't be more delighted. Becca's heart pounded in her chest, a mixture of embarrassment, passion, and pride. The way Caleb shielded her like a knight in gray pinstripes brought a rush of affection. He might be everything she didn't want in a guy, but at this moment, she wouldn't want to be with anyone else. Her lips throbbed, and her breathing wouldn't settle. She ate for more kisses. She'd experienced those same reactions in Redmond, but this time, something awakened inside her. It was as if she'd finally met a man who saw beyond her past and accepted her for who she was today. No one had ever made her feel like that. Becca longed to reach forward and lace her fingers with Caleb's in support and solidarity. But that would only fuel Gertie's speculations. It's not what you think. But it could be, right? The possibility gave Becca hope and strength. She stepped forward and stood next to Caleb. Gertie rose on her tiptoes, acting more like an excited child than the creative genius of a skincare empire. Courtney's snicker turned into a smile, transforming the beautiful young woman from a life size cardboard cutout of the latest fashion trends to someone real and genuine. People want to see Snowy, Gertie said. Becca glanced at the dog in the kennel. He's ready. We'll bring Snowy up there in a few minutes, Caleb added. Gertie winked. Don't take too long. Heat rushed up Becca's neck. A vein twitched at Caleb's jaw. We won't. Both Gertie and Courtney pressed their lips together, as if they might burst out laughing, and left. As soon as the door shut, he stared at the floor, shaking his head. Becca touched his shoulder. I'm sorry. His gaze met hers. Softened. You have nothing to be sorry about. But Gertie will think. Caleb kissed Becca. The gentle whisper of a kiss, nothing more than a tender brush of his lips, made her feel cherished. Her chest swelled with more affection for this man. He backed away from her slowly. Becca swallowed a sigh. She wished he would keep on kissing her, forever. Don't worry about my grandmother or my sister. He touched Becca's face again, lightly tracing her jawline with his thumb. It doesn't matter what they think is going on between us. She nodded, but she was worried. All they'd done was kiss. But something was happening between her and Caleb, something big. But if he didn't feel the same. I'm happy I finally got to kiss you from beginning to end, even if someone interrupted us again. Now that we've finished that, we can move on. Move on? His words swirled and squeezed tight like a vice grip around her heart. Her breath hitched. Her throat burned. Caleb wasn't talking about kisses. He wanted more. A hookup. A one-night stand. That was why he'd said what he had to Gertie. The kisses hadn't meant the same thing to him. Becca's shoulders sagged. Thank goodness she'd found out before any actual damage had been done. She straightened and raised her chin. I need to get snowy. Caleb's eyes darkened. What's wrong? A nothing sat on the tip of her tongue. But nothing wouldn't keep her stomach from nodding a thousand different ways. Nothing wouldn't keep her from staying up all night analyzing the situation until exhaustion took over. She'd been there before. She wasn't eager for a return trip. 
with a deep breath, she mustered her courage. So now that we've finished. We, he twirled a short strand of her hair with his fingertip, are going on a date. Hope exploded inside her, as Caution shouted a warning. A date? Dinner at Pacifica. Pacifica was a new restaurant in town. I've heard the place is incredible, but it's impossible to get a reservation. I'll get us a table. His confidence attracted her as much as it repelled. Less than a minute ago, she was ready to write his kiss, and him, off. Now she was going on a date with him. The tennis match worthy back and forth was enough to make her lightheaded. Becca wasn't interested in his money or power. She liked the way he cared about people and took care of them. But she was pleased he wanted to do something special. She found it endearingly silly because she would be happy going out for hot dogs. Sounds great. Are you free Wednesday? That was only two days away. No worries. He would never get a table. I am. He typed on his smartphone. This shouldn't take long. What are you doing? I'm making a reservation. His phone buzzed. He stared at the screen. Wednesday at 8. It's a date. How did you manage that? I grew up here. He appeared pleased with himself. I have connections. And now she had a date with Caleb Fairchild. The realization of what she'd agreed to hit her like a 200-pound Newfoundland dog wanting a hug. Hope turned to an impending sense of dread, weighing down her sandals with cement blocks. Becca trudged to Snowy's kennel. A date with Caleb Fairchild. She opened the door and attached Snowy's leash to his collar. She would need something beautiful to wear on the date. Snowy trotted out. She would need to know what utensils to use when. Was the saying from the outside in, or was it from the inside out? She would need to look up rules of etiquette and table manners on the internet. Not that she knew what to say or not say to Gertie about going out with Caleb. Snowy looks like a champion, Caleb said. Becca nodded, but her muscles bunched and her stomach clenched. A date with Caleb Fairchild. A man who reserved a table at the most popular restaurant in town with a simple text was the last guy she should ever want to date. Or kiss. Or. No falling for him. A date was one thing, a kiss another. Anything more would be disastrous. On the patio, Caleb stood back while Gertie, Becca, and Snowy took the spotlight. Becca's confidence blossomed around the dog. Courtney sidled up next to him. Not what you think. Really? Drop it. No, she leaned closer, sending a whiff of expensive perfume up his nose. I saw the direction of your hand. Becca didn't mind one bit. You like her. I enjoy spending time with her. You like her. Becca stacked snowy the way she had in the ring. The dog ate up all the applause and attention as if it were beef jerky. How long have you been dating? Courtney asked. Why won't you let this go? You dating someone takes the pressure off me. She flipped her hair behind her shoulder with a practiced move rumored to have caught men off at their knees. Not a man Caleb would want to know. So, Spill, she said. We're not dating, but I'm taking Becca to Pacifica on Wednesday. Fancy schmancy. Courtney used her favorite saying since childhood. The words described his sister's lifestyle perfectly. You're out to impress Becca. I want her to enjoy the evening. But Caleb wanted to impress Becca, too. She needs to be comfortable, not intimidated. Courtney grinned as if she'd been handed a visa card with no spending limit. Leave it to me, bro. The two women were so different. He eyed his sister warily. What do you have in mind? Wednesday morning, Becca released the dogs into their run. She cleaned the kennel from top to bottom, sweeping, scrubbing, disinfecting. The entire time she thought about Caleb. Tonight was their date. She ran through the things she'd been learning online about eating at an expensive restaurant. Use flatware from the outside in. Napkins are for dabbing, never wiping. Bread should be torn, not cut with a knife. 
Her parents had taught her rules like no elbows on the table, don't take a bite until everyone had been served, and don't slurp soup or drinks. She could pull this off. If not, it was only one date, no big deal. Yeah, right. This dinner was the biggest deal since Gertie hired her. As Becca mopped the floor outside the dog stalls, she pictured her outfit for tonight. She'd gone through every piece of clothing she owned and settled on a slim black skirt, white blouse, and a pair of black pumps. A scarf would add a burst of color. Silver hoop earrings and a bracelet would be her jewelry. She wanted to look elegant. Most likely, she would be dressed too plainly for a place as trendy and hip as Pacifica. Maybe she should cancel. Becca rested against the mop. You could take a mutt into the show ring, but no matter what she wore or how she acted, the maitre d' would know she was a mixed breed, not a purebred. No sense pretending otherwise. Her cell phone rang. Hello. Please come to the house right now. The urgency in Gertie's voice made Becca drop the mop. On my way. She hurried to the house, picking up the pace with each step. The family room was empty. The kitchen, too. Gertie? Upstairs. Becca climbed the stairs too, at a time, her heart racing, worried about Gertie. She entered the woman's bedroom, her gaze scanning the unique antiques, luxurious textiles, and exotic treasures. Something was on the bed. A pile of clothes and shoes. Gertie stood with a beaming smile on her face and a familiar twinkle in her eyes. Courtney was next to her grandmother. Mrs. Harrison and Maura were there, too. What's going on? Becca asked. Courtney motioned to the bed. I have a bunch of stuff that isn't the right color or style for my skin tone and body type. We're about the same size. Maura, too. I thought the two of you might want to see if there's anything you like. Becca pictured her outfit for tonight. She couldn't believe her luck or Courtney's generosity. A lump of gratitude clogged Becca's throat. Tears stung her eyes. She covered her face with her hands. Gertie put her arm around Becca. What's wrong, dear? The timing is perfect. She sniffled. I have a date, but I have nothing nice enough to wear, so I've been thinking about cancelling. Don't fret. Gertie's relaxed tone made it seem as if the world could end, and everything would be okay. And please don't cancel, Courtney said. We'll find you a knockout outfit to wear. Some clothes still have the tags on them. Becca rubbed her eyes. She didn't understand rich people. Courtney is a shopaholic. Something she may have inherited from me, Gertie said to Maura and Becca. It's about time others enjoyed my granddaughter's addiction. Maura stepped forward. I'd love some new clothes. Tags or not. Most of Becca's clothes came from thrift stores or consignment shops. She had no issue with hand-me-downs. Me, too. Where are you going on your date? Gertie asked. As soon as Becca told them where, they would know she would be with Caleb. But she wouldn't lie. Pacifica. Both Mrs. Harrison and Maura gasped. A smug smile formed on Courtney's lips. A lovely restaurant. With a beaming grin, Gertie led Becca toward the bed. Let's find something that'll make Caleb's eyes bug out and want to go straight to dessert. Chapter 13 Dinner at Pacifica was a hundred times better than Caleb expected. It wasn't the mouth-watering Northwest cuisine from the award-winning chef or the all-star service from the waiter dressed in black. It wasn't the romantic atmosphere with flickering votive candles and fresh flowers atop a linen-covered table for two. It was the woman sitting across from him who made the night memorable. He squeezed Becca's hand. Have I told you how stunning you look tonight? Her smile meant only for him added a foot to his height. About ten times. But I don't mind. I'll keep saying it, then. She wore a one-shoulder floral dress with a tantalizing asymmetrical hem. The heels of her strappy sandals accentuated her long legs. She'd glossed her lips and put on makeup. You're the most beautiful woman in Boise. Her cheeks flushed. 
the pale pink only made her more attractive. Only because your sister helped me. You don't need makeup and clothes. He pointed to her heart. It's all right there. The rest are optional accessories. Gratitude shone in the depths of her eyes. Thank you. You're welcome. Caleb didn't have room in his life for a girlfriend. But he enjoyed being with Becca. He kissed the top of her hand. Even though your dress is spectacular, I kind of miss seeing you covered in dog hair. Her laughter, as melodic as a song, caressed his heart. I doubt they would have let me in with a speck of hair or lint on me. She glanced around before lowering her voice. I'm so relieved I made it through dinner. I was nervous if I used the wrong fork or something, they'd kick me out. You made no mistakes. She kissed his hand. It wasn't that hard. Their waiter with a gleaming bald head and an equally bright smile dropped off the leather case containing Caleb's credit card and the bill. Becca rubbed his thumb with hers. Thank you for dinner. I'll never forget this evening. He wouldn't, either. We must do it again. I'd like that, but... What? Mischief filled her eyes. You've given me a peek into your world. If we go out again, I want to show you mine. Not if, when. That sounds fun. She shimmied her shoulders. Caleb wanted to lean across the table and kiss the bare skin and then trail more kisses up her neck until he reached her lips. How does Friday sound, he asked. This Friday? He might not want a girlfriend, but a few dates meant nothing. He enjoyed hanging out with Becca. No big deal. He could walk away at any time. But for now, he would enjoy her. Yes. On Thursday, Becca printed out a stack of emails for Gertie. These are product orders. Too bad we don't have any products to sell. As Gertie thumbed through the pages, her smile kept widening. We'll make batches in the lab. Is that legal? We're using natural, known ingredients, so we shouldn't have a problem. She glanced at Becca. But double check with Caleb to be on the safe side. Becca would love to hear his voice. His goodnight kiss in the parking lot had tempted her, but common sense won out over tempting lips. Each time she was with Caleb, she grew fonder of him. Still, taking a swan dive into an empty pool wouldn't be smart. She didn't need to hear his tempting voice. I'll send him a text. Gertie tapped her chin. We should pick a show, set up a booth, and debut the products. The Stumptown Cluster is in July, but that's too soon. There's the August Enum Claw. That one draws people from all over and has multiple breed specialties going on, too. Sounds good. Mark your calendar. August wasn't that far away. Summer will be busy with all the shows we've entered. Have Caleb go with you. Her pulse raced faster than a greyhound chasing a rabbit. But Becca would never ask him to attend that many with her. Not only did he have work, but she also wouldn't lower her guard that much and open herself up to more heartache. We're not. Friends? I've seen the way he looks at you. Gertie raised a white eyebrow. He's never looked at another woman like that. Not even his ex fiance When Courtney did her makeup for the big date, his ex fiance had come up. It had shocked Becca to learn she and Caleb had something in common with their past romances. She now understood why he hadn't trusted her when they first met. He'd been hurt by a woman who claimed to love him. That would make trusting again difficult. That makes you happy, Gertie said. Yes, very much so. But Becca didn't dare admit that aloud. As a little voice inside her head whispered a warning, caution reverberated through her. If she raised her hopes up too high, it could mean a long, hurtful drop. The last thing she wanted, needed, was for her heart to go splat. But she could say something. Caleb is a nice guy. Yes, but my grandson is still a man, Gertie said. They'll take whatever you offer and try to keep the status quo. I don't understand. Don't sleep with Caleb until there's a wedding band on your finger. Becca's cheeks burned. We've only kissed a few times. 
some pretty hot kisses. She covered her mouth with her hand, unable to believe Gertie talked so openly about kissing and sex. Don't be embarrassed, Gertie said. Young people think views like mine are old-fashioned, but there's no reason to rush into anything. A man worth his salt will wait for the woman they love. Becca's boss had only her best interests at heart, but this was awkward. I'll remember. Not that she and Caleb were close to, that. They'd had one official date. Taking things to the next level would be a game-changer. What had he said? Win-win. She'd always come out on the losing side before. That wouldn't change, even if a part of her wished it would. But Becca wasn't sure she was ready to trust her heart again. Or if she ever could. And she sure wouldn't trust Caleb with her body. Friday evening, Caleb arrived at what looked to be an Old West saloon for his date with Becca. He hadn't seen her in two days, two of the longest days of his life. If he wasn't thinking about her, he was texting her. If he wasn't texting her, he was figuring out when to call her. If he wasn't calling her, she was on his mind again. The vicious cycle left him distracted and behind at work. This was unusual, and he wanted it to stop. No matter because this wasn't a serious relationship. Caleb and Becca shared a few interests in sizzling chemistry. Only those two things drew him to her, nothing more. Becca stood outside the restaurant, waiting for him. She wore jean shorts, a red lace-trimmed camisole with a matching gingham button-down shirt over it. His heart tripped over. His temperature skyrocketed at the tan, toned skin showing. You came straight from the office, she said. I got stuck in a meeting. He kissed her cheek. She smelled sweet, like strawberries. I'm overdressed. Take off your jacket and tie. It's fine. She tugged on his tie. I'm serious. You need to take this off now. Don't worry. You'll regret not. He touched his finger to her lips. Shoo. Your loss. Caleb had no idea what she meant. How was your day? Good. I reviewed our new website and gave a list of changes to the designer. Text me the URL. I will. Courtney came up with the name. Top Dog Essentials. He opened the door to the restaurant. I'm surprised Grams dragged my sister into this. Becca entered. Courtney offered to help. She must have an ulterior motive. Isn't being nice enough? Not for my sister. Inside, he took a step. Something crunched beneath his shoe. Peanut shells. This is an interesting floor covering. The entire place was different. The hole in the wall grill was nothing like Pacifica. The sense of hops and grease filled the air. The din of customers' conversations and cussing rose above the honky tonk music playing from speakers. Becca pointed to a no ties sign. You should take yours off. No one cares what I wear here. They do. That sign means someone will cut off your tie if you're wearing it. Why would they do that? Because this is a casual place. It's just a tie. Exactly, she said. So take it off. I'll take my chances. And what happens when they cut it off? We'll go shopping, and you can pick out a replacement. I'll buy anything you choose as my punishment. Not that it'll be necessary. I'm good with that. She dragged two fingers over her mouth, zipping her lips. I won't mention it again. The hostess wore tight jean shorts, a spaghetti strap top, cowboy boots, and a ponytail. She led them to a table. Caleb sat across from Becca. A tin pail full of shelled peanuts sat between them next to a roll of paper towels. The hostess handed them menus. Your server will be right with you. Wood planks covered with engraved names hung on the walls. He doubted the people used a butter knife for carving. That told him a lot about the clientele. He would bring Ty when his best friend came home. Come here often? No, but it's one of my favorite places in town. I've never heard of it. It's time you discovered Boise's hidden gems. Hidden, yes. A gem? 
Becca would have to convince Caleb. But Ty would love this place. Caleb read the menu. Lots of red meat and potatoes. Fried, French, mashed, baked. Okay, that more than worked for him. Howdy, partners. I'm Jackie, your server. A perky, voluptuous woman with equally puffy big hair stood at their table. She wore tight jean shorts and a t-shirt two sizes too small. We must have a new visitor to our fine establishment. Welcome. I take it you didn't read the sign. What sign? Becca shook her head. The no tie sign, Jackie said. I saw it, he admitted. Then there's only one thing left for me to do. She pulled out a pair of scissors from her back pocket, leaned toward him, and cut off his tie right above one side of the knot. What the, he stared at the empty spot where his tie used to hang. It was empty. That was a silk tie. Inexpensive. I told you, Becca said. More than once, if you remember. Jackie nodded. You disobeyed the sign. You pay the price. This was unbelievable. What happens to the tie now? It becomes part of our decor, Jackie said. Look up. Caleb did. Hundreds of colorful ties hung from the ceiling. You should have listened to me, Becca said. But I've never been that fond of your yellow tie. No big loss if you want my opinion. Red is a power color. Jackie tucked the tie into her bra. Yellow is, too. Understated, Becca chimed in. Unbelievable. His grandmother had mentioned the same things. He half laughed. You've got your peanuts, menus, and a sense of humor, Jackie said. I'll be back in a jiff to take your drink orders. With that, the server walked away. I hope you're not too upset about your tie. Becca asked. Not upset. He undid the two top buttons on his shirt. It's my fault. You warned me. I chose not to listen to you. Lesson learned. I guess we'll be going shopping. I won't hold you to that if you'd rather pick out your own. With a smile, Becca grabbed more peanuts. Dig in. He removed one from the pail. You toss the shells on the floor? You've led a sheltered life. Watch and learn. She illustrated what to do. Your turn. Caleb took another, opened it, removed the peanut, and tossed the shell on the floor. Easy peasy. She dumped a handful in front of him. Then she pointed to a target painted on the aisle between the tables. Now we can get serious. High point wins. That sounded fun. What's the prize? She shrugged. What do you want it to be? You. But he doubted she was up for that. I don't care. Then I'll have to think of something, until then, go for it. With each shell he tossed, the stress of his day spent working at Fair Face and attending meetings slipped away. Nothing mattered, not Grams or Courtney. There was only here and now. And Becca. He threw another peanut. This is fun. Becca had brought the fun back into his life. The kind Graham said he needed. He didn't want it to end. At least not anytime soon. Becca didn't want the night to end, delicious food, interesting conversation, and a handsome date who made her want slow, hot kisses. Charmed by Caleb, yes. Enchanted by him, she was on her way. Time to pull back. That was hard to do when he held her hand in the restaurant's parking lot. I had fun tonight, he said. Want to go tie shopping tomorrow? As her heart leaped, common sense frowned. She laughed, not knowing if he was serious or not. I mean it, he continued. Okay, he was serious. She bit her lip. The list of reasons why she shouldn't was long. But those things were easy to forget with Caleb's gaze on her staring like she was the only woman in the world. His world, at least. Talk about oh so dangerous. You should ask your sister to go with you. I know nothing about ties. He brushed his lips over Becca's hair, making her knees want to melt. Courtney understands fashion, but you know me. Becca's heart bumped. 
The thought of spending more time with Caleb made her want to cancel her plans. But she couldn't. I would love to go Thai shopping, but I'm visiting my parents tomorrow. Overnight? A day trip. I need to be back for the dogs. Ah, yes, the dogs. He sounded funny. What do you mean by that? I'm jealous of those pups. She raised a brow. Jealous, huh? You're at their beck and call. It's my job. Admit it, he said lightheartedly. You like dogs better than you like me. He was teasing, but Becca didn't deny the truth to his words. She preferred dogs to most people. But did that include Caleb? It's a different kind of like, she admitted. Dogs are loyal and protective. To them, I'm the center of their universe. That's pretty appealing. True, but a dog can't do this. Caleb dipped his head, touching his mouth to Becca's. Electric. His lips moved over hers, sending pleasurable tingles shooting through Becca. She took all he gave. Forget the meal they'd eaten. All she needed for nourishment was him. He drew the kiss to an end much too soon. You're right. She rubbed her tingling lips together. A dog can't do that. His chest expanded. They sure can't. She laughed. Thanks for dinner. It's been a lovely evening. We don't have to call it a night. Oh, Becca was tempted. Even though she needed to say goodnight, keeping her heart under lock and key was becoming more difficult each time they were together. He'd strengthened her confidence and believed in her. Although she was growing closer to him, she didn't trust her feelings, or his. He didn't appear eager to get into a relationship. She'd avoided them herself. Besides, she hadn't forgotten what Gertie said. There's no reason to rush into anything, right? No, but I would like to spend time with you tomorrow. How about if I go with you to your parents' house? She stared at him in disbelief. Seriously? He nodded. You know Grams, seems fair, I should meet your mom and dad. Becca's muscles bunched. I'm not sure if that's a good idea. His forehead creased. Why not? Becca didn't know how to answer. What's wrong, he pressed. She hesitated, except it wasn't a big secret. My parents live in a trailer park. A lot of people do. They're not like you and your family or any of your friends. That doesn't matter. She wanted to believe him, but she stared at the asphalt. I don't want you to judge them. Or me. But she was afraid to say that. He raised her chin with his fingertip. Have a little faith in me. Becca bit her lip. Sorry. But my parents might judge you, too. You're past. I understand. But I'm not wit. Please let me show you and your parents I'm nothing like him, okay? Becca nodded. If you're sure you want to go. Positive. Chapter 14 On Saturday afternoon, Caleb drove through the entrance of a trailer park in Twin Falls. He wasn't sure what to expect, but so far it seemed stereotypical. Single wides, double wides, and RVs filled the various lots. Cars and trucks were parked haphazardly on the narrow streets. Cats lounged in the sun while dogs barked in his vehicle. Turn left at the Statue of Liberty. You can't miss it, Becca said. I'm looking forward to meeting your parents. She wrung her hands. They can't wait to meet you. A six-foot replica of the Statue of Liberty stood like a sentry at an intersection. Nearby, two men with handlebar mustaches and tattooed arms eyed his sports car. An older woman sat in a rocking chair with a chihuahua on her lap. Becca pointed out the windshield. My parents live in the trailer with the chicken wire fencing and the Jolly Roger flag. Okay. Caleb gripped his steering wheel and parked. Not only was there chicken fencing but also live chickens. Was that legal within the city limits? He turned off the ignition. My parents are normal folks, so don't be nervous, she said. Two thoughts ran through his mind. One, this would be interesting, if not enlightening. 
Two, he doubted he'd see the hubcaps on his car again, but he had insurance. I'm not nervous. Not much, anyway. Good, because I am. Caleb fought the urge to kiss her nerves away. Instead, he squeezed her hand. No reason to be nervous. They're your parents. Exactly. She rewarded him with a grin. If my father offers to show you his gun and knife collection, say no. Otherwise, he'll try to intimidate you. Becca and the private investigator had told him that her father had been in jail for fighting, so this didn't surprise him. Good to know. If my mom mentions UFOs and government conspiracies, smile and nod. Whatever you do, don't mention Roswell or Flight 800. I should have brought a tinfoil hat. If you had, you would endear yourself to her forever. Becca moistened her lips. I'm not kidding. Her serious tone told him she wasn't. If she considered this normal folks, he wondered about her version of abnormal. Given the tailor's daughter had grown up to be such a lovely, caring, and hard-working woman, he shouldn't rush to judgment. He'd made that mistake with Becca. Let's go meet your parents. A couple in their early forties stood on the porch and waved. That's my mom and dad, Debbie and Rob, Becca said. The woman had the same brown hair as Becca, only longer, and a similar smile. The man had lighter brown hair and the same blue eyes as his daughter. They looked so young. More like an older brother and sister, not her parents. My mom was 17 and my dad 18 when they got married. I arrived a week before her 18th birthday. Kids having kids. They thought they were grown up enough, but both told me I should wait until I was older, maybe even in my 30s, to get married. He opened the gate for Becca. Good advice. Make sure none of the chickens escape. Caleb closed the gate behind him and double-checked the latch was secure. Introductions were made. He received a firm handshake from Rob and a warm hug from Debbie. The four of them entered the small trailer. It was tidy and welcoming. Pictures hung on the walls. Knickknacks covered shelves. But no pets. Not a dog or a cat in sight. That surprised him, given Becca's love of animals. Caleb studied the photographs of a young Becca riding a tricycle and one of her winning a ribbon at a 4-H dog show. He motioned to her high school graduation picture. You had long hair like your mom's. She nodded. I'm not that same person anymore. I like my hair shorter. I like it, too, he said, noticing her parents watching the exchange with interest. Why don't you help your mother with dinner, Rob said to Becca. I'll keep Caleb company. She followed Debbie into the kitchen. Rob slapped him on the back. So are you into guns and hunting? He remembered what Becca had told him, but he wasn't about to be intimidated. My grandfather used to take my best friend and me elk hunting. Crossbows, not guns. Bag anything? A buck. Caleb had been surprised when he'd hit the animal. There'd been a burst of excitement at making the shot and a rush of sadness at seeing the elk fall. He was so much bigger than me. I had a hard time getting him back to camp. Rob looked toward the kitchen. I've done some bear hunting. Caleb expected to be invited to see the gun collection next. Rob leaned closer. Never could bring anything I shot home, or Becca would cry. You might not want to mention that elk. She's fond of animals. Might hold it against you. So much for being intimidated. Thanks for the advice. You're welcome. Rob's gaze drifted to the kitchen again. He lowered his voice. My daughter's caught some bad breaks. Becca told me. She works hard. Sends us money, even when she doesn't have much herself. Rob's gaze met Caleb's in understanding. I don't want my little girl hurt. Me, either. She's a special woman. Good to hear you say that. Becca's never brought a man or a boy home before. Caleb straightened. That surprised him. But she hadn't asked him home to meet her parents. He'd invited himself. She must have agreed with the advice about waiting to get married until she was older. She had goals and dreams. 
the last thing she needed was a boyfriend to get in the way. It was the same for him with a girlfriend. This would make life easier for both of them because they wouldn't have to worry about things getting serious and complicated. They could keep having fun together and enjoying each other's company. Yes, this would work out well. In the kitchen, Becca put the tray of biscuits into the preheated oven. She set the timer. Dinner smells good. Meatloaf with mashed potatoes and apple pie for dessert, her mother said. Caleb's handsome. He has the prettiest eyes and the nicest smile. You like him. We haven't seen each other long. That doesn't mean you can't have feelings for him. Her mother stirred the gravy simmering on the stove. I knew your father was the one a week after we met. Becca had heard the story of how they met at a local burger joint over chocolate milkshakes and french fries many times. How did you know? Her mother tilted her head. We fit from that very first day. When we were apart, it wasn't awful like the world was ending or someone had died, but when we were together, things were better. We were a team. We complimented each other. If that makes sense. That was how Becca felt with Caleb. It does. Do you think you and Caleb might turn into something serious? Yes. But she was afraid to voice her desire aloud. Afraid to believe in a happily ever after with him. Maybe. Her mother removed a bottle of salad dressing from the refrigerator. How does he make you feel? Special. Important. Like I can do anything. Her breath caught. I think I'm falling for him. You think? Becca laughed. Okay, I'm falling. I may have already fallen. It's scary. Falling for someone is very scary. It's normal to feel that way. But good, too. Her mother touched her shoulder. You can't live stuck in the past. Afraid. Caleb isn't Whitley. If you like Caleb, give him a chance. I thought all I needed in my life were dogs, but after meeting Caleb. And kissing him. You want more, her mom said. Yes. Becca not only wanted more, but she also needed more. That terrified her. The last time she'd wanted more, she ended up heartbroken and in jail. She hated to think that could happen again. But we're so different. I'm not sure it can work or if I can fit into Caleb's world. Be yourself. If who you are doesn't fit, then Caleb's not the right man for you. Mom. I'm serious. Her mother hugged Becca. You are a sweet, generous, smart woman with so much love to give the right man. He might be the one for me. Only time will tell. Caleb wouldn't waste hours to drive to her parents' house if she didn't mean something to him. He acted as if he accepted her past. He called, texted, and wanted to spend time with her, which suggested he had feelings for her. The only question was, what kind of feelings? I hope it doesn't take long. Patience is a virtue. Becca checked the biscuits. I spent three years being patient. Don't I deserve a break this time? Sorry to say, baby, but there aren't many breaks with love. Love. Becca liked the sound of that, liked it a lot. She only hoped Caleb would, too. And that this time wouldn't turn out to be another big mistake. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. For hours later, the headlights of Caleb's car cut through the darkness. Becca sat in the passenger seat, cocooned in comfy leather. As she glanced at his handsome profile, warmth flowed through her. The visit went well. I had fun. He kept his eyes on the road. Your parents are great. They like you. The feeling's mutual. Caleb maneuvered the car around an orange semi-truck. Your dad didn't pull out any guns or knives. Lucky, she teased. He'd threatened to do that if you turned out to be a bozo or an idiot. Glad I'm neither of those things. He readjusted his hands on the steering wheel. Your mom is a kick. She should have been a lawyer. She had me almost convinced we never landed on the moon. Becca laughed. 
my mom can argue with the best of them. But I'm happy she had you instead of going on to college. The pitter-patter of her heart tripled. Me, too. What's your week like? There's a local dog show on Saturday and Sunday. I'll drive back and forth each day. We're too busy producing products in the lab for me to be away. It will be a jam-packed week for me, too. Bummer, but she wouldn't complain after spending today with him. We can call or text. He nodded. We'll figure out something. The perfect end to a perfect day. Well, that, and Caleb's toe-curling goodnight kiss. After he left, Becca brought the dogs to the guest cottage. I'm in such a good mood tonight. You guys can sleep with me. She closed the blinds and then changed into a pair of flannel shorts and a t-shirt. With two dogs on the bed with her, another three on the floor, and a laptop on her legs, she answered emails about the products, a result of the samples she'd handed out at dog shows and word of mouth. They'd turned the lab into a mini-manufacturing plant, but Gertie's research assistants took the temporary change in job responsibilities in stride. Becca's cell phone rang. She glanced at the clock on the nightstand, 11.28 p.m. late for a call. Unless it was Caleb. Adrenaline surged. She grabbed the phone. The name on the screen read Courtney Fairchild. Becca hit answer. Courtney? Sorry to call so late. She sniffled. I'm in a bit of a jam. The words came out stilted. Something was wrong. What's going on? My, um, car's in the Boise River. Concern ricocheted through Becca. Are you hurt? Her sharp tone worried the dogs. As Maurice tried to climb on her lap, Hunter jumped off the bed. I'm... I'm not sure. Courtney's voice quivered. My car is ruined. Caleb's going to kill me. That's why I called you and not him or Graham's. You won't be mad at me. Of course, I'm not mad. Becca changed out of her pajamas and into clothes. Where are you? Courtney gave her the crossroads. Just follow the flashing lights. I need a ride home. If I don't end up at the hospital. There's a cute firefighter who wants me to go. Listen to him. Okay. I'll do whatever he says. She sounded strange, mixed up, in shock. I can't believe I ruined another car. Caleb will. Don't worry about your brother. Becca slipped on her sandals. I'm putting the dogs in the kennel and then we'll drive over. If you're not at the river, I'll go to the nearest hospital, okay? Thanks. I appreciate it. Becca hoped Caleb wouldn't be upset for not calling him immediately. But she'd been in a similar spot. It had been difficult for her to call anyone. She was happy to be there for Courtney, and as soon as Becca knew more, she would contact him. See you soon. Hours later, Becca dozed in the waiting room of the hospital. She'd sat with Courtney until they took her for more tests because of the nasty bump on her head. What are you doing here? Caleb's voice startled Becca. She rubbed her tired eyes. I'm waiting for Courtney. They took her back a little while ago to do one more test. He stood in front of her with a narrowed gaze and his mouth set in a firm, thin line. He crossed his arms over his chest. No. I mean, why are you here in the first place? Her hackles rose at his harsh tone and intimidating posture. She understood why he was upset, which was the only reason she refused to get angry. Courtney called me. She was hurting and afraid. My sister should be terrified. Caleb practically growled. He shifted his weight from foot to foot. She could have been killed texting while driving or killed somebody else. Becca fought the urge to comfort him, but his posture screamed hands off. Thankfully, she wasn't, and she didn't. Her car is ruined. The airbag saved her life. He looked tense, like a spring ready to pop open. His jaw was as rigid as a steel girder. But beneath the anger lay fear, fear for his sister's well-being. Becca didn't care if he didn't want her comfort. 
She touched his arm anyway. His muscles bunched under her palm, and that hurt, but she tried not to take it personally. Courtney is okay. This time. Like the others. He exhaled, slowly. One of these times, she won't be. That will kill Grams. And him. Becca's heart squeezed. Courtney's accident was tearing Caleb up inside. She stood before wrapping her arms around him. His body stiffened tightly, she might as well be hugging a tree, but she gave it her all. He backed out of her embrace. You shouldn't but into my family's business. Wait. What? Where had that come from? He was emotional, but his words were a slap to her cheek. She took a breath. And another. I'm not butting in. I told you, Courtney called me. Suspicion filled his gaze. Something Becca hadn't seen since they first met. Why didn't you call me? Your sister wasn't ready to see you. Why? She has a terrible headache and can't think straight. It appears she has a concussion, but the doctor is running another test. Courtney wanted to wait until she had a diagnosis to call you. And you didn't think I should know what happened to my sister? Becca tried not to take his anger personally. It was late. If her injuries had been more serious. The police considered it serious enough to contact me. The police? I'm co-owner of the car. But that's the last time I do that. He brushed his hand through his hair. Courtney needs to deal with the consequences of her actions. Clean up her messes. Not have others do it for her. She's still young. Only a year younger than you. That surprised Becca. She seems younger. That's because Courtney acts like a spoiled little girl. She's too much like our father. My grandmother bailed him out of so many jams he never learned from his mistakes. My sister is the same way. It isn't always easy to learn from one's mistakes. Sometimes the lessons are so in your face it's hard to miss them. But other times, it's not as clear. As he studied her, the anger disappeared from his eyes. You learned. I had three years to think about what I did. But now she wondered if she'd learned anything during that time. One thing was evident tonight. Caleb didn't want her here. He tried to keep what happened with his family private. From her. She ignored the sting in her heart. She needed to focus on Courtney. Becca took a deep breath. The point is, everyone makes mistakes. That included Caleb. Courtney makes more than most, he countered. You're her big brother. Becca softened her tone, hoping he realized he was making a big mistake with his younger sister. Help Courtney figure out what she should do, instead of getting into so much trouble. I've tried. His anguish sliced into Becca's heart. She touched his back. This time he didn't tense. Try harder. You have a lot on your plate, but Courtney is your sister. I just met her, but it's clear she's bored out of her mind and hates her job at fair face. She's never in the office. Why not? She's off shopping or sleeping late. So, Gertie isn't the only one who lets Courtney get away with stuff. My sister is a handful. Yes, but threatening to kill her or cut her off from her trust fund if she messes up isn't helping matters. I don't want her to end up like our dad. No one does, but she's unhappy. You can't force her to work at a job she doesn't want. She might be better off working in a different department or even another company, Becca said. If you point Courtney in the right direction, that isn't enabling her. It's supporting her and helping her. That's what family does, for one another. I'm acting like a jerk. Courtney will understand. I meant with you. As he touched Becca's face, his gaze softened. I didn't expect to see you here. It caught me off guard. I understand. And Becca did. She wanted to let Caleb into her life and heart, but he wasn't there yet. He might never be there. And that realization sucked. Chapter 15. A concussion is better than dead. 
As Caleb sat at his desk, he kept telling himself that. But it didn't stop one thought from running through his mind. What will happen next time? Because with Courtney, there would be a next time. There always had been in the past. He kept running over what Becca had told him at the hospital, but Caleb had no idea what to do about Courtney. For now, his sister was safe. She was staying at the estate while she recovered. Gertie and her staff hovered over his sister, catering to her every wish and demand. Caleb considered sending her a get-well present, but he thought better of that. No positive reinforcements. Courtney shouldn't be rewarded for what she'd done. A text notification on his cell phone sounded. His screen showed a reply from Ty. Caleb tried not to disturb his best friend while deployed, but he wanted Ty's advice about Courtney. Ty, what Gertie's dog person said is on point. Your sister is bored and unhappy. You need to do something. Caleb, I do, but the question is what? Ty, you can't send her to hell week, which sounds like what she needs, but you and Gertie need to stop making life so easy on her. Tough love, bro. It's the only way. Caleb, easier said than done. Ty, never said it would be easy. Let me know if I can help. Caleb would have preferred if Ty had emailed him a PowerPoint presentation with the necessary steps to take with his sister, but he and Gertie spent a long afternoon together discussing options. He didn't know if Courtney would like any of them, but they were past the point of appeasing her. The rest of the week dragged for Caleb. He hadn't seen Becca since the night at the hospital. She'd been working at the clinic when he was at his grandmother's house. He needed to talk to her in person and explain how Courtney's accident had rattled him and he'd taken his emotions out on her at the hospital. To appease his mounting guilt, he ordered her a flower arrangement shaped like a dog. The white blossoms reminded him of Snowy. A first step. He had a ways to go to get himself out of the doghouse. Yet, the fact he was in this position bugged him. How had he ended up dating someone? He hadn't been looking for a woman to date. Though few knew that he and Becca were going out. Something would have to give. The question was, what? Friday afternoon, he had another meeting. A weird vibe filled the conference room. Caleb sat with his pen between his fingers. Glenn, the vice president of sales and marketing, checked his watch for the twelfth time in the past fifteen minutes. Ed, the usually messy director of advertising, played housekeeper, wiping off the table, pushing in unused chairs, and straightening papers. Julie, the new head of PR, sneaked peeks at the door as if HGTV were about to burst in and award her a dream house. People were ready to kick off their weekends, but that didn't explain why the three of them acted so strangely. Caleb tapped his pen against the table. Anything else we need to discuss? Glances passed among them. Glenn to Ed, Ed to Julie. Julie to Glenn. All over Caleb's head. They might as well have been tossing a ball back and forth for their lack of subtlety. What's going on? Caleb asked. Nothing. Nada. Not a thing. The three spoke at the same time, their words falling on top of each other. Something was up. Caleb might be the CEO, the closest thing to a puppet master Fairface had, but right now, someone else manipulated the strings. He didn't like it. Talk to me, he said, using the hard as nails don't mess with me CEO voice he'd perfected for conference calls with suppliers. Another shared glance passed among the three. Glenn cleared his throat. Just a little anxious. Caleb understood, wanting to go home. He hadn't made plans to see Becca tonight, but he might see if she was free. Let's call it, then. Julie jumped to her feet, her brown eyes widening, and her gaze darting to the door. Wait. Both Glenn and Ed nodded furiously like Buster Bronco, the Boise State mascot, bobblehead dolls. Don't you want to get out of here? Caleb asked. There's one more thing. Julie practically skipped away from the table, her shoulder-length red hair swinging behind her. She opened the door. A bright light shone in his eyes. Caleb dropped his pen. What's? An attractive woman dressed in a maroon suit burst into the room. 
she held a microphone in one hand and a bottle of champagne in the other. Her straight, bleached teeth were as blinding as the camera light behind her. I'm Savannah Martin with Good Day Boise. She pronounced each word with precision. Congratulations, Caleb Fairchild, you've been named Boise's Bachelor of the Year. What the? With lightning-quick moves that would make a ninja in high heels proud, Savannah thrust the champagne into his hands and shoved the microphone into his face. Isn't this exciting news? Caleb's gut churned as if the euro he'd eaten for lunch was waging war on his internal organs. He had no idea what being Bachelor of the Year entailed, but he doubted the hoopla would include Becca. A predatory gleam filled the reporter's eyes. She appeared to be the type to eat her young to get a story. Not having a clue what to say, he stood. That was the polite thing to do, right? Sweat damp in the back of his neck under his lightly starched collar. Thank you. The words rushed out faster than he'd intended. But he hadn't planned on being ambushed by the media and his team. Where was Ty when Caleb needed him? No one had his six here. He glanced at the champagne and composed himself with a breath. This is quite an honor. Indeed. Savannah batted her eyelashes. Predator or flirt? You had several nominations. Who would nominate him for Bachelor of the Year? Not Grams's style, but Courtney had an odd sense of humor. No wonder Caleb's co-workers had been acting so strangely. The three stood together, grinning like fools as if annual bonuses would arrive five months early. They must have had a hand in a few of the nominations. Why? This is unexpected. He wished they had picked another guy in town, someone who cared about this sort of thing. I'm stunned. I'm not. Savannah gave him a look that would make Jack Frost blush. Trust me, ladies, this is the bachelor you want to meet. He's a hot one. Hot, yes. Because of the light in Caleb's face. He was unsure how to respond, so he continued smiling instead. The tight smile hurt his facial muscles. The reporter failed to sense his discomfort. She seemed more interested in the camera than in him. This is Savannah Martin with Fairface CEO, Caleb Fairchild, Boise's Bachelor of the Year. The light went off. The camera lowered. He could see again. And breathe. But the bunched muscles in his shoulders and the fist-sized knot in his stomach didn't loosen. A twenty-something man with a goatee and wearing faded jeans with a green t-shirt walked out of the meeting room carrying his gear. Savannah's smile dimmed as if her on switch connected to the camera's power button. See you on Tuesday. Tuesday? Caleb asked. Did he appear as stunned as he felt? At the studio. The reporter's gaze ran the length of him, slow, methodical, appreciative. She needed to stop looking at him like that. Becca wouldn't like it. Whoa. Shock reverberated through him. He'd never worried about other women sizing him up when he was engaged to Cassandra. He shouldn't care now. Becca didn't own him. They weren't serious or exclusive. That was why he'd put distance between them this week. But was he in deeper than he realized? Julie skipped forward, still looking as if she were in a hazy, dreamy mode. You're being interviewed by Good Day Boise. I have all the details. There'd better be a logical reason for this nonsense, or three people would be searching for new jobs come Monday. See you on Tuesday, then. Caleb tried to keep his voice pleasant. Savannah left the room, closing the door behind her. Sit. His three employees took their places. Caleb sat, placed the champagne bottle on the table, and let his smile drop. What was that all about? Ed and Julie looked at Glenn, who twirled his pen like a baton. The pen rotated faster and faster. Caleb's annoyance increased at the same rate of spin. He shot his vice president a tell me now if you know what's good for you look. Glenn. My wife told me about the contest, he said. I thought it would be excellent publicity for fair face. I agreed, Ed said. Me, too, Julie added. It's a fantastic opportunity. Boise's Bachelor of the Year? The words tasted bitter in Caleb's mouth. 
he picked up his pen and tapped it against the table. Sure about this? Because he wasn't. Two months ago, he would have popped open the champagne to celebrate. Two months ago, he would have phoned his grandmother to share the news. Two months ago, he would have texted Ty to rub it in. Two months ago, Caleb hadn't known Becca Taylor. Her melodic laughter and her hot kisses kept running through his mind. He didn't know what to think. Do. Say. Caleb rubbed his chin. Why didn't you give me a heads up regarding this alternative marketing plan? It's a no-brainer, Ed said. Rave reviews about the Babyline products are pouring in. Mothers are calling asking for samples. The timing is perfect. You can't buy this kind of PR, Glenn said. That's why we nominated you. The three of you? Caleb asked. Our staffs, Glenn admitted. And a few other employees. Ed made it sound like no big deal, but for all Caleb knew, the entire company had nominated him. This is a win-win situation for everyone involved. It was lose-lose for him. Someone, okay, Becca, would be upset. Or was he blowing her feelings for him out of proportion? Yes, they'd spent time together and had fun, but that didn't mean they were serious. And we didn't tell you about it because you've been distracted working with Gertie. And a certain dog handler, but none of them knew about her. Pressure built at Caleb's temples, but he forced himself not to massage his forehead. This idea might not be a slam dunk as we originally thought, but it's a solid plan. Ed rested his elbows on the table. We just need you to play this right to maximize our exposure. It sounded so calculated. Business often was, especially with advertising, and Caleb's job was to be the perfect CEO and present the correct image to the public. His grandfather had instilled that into him, so he needed to understand his team's thought process. Tell me the slant. Julie opened a manila folder. Play up being single, but how you want to settle down. Caleb drew back. Settle down? And have a family, Julie added. His empty hand slapped the table. The harsh sound echoed in the room. What? If you mention wanting a family, it'll be the perfect segue to Fairface's new baby products. The whole reason Gertie created the line is that she wants great-grandchildren, right? Caleb shifted in his chair. Rhea ai Don't mention Gertie. The award is about you, not your grandmother. The strategic glint in Glenn's eye made him appear more like a shark wearing a tie than a business executive. Say you can't wait to use the new organic, all-natural baby products on your kids. Caleb imagined Becca, her stomach round with their child. He shook the image from his head. I'm not married, and having kids is years off. Julie's glowing face made her look as if she were about to bounce out of her chair. That's where the contest comes in. Ed nodded. Good Day Boise wants to run a contest on their website. What's the prize? Caleb asked. Glenn smiled. A date with you. Caleb stared in disbelief. Please tell me you're kidding. This isn't any old date, Julie said as if he hadn't said a word. A dream date. Limousine. Romantic dinner for two at Pacifica. A dance club. That was where he'd gone with Becca on their first date. He couldn't take another woman, make that the contest winner, there, could he? That seemed wrong. You can also do whatever else you want once the official date is over, Glenn said with a wink-wink, nudge-nudge to his voice. Caleb slumped in his chair. Becca wouldn't like this. Wait. What was he thinking? She didn't have a claim on him, so putting her feelings first was out of character for Caleb. He wanted it to stop. We'll do a billboard to promote the contest somewhere visible where most of Boise can see, Ed said. Take it nationally via social media. Offer a plane ticket and hotel accommodations in case the winner is from out of town. Caleb focused on his team. Who picks the winner? Julie rubbed her palms together as if she were trying to spark a fire. A modern-day matchmaker. Dream dates. Matchmaker. This has to be a joke. Do I look like I'm joking? 
Glenn looked ultra serious, as if the fate of the company were riding on this. Good Day Boise's website will list your qualities for the perfect woman. Viewers who believe they qualify can fill out a profile and see if they're a match. He tossed his pen. It skidded across the table. That's marketing genius, Ed said. If you wind up in a relationship with the winner, imagine if you marry her. Julie's voice rose with each word as if Caleb was such a grand prize. His stomach roiled, and it had nothing to do with what he'd eaten for lunch. He needed to speak up. I'm sort of seeing someone. Sort of seeing? Glenn asked. Or dating? Caleb hesitated. It's not that serious. It wasn't. So why was Becca branded on his brain and affecting his work? His family? Why was he putting her ahead of what was best for fair face? He shouldn't be doing any of that. So why was he? Then it shouldn't be a problem, Glenn said. Maybe, but Caleb didn't have the same confidence. He didn't want to hurt Becca's feelings. Put yourself in my shoes. A pair or two of new shoes might soothe any hurt feelings, Julie suggested. Becca didn't care about fancy shoes. But she might like a new pair of grooming scissors. So not enough to smooth out this fiasco. This isn't personal. It's a business decision, Ed said. Remember when we featured Gertie and Courtney in that series of ads for the moisturizing lotion? Sales shot through the roof. How could Caleb forget? That campaign's success had floored everyone, including himself, and driven the company's brand recognition to new highs. Profits, too. One in five women in the United States has tried a fair face product. Can we achieve the same results here? Yes. Ed nodded for emphasis. As Bachelor of the Year, you'll be the Grand Marshal of parades, do interviews, and cut ribbons at opening ceremonies. By the time we milk the last drop out of your title, two in five moms will use our new products on their babies. That would make you happy, Glenn said. I'd be thrilled. And Caleb would be. He considered the numbers. The exposure. The profits. Face it. The website contest wasn't that big a deal in the grand scheme of things. One date. With a stranger. No commitment other than time, an evening. Except for Becca. Becca. He should stop worrying. They weren't dating exclusively. They had fun together. But getting involved with her would be too complicated and only add to his list of responsibilities. Becca. Her parents, Debbie and Rob. All the dogs. That would be too much with everything else on Caleb's plate. He didn't want to take on anything more. Come to think of it, this might work out in his favor. He wanted distance. The Bachelor of the Year award would be the perfect reason for him to refocus on work and get Becca out of his heart, make that his mind. He was blowing a few dates, uh, get-togethers, out of proportion. He wasn't about to fall in love with her. No worries at all. Besides, Becca was practical. She would understand he was doing this for fair face. She wouldn't care. At least, she shouldn't. They weren't boyfriend and girlfriend. They had made no commitment to one another. He wasn't ready to go down that path again. Tonight, he would tell her that. Okay, Caleb said. Let's make this work. Chapter 16 Later that night at an Italian cafe in downtown Boise, Becca sat across from Caleb. Thanks for inviting me out to dinner. I didn't expect to see you this week. Sorry for it being last minute, but I'm glad you were available. She was, too. A date with Caleb was the best way to spend a Friday evening. Well, you made it a tough choice, go out with you or get ready for the dog show tomorrow. He glanced up from his menu. Thanks for choosing me. The romantic tune played by her heartstrings matched the violin music in the restaurant. Romantic, indeed, with a lit candle stuck into a wax-covered bottle of Chianti. A single red rosebud sat in a small glass vase, looking so perfect she'd wondered if the flower were real. One sniff of the sweet fragrance answered that question. Real. 
just like tonight. She looked over her menu at Caleb. He wore a navy suit, white button-down, collared shirt, and a colorful red tie with swirly patterns. Proper CEO, definitely. Handsome, oh yes. Swoonworthy, no doubt. Becca swallowed a sigh. She enjoyed spending time with him. It didn't matter what they did, either. His company and his kisses were more than enough. A good thing he seemed to agree. She'd worried what happened at the hospital had changed things between them. He hadn't called or texted, and hearing from him today had been a relief. Courtney is creating the labels for the dog products. She has an eye for design. Wait until you see the finished product, he said sarcastically. Caleb. Okay, I'm not being nice. He stared over the top of his menu. Did you hear after Courtney recovers from her concussion, she'll do four-week rotations through various departments to see what jobs are available at Fairface? No, but that's wonderful. We'll see how it goes. He didn't sound hopeful. Have faith. You haven't been through this with my sister before. No, but I've been through it myself. Imagine if Gertie hadn't taken a chance on me. We wouldn't be here tonight. A chill ran down her spine. Becca expected Caleb to say something funny or sincere. She wanted him to smile or laugh. Instead, he read his menu. That was odd. Good day at work? Typical. His one-word answer was atypical. Usually, he told her what he'd done, a story from a meeting, or an office anecdote. What are you ordering, she asked. The salmon. You? The halibut special sounds tasty. It does. Standard dinner conversation, except not for them. Each word made Becca want to squirm in her seat. She crinkled the edges of the menu. The words blurred until she couldn't stand it. Is something wrong? I wouldn't say wrong. Okay, she wasn't paranoid. But that didn't make the churning of her stomach any better. What, then? Becca tried to sound nonchalant. She took a sip of water, hoping to wash away the lump in her throat. His gaze met hers. I was named Boise's Bachelor of the Year today. Becca choked, coughed, but managed not to spit out the water. She swallowed instead. Wow. She struggled to come up with something other than, but aren't you dating me? You must be, excited. Not really. She bit the inside of her cheek. So, this isn't that big a deal? He set his menu on the table. Everyone at Fair Face is calling it a PR coup. What do you mean? I'm being interviewed on Good Day Boise next week. Wow. Oops. She'd already said that. But her mind was reeling. A TV interview is huge. I've done interviews before. Caleb was downplaying this. The Bachelor of the Year must be like the Sexiest Man Alive Award, more of an honorary title than anything else. No reason for her to freak out. Technically, he was still a bachelor. Becca needed to be supportive, not act like a shrew. She raised her glass in the air. Congrats. He studied her with an odd expression. You don't mind? Why would I, she asked as much for her benefit as his. I don't see a ring on your finger. Or one on hers. Yet. But, even though she knew better, and his harsh words at the hospital had stung, she imagined a tuxedo-clad Caleb sliding a shiny gold wedding band onto her finger. Her insides twisted. She took another sip of water, but it didn't help. Caleb, however, appeared to be more relaxed. The tension on his face disappeared. Even his posture changed. He picked up his menu. Thanks for being so understanding about this. Why wouldn't I be, she asked herself aloud. It's an honor. You're great. You know that? So, being understanding got her a compliment. She would take it. Thanks. The women will throw themselves at you trying to capture the Bachelor of the Year's heart. His smile returned, reaching his eyes. They can try, but they won't succeed. 
Caleb's words put her at ease. His heart wasn't up for grabs, because it was spoken for, by her. Even Becca's fingernails felt as if they were smiling. Good to know. It'll be a big infomercial, for Fairface's new organic baby product line. Bachelor and babies. Not the usual combination. He shrugged. It's how things are done these days. Business. Nothing personal. How many times had she heard that since meeting Caleb? More times than she wanted to remember. Except. Something bothered her. It was as if a familiar little voice of caution was whispering inside her head. The same voice she should have listened to before going out with Wit and his friends that fateful night. Stop. Caleb Fairchild was nothing like those rich kids back in high school. He might wear designer labels, drive an expensive car, and have a ton of money like they did, but he cared about her. Everything he'd done proved that. He hadn't fallen for her the way she had for him, but he liked her. She should enjoy this time with Caleb, not borrow trouble, because things would only improve between them. A satisfied smile settled on her lips. She reached into her purse. I have something for you. What? She handed him a gift bag. This. As he pushed through the tissue paper, he laughed before pulling out a red tie with black paw prints. You shouldn't have. We never went shopping for a replacement. I was supposed to pay for it. She lifted one shoulder. Although she saved most of her money or sent the extra to her parents, the tie was worth splurging on. I saw it and thought of you. I love it. He placed the tie back in the bag. Thanks. Becca shimmied her shoulders. You're welcome. I was all wrapped up in my head, overthinking things, and now, he stared at her. You put me in a much better mood. That pleased her. I'm glad. I'm always happier when I'm with you. His gaze didn't waver. I want you to be happy. Becca's heart sang with joy. She knew he cared. I am. Ever since Caleb had entered her life, things had gotten better, not worse. I love you sat on the tip of her tongue. Those words would be so easy to say. But she wanted the timing to be right. She wanted the place to be perfect. She wanted him to say the words back to her. Becca needed to wait. Let this bachelor thing blow over. Give them more time to make memories together. But soon. Very, very soon. Tuesday morning at the television studio, the lights beat down on Caleb. Sweat damp in the back of his neck, a mix of heat and nerves. The red light on the cameras reminded him the show was being broadcast live. He needed to act like he'd rather be here than at the dentist for a root canal. But sitting on the couch with Savannah and Thad, the hosts of Good Day Boise, was the height of awkwardness. The two looked like after pictures from a plastic surgeon's office, with their bleached smiles, pouty fish lips, and straight, proportioned noses. They droned on about this year's bachelor candidates and why Caleb had been chosen number one. He kept a smile superglued on his face and nodded when he thought appropriate. Savannah leaned toward him with a coquettish grin. He looked away. Thad laughed. The big question our viewers want answered. Single female viewers, Savannah interrupted. Though there may be some married ones, too. Thad guffawed. Or maybe it was another of his fake laughs. Is there a special woman in your life, Caleb? Becca. An image of her appeared front and center in his mind. He'd plan on breaking up with her on Friday night until he realized she saw things between them as casual as he did. Why would I? I don't see a ring on your finger. Caleb hadn't realized how much he needed to hear her say those words. They had been both a surprise and a relief, but it meant he hadn't needed to break up with her. That was a good thing because her sweet smile made his day. Her beautiful eyes lit up each time she saw him. Her hot kisses turned him on. And he loved the tie she'd given him. Saying Becca would be easy and feel right, except her name wasn't on the script he was supposed to follow. Besides, it didn't matter, anyway. 
she understood and wouldn't care. They weren't serious. Caleb took a deep breath. No one's special. Which is too bad. Why is that? Thad asked. The hosts gobbled the bait, precisely the way Ed had said they would. Time to reel them in with the money shot. Or, in this case, the perfect sound bite. Caleb straightened. Because I want to start a family. Savannah and Fat exchanged glances. Excitement danced in their eyes. Boise's Bachelor of the Year wants a wife and babies? They spoke in unison, in a creepy sing-song voice. Becca remained front and center in his mind, calling to Caleb. Speak up. His heart cried. Why would his heart be involved in this? It shouldn't be. Get with the program, Fairchild. Caleb swallowed around the lump in his throat. He pushed Becca from his thoughts. He needed to follow the script. Yes, I want a family. It's important to me to have one. Savannah touched his sleeve with her bright red painted nails, making him think of a spider, the kind who eats their mates. What is a handsome, rich industrialist looking for in his perfect woman? Perfect woman. His stomach churned. Caleb knew what he wanted, who he wanted. But the PR department had dreamed up a list of qualities for him. The requirements technically fit his position and roughly reflected his interests for a woman who Caleb might consider an ideal spouse. Educated, a keen sense of humor, stylish, well-traveled, social, a little sophisticated, a foodie, a discriminating ear for music, and someone who knows how to play tennis is a bonus since I enjoy it myself. Each word rang hollow. Such a woman was safe, dull, orderly. Like his life. Becca was more than the sum of all those items on the list. Fun, energetic, nurturing. But he didn't dare tell the hosts and the audience about her because Fairface was counting on him. What he thought or what he wanted didn't matter. This was the life he'd been dealt. While Ty was downrange fighting bad guys to keep their country safe, Caleb was stuck on a couch, not being honest, because safe and dull had made his family company successful. Sounds like there might be a woman or two in Boise who share some of those characteristics, Savannah said. Yes, but he wanted only one woman. No, he didn't. Caleb wouldn't get into anything too deep. He knew better than to lower his guard and let Becca, or any woman, into his heart. That would be a bad move because he didn't trust romantic relationships. A serious relationship would be too difficult when he had so much work and responsibility already. I hope so. Except, being with Becca hadn't been work, his heart countered. She made him happy. He wanted his heart to shut up. He proposed once, and that had turned into a disaster. As special as Becca was, as carefree as he felt with her, he didn't want to fall in love with her. He wouldn't do that to himself. Or her. Stop thinking about Becca. The expectations of the marketing and PR departments rode on Caleb's every word, weighing him down and making him sweat more than the hot lights. He always did what others expected of him. Today was no different. Stick with the script. I'd hate to think I'd never be able to use Fairface's new line of organic baby products on my own children. Savannah sighed along with the audience full of smiling women. Baby products. He'd elicited the right response. Good, except his victory rang hollow. My grandmother's ready to be a great-grandmother. She created the products as a not-so-subtle hint to me. All I'm missing is... A wife, Savannah said with glee. Perhaps we can help you find her, Thad said. Savannah nodded enthusiastically. We're holding a contest on our website to find Boise's Bachelor of the Year's Perfect Woman. She might be in our studio audience or watching at home, Thad said. Go to our website and find out if you have the qualities to be Caleb's perfect woman. The prize is a dream date with Boise's Bachelor of the Year. Who knows? The date could turn into something more. Thanks. The word tasted like tar. I'll take all the help I can get to find her. One thought ran through Caleb's head, however. Too bad he hadn't been voted the second most eligible bachelor in Boise. 
then, some other guy would be sitting here being asked about the kind of woman he wanted to marry. At least this would be over soon. He would go on one date with the winner and then get on with his life. Win-win, right? In the guest cottage, Becca stared at the TV. She held on to two dogs, Dozer and Hunter, one on each side of her. Each breath took a concerted effort because her throat burned. Tears filled her eyes. Don't cry. Don't cry. Do not cry. She blinked. She'd set the DVR to record the interview. She never wanted to watch it again. Her heart ached, a painful, squeezing kind of hurt. Disappointment. Betrayal. Caleb had made her think this Bachelor of the Year thing was no big deal. That it was business. No one special. She sniffled. PR opportunity or not, his words on this morning's interview stung, more than she thought possible. So much for protecting her heart. Becca hadn't. It had splintered into a million razor-sharp shards. And now, women all over Boise, likely northern Idaho and eastern Oregon, would compete to go on a dream date with him, hoping to become his wife. Thank goodness she hadn't told him she loved him. She wanted to throw up. Tears continued to sting her eyes. Based on the list of qualities, he wanted a woman with a similar background and upbringing. She might be able to write a business report, but an AA degree didn't count as educated. She preferred casual food to fancy dishes. She'd never traveled outside the Pacific Northwest. Hurt sliced through her. Insecurities rushed to the surface. The dogs squirmed out of her arms. She let them go. Why had Gertie played matchmaker when Becca was so wrong for Caleb? She wrapped her arms around her stomach. Gertie should never have chosen some fish out of water to put in the rich, corporate aquarium for her grandson. While who he dated might not influence Fairface's bottom line, there was intrinsic value to the woman he married. Becca rocked back and forth. He'd shown his practical side during the interview. He didn't need someone who preferred the company of dogs, not dressing up, and eating hot dogs. He required a corporate wife, someone who would entertain, dress the part, and play hostess. The perfect woman. A trophy wife. A vice tightened around Becca's heart, pressing and squeezing out the blood. Her breathing hitched. How had she completely misread the man? She must have missed the signs, because she enjoyed being with him. The same way she'd ignored them with wit. So foolish. It hadn't felt the same, but he was older, and he had more experience. She hadn't thought him capable of deceit and manipulation, but what he'd just said proved she didn't know him. Not really. Caleb hadn't mentioned the dream date contest, only about being named Bachelor of the Year and doing an interview. He'd lied by omission, which made her wonder if he'd lied about other things he'd said to her. She'd told him she wouldn't pretend to be someone she wasn't after what happened with Wit. If she wasn't what Caleb wanted, was this his way of breaking up with her? Becca couldn't answer that question herself, but she intended to find out the answer. Sooner, rather than later. Chapter 17 If not for the time of day, champagne would flow at fair face. After Caleb's interview, interest in the new baby line skyrocketed. Whatever issues he'd had about saying he wanted to settle down had disappeared. Genius. Brilliant. Smart move. The words described how wonderfully they'd pulled off the PR coup with his appearance on Good Day Boise. His assistant buzzed him. Miss Taylor is here to see you. Caleb hadn't expected to see Becca today. But he would meet with her for a few minutes before he went to the celebration in honor of his award and interview. Send her in. As Becca entered his office, the others left. See you in the cafeteria, Ed said on his way out. Caleb nodded. I'll be down shortly. The door closed. She wore a pair of plain khakis, a blue blouse, and canvas tennis shoes. She looked neat, fit, and very pretty. But she wasn't smiling. That wasn't like her, unless. He walked around to the front of his desk and leaned against it. You saw the interview. 
I did. She raised her chin. I'm sure all the women applying to win a dream date with you have crashed the show's servers. Her sarcastic tone matched her expression. It's just a contest. A promotion. She pursed her lips. Then why didn't you tell me about it? The way she was responding confused him. I explained the award to you, but you said it was fine. That there was no ring on my finger, so I didn't tell you about the other part. It's just business. Business? Disbelief filled her voice. You listed the qualities of your perfect woman. None of which I have. This is why he should have broken up with her on Friday. She said one thing but didn't mean it. Cassandra used to do that. The PR department provided the list. It's a publicity stunt. Nothing more. It hurt hearing you say all those things you want and imagining the perfect corporate trophy wife who fits the list. A woman who isn't me. I told you it wasn't my list. But it's not like we're seriously dating. Ouch. You said so yourself. Maybe not in so many words. She stared at him as if he'd grown a third eye and horns. At least I have bruises on both cheeks now. I. I'm sorry. I never intended to hurt you. But Caleb had, and he couldn't take it back. Her bottom lip quivered. He wanted to take her in his arms and make things better, but he didn't. The way she'd been on his mind the entire interview had been a sign. He'd gotten too close to her. It was time to pull back. Not a little. A lot. This was for the best. For Becca. In him. So what happens next, she asked. I don't mean your dream date. I'm talking about you and me. You and me. Not us. That had to be a good sign, right? I'm not in a place to have a serious relationship. I figured as much. Her words made him feel better. With her working with Gertie, they needed to end things in a civilized manner. You're busy with the dog products and developing a handling career. Becca's gaze narrowed. Don't you dare put any of this on me. Guilt coated his throat. Okay, wrong move. It's all me. Yes, it is. She wet her lips. Why did you go out with me? The question was unexpected, but he didn't mind answering. You're fun to be around. Fun, she repeated. I thought things were more serious than that. On Friday, you said. That was about your award, not us. Oh. He stared at the tips of his shoes. I can't. Can't? Have a serious relationship. I've been too distracted. I need to get back to work. So, this is about fair face? He glanced up at her. After my father died, my grandparents transferred their hopes and dreams for him onto me. I've spent my life trying to do everything my father didn't do. For my family and fair face. I can't take anything else on. You mean me? Yes. She sighed. I don't want to be your responsibility. I'm doing fine on my own. Becca was. And she cut through his reasons like a skilled surgeon. He would try again. I'm not ready to make an emotional commitment. The last time he did that, it blew up in his face. Yet something about Becca had made him forget that. Still, he wouldn't allow himself to be turned inside out again. He couldn't make the same mistake as he did with Cassandra. Look. I'm sorry if I sent the wrong signals. But I can't risk the indulgence of a relationship right now. Flames ignited in Becca's eyes. Her jaw tensed. The indulgence of a relationship? Perhaps that's the wrong term. He was bungling this. He wasn't usually so clumsy, but the hurt in Becca's expression killed him. His brain wasn't functioning. More proof he had to get her out of his life. I need to focus on fair face. Nothing else. Not even the dog care products. His words were meant for her but they boomeranged, slamming into him as if he'd punched himself in the gut. They hurt, but he'd had to say them because he couldn't keep seeing her. Becca swallowed. Her eyes dulled. He reached for her, but then he drew his arm to his side. 
if he touched her, he might not want to let go. I should have gone about this differently, but I didn't. We had some good times together. Let's not have this blow up into something awful. That's the first thing you've said that I agree with. She pursed her lips. Thanks for opening my eyes to the truth. The truth? She raised her chin. You don't deserve me. Becca. You act responsible and practical, but you're not. Her voice rose but remained steady. I'm guessing you dated me to appease Gertie and keep her happy. You made sure I wasn't scamming your grandmother and had a little fun at the same time. No, her words cut into him like a dagger to the heart. I went out with you because I wanted to be with you. No other reason. But once things turned into something real, where you would have to take a risk, you decided it was over between us. You could have spoken up, let me know how you were feeling and what you were thinking, but that would have been too scary, so you followed someone else's script, the way you've done your entire life. That's not true. But his words didn't have a firm conviction behind them. He would try again. Not true at all. It is, because I was once there myself. But I'm over the weariness of my past. In part, thanks to you. But you're not over it, because of your mother, your father, and Cassandra. I'm not sure you ever will be, either. As she squared her shoulders, Becca met his gaze. I never thought I'd say this, but I feel sorry for you, Caleb Fairchild. She turned and walked to the door. He stood, his heart pounding in his chest. You have no idea what you're talking about. Becca didn't glance back. She kept walking out of his office and out of his life. Which was what he'd wanted to happen. So why did it hurt so badly? Becca fought the urge to run out of Caleb's office. Instead, she kept her pace steady and didn't increase the length of her strides. She made a conscious effort not to slam the door behind her. No making a scene. And no crying. Still, her anger spiraled. She knew her worth. She wouldn't forget that or become someone else to make Caleb love her. Screw him. Becca should have seen through his BS, through the sweet words and tender smiles and hot kisses. Caleb didn't accept her for who she was. He wanted someone more suited to his world. He wouldn't take a risk on her. On them. She marched to the elevator. He might blame his job at Fairface or his family or a hundred other things, but bottom line, he wasn't capable of loving her as she was. That was what Becca deserved. What she wanted. The elevator dinged, and the doors opened. Becca stepped inside. She poked the button for the lobby, nearly breaking one of her short fingernails. How could she have been so stupid again? She tried to fit in and prove herself to gain Caleb's acceptance. But the people who truly loved her and understood her accepted her fully, the way the dogs did. People like Gertie and her parents. Anything else Becca accomplished was the proverbial icing on the cake. She hadn't needed to earn their love. Love was unconditional. And if it wasn't, she wasn't interested. Period. Chapter 18 The weeks ran into each other. Caleb tried to focus on work but thinking about Becca distracted him as much as when she was a part of his life. Not seeing her hadn't gotten easier. The passing days intensified a need he didn't understand. Still, he kept telling himself breaking it off now had saved them both from suffering any genuine hurt. Things had worked out for the best, and it was time to move on. Logically, he understood that. But tonight, on his dream date at Pacifica, he wondered if moving on had been the right decision. Thanks to the heat from the camera lights and a powerful case of nerves, sweat dripped down the back of Caleb's neck. The cordless microphone he wore didn't help. The only time he'd been this uncomfortable had been during the interview. He wanted to give away his award and forget about it. But first, he needed to survive the dinner. A cameraman stood next to the elegant table for two. So far, the man had filmed every moment between Caleb and Madeline Stevens, a beautiful blonde 30-year-old woman, from picking her up in a limousine to ordering their meal. The night, however, wasn't the disaster he expected. 
the matchmaker, Hadley Lowell Mortensen, aka the wife finder, deserved full credit. Her pick for his dream date shocked him. Madeline met the PR department's qualifications, and then some. She'd graduated from Yale, studied in Paris, owned an art gallery, and sat on the board of two local nonprofits. Her black cocktail dress showed off her curves. She was everything a man in his position should want in a girlfriend, a wife even. Except she wasn't Becca. It shouldn't matter, but it did. Caleb bypassed his wine glass and sipped water. Madeline glanced at the camera. I had no idea tonight would be a threesome. Sense of humor, check. He'd been crossing off the qualities she met from his mental list. No one mentioned we'd have a chaperone, and everything would be filmed. He would never have agreed to the date if he'd known a follow-up story, complete with film footage, would be on Good Day Boise. I'm sorry. Don't be, she answered quickly. This is beyond both of us. But we're getting a taste of what being on a reality TV show would be like. I'll pass. Me, too. She stared up through her mascara-covered eyelashes at him and lowered her voice. Let's ditch him and find a private place where we can talk. Her suggestive tone told him talking wasn't what she had in mind. Caleb, however, didn't want to do anything other than call it a night. He hated being here, for agreeing to this ridiculous marketing scheme, and pretending to be interested in such a lovely woman when he'd rather be eating hot dogs at home by himself or peanuts with Becca. The cameraman moved in closer. Caleb had to remember what was at stake. That meant keeping the conversation flowing, something he struggled to do with Madeline. If Becca were here, the discussion would flow, uninterrupted, from topic to topic. They never ran out of things to say. Wait a minute. Why was he out with a stunningly attractive woman and thinking about Becca? He took another sip of water and then placed his glass on the table. So, do you have pets? No, Madeline said. I work long hours. It wouldn't be fair to leave a dog or cat alone that much. Good answer. One that Becca, make that Grams, would appreciate. I don't have any pets or plants for the similar reasons. As Madeline leaned forward, her face puckered in distaste. At least live plants don't shed. Caleb remembered Maurice and Becca's lint roller. My grandmother has dogs that leave hair everywhere. It's not too bad unless you're wearing black. Madeline's eyes narrowed. She wet her lips. Oh, no. I never meant it was bad. I'm an animal lover. Dogs are the sweetest things. Someday, I'll adopt one from a rescue group. Her backtracking reminded him of Cassandra, saying what she thought he wanted to hear. The opposite of Becca, who spoke her mind. Dogs take work, he said. That's why people use doggy daycares. He cringed. Becca would never take a dog to a place like that. She would rather care for them herself. The way she'd done with Grams's dogs, and Grams, and Courtney, and him. His mouth went dry, so he picked up his water glass and drank. It didn't help. He took another sip. The weight in the pit of his stomach only worsened. The last time he saw Becca slammed into him with the force of a loaded freight train. What had he done? He'd worried about taking on more responsibility, but he shouldn't have been concerned with Becca. She'd been taking care of all of them, especially him, from the day he met her. He'd been wrong about her past. About her. But he hadn't been able to see that until sitting with a woman who on paper should have been perfect for him but wasn't. It wasn't Madeline's fault, but she wasn't. Becca. Tomorrow, he would go to her. Apologize. Ask for a second chance. It might be too late, but he had to try. And he would. Grams called Becca a keeper, and she was, but he'd foolishly let her get away. Now to make amends. And he would. He just had to survive the rest of his dream date first. The next morning, Caleb arrived at his grandmother's estate and rang the doorbell. As he stood there, he bounced from foot to foot, unable to stand still. He had barely slept last night. Mrs. Harrison opened the door. Your grandmother is in her room. 
I'm here to see Becca. She's on her way to a dog show. Thanks. That would complicate matters, but Grams would know where to find Becca. He entered his grandmother's bedroom. A suitcase lay on the bed. Where are you going? Enumclaw, Washington. Not glancing his way, she folded a pink t-shirt. Big dog show. We have a vendor booth for our products. Will Becca be there? She left yesterday in the RV with the dogs and her parents. I'm meeting her there later today. Grams frowned. How was your dream date last night? Did you find your perfect woman? The sarcasm in his grandmother's voice hit like a punch to the gut. Caleb took a deep breath. I won't ask the winner out again. At least you haven't lost all of your brain cells. I don't have to tell you what I think of your appearance on that ridiculous morning show and how badly you hurt Becca, but please think of the repercussions before you do something like that again. I won't ever do that again. At least you learned your lesson. With a shake of her head, Grams returned to packing. Before I forget, I need you to schedule a week's vacation. I'll give a range of dates to your assistant before I leave. Why? It's for your birthday present. He was confused. That's not until January. I want to plan ahead. This was a non sequitur, but he would go with it. Where am I going? A mock Navy SEAL training camp. Caleb's heart skipped two beats. He struggled to fill his lungs with air. He'd wanted to attend one for years. He had the money but not the time. Nobody knew he wanted to go, not even Ty. How did you? Since your birthday is so close to Christmas, I buy your gift in the summer. That way, I make sure it's different. Special. But seal training? He forced the question from his dry throat. Becca suggested it. I wasn't sure. It's the perfect gift. His voice cracked. That's what Becca said. Becca. Of course, she would know what gift he'd love most. She understood him better than anyone. And she was exactly the woman he needed. He'd been such a fool, an idiot. I learned my lesson. I won't try to be someone I'm not ever again. No wonder his list hurt Becca so much. Caleb knew what she'd gone through with wit, but he thought only about fair face and himself. She was correct. He didn't deserve her. But he loved her. His chest tightened with regret. Becca was the one for him. Caleb had wanted her back last night, but it wasn't until now that he realized how much he cared about her. He should have screamed her name during his interview, not taken another woman on a dream date. He should have held on to Becca with both hands, not let her walk out of his office. He should have told her she was his perfect woman. Grams. She walked to his side and touched his face. You're pale as a ghost. He was so used to taking care of everyone, but Becca was different. She'd taken care of him. I've made a huge mistake. The biggest of my life. With Becca? Caleb nodded. He'd always done what others expected of him, put his dreams aside. He'd hurt someone he cared about by doing that. No longer. Becca had been correct. He'd been following a script. That was easier than risking his heart again. He was in the doghouse, but he would beg, perform tricks, and do whatever else was required to be a part of her life. She didn't need him. But he needed her. Her smile, her sense of humor, her love. Graham smiled. So, how do you intend on fixing it? Chapter 19 Becca exited Ring 5 with Hunter's leash in one hand and a best of winners the prize for a dog still working toward his championship, in the other. The sun beat down, but the beagle didn't seem to mind. She, however, couldn't wait to remove her suit jacket. Gertie stood outside the ring, her hands clasped together, and a bright smile on her face. Becca handed off the ribbon. He needs one more major, and he's a champion. So proud of both of you. Thanks. The word sounded flat. Normally, a win would thrill Becca. She would bounce on her toes and tingle with excitement, but today she struggled to keep her feet moving and not retreat to the RV to nap. 
more caffeine might help. She'd lived off coffee lately. What she needed was something to get her out of this funk. She couldn't shake the sadness that followed her like a dark cloud. She'd tried pushing Caleb out of her thoughts. She'd succeeded somewhat, but she'd had no luck getting him out of her heart. At least not yet. This would pass. Soon, she hoped. But Becca didn't regret meeting him the way she had wit. Caleb had shown her what she wanted in a relationship. Let's see how your parents are doing. Gertie had hired Becca's parents to sell the products at dog shows and fill online orders. I also want to show off Hunter's ribbon. They walked along the row of vendor booths, tables, and displays set up under pop-up canopies that provided welcome shade from the sun. Your parents have company at the booth, Gertie said. Her parents enjoyed talking to dog owners about the products. Gertie called them natural salespeople, they were also friendly and hard workers who didn't want to disappoint her or their daughter. Customers are a good thing. This one isn't interested in our line. Becca looked over and froze. Caleb. Her heart tumbled. She couldn't breathe. What's he doing here? Her voice shook as much as her insides. Let's find out. No, Becca's feet were rooted to the pavement. If vampires or brain-eating zombies or axe-wielding murderers were chasing her, she would have remained in place. You go. She only saw his backside, but he wore khakis and a polo shirt. Every nerve ending tingled as if she'd touched a live wire and sent a jolt of electricity pulsing through her. Gertie pulled on Becca's arm. Come on. You're no coward. Yes, I am. Gertie gave a not-so-gentle shove. Chin up and move those feet, girly. Becca moved. It was that or fall over. With each step, an imaginary boom, like an orchestra's timpani, echoed through her. I can't. Yes, you can, Gertie encouraged. Becca crossed the aisle toward their booth. Lightheaded, her stomach churning, she thought passing out was a distinct possibility. If that happened, she wouldn't have to face him. Caleb, Gertie said. He turned. Smiled. Becca went numb. Hello, he said, as if his being at a dog show in another state was normal. She opened her mouth to speak, but no words came out. He stared at Becca with warm, bright eyes. I missed you. Her heart slammed against her ribs. Anger surged. Is this some kind of joke? No, Caleb motioned to the booth. The products are selling, thanks to your top-notch sales force. Becca's parents smiled at her. Her temper spiraled out of control. You discard me like garbage. Hurt my feelings worse than anyone, which is saying a lot after the three years I spent in prison. And then show up here as if nothing had happened. Unbelievable. Tension sizzled in the air. People glanced her way, and dogs barked at each other. You're right. His contrite tone didn't lessen her unease. You've always been right. Okay, she hadn't expected him to say that. I am here, he continued. If you don't want to talk to me, I don't blame you, but I hope you'll hear me out. A beat passed. And another. Five minutes. He pulled her away from the table and glanced at his watch. I'm sorry. So sorry. I hurt you badly. I know I did that, but I didn't mean to, I promise. But, I was getting too attached to you. I was distracted. I was happier with you than my family. That scared me. I was too afraid to take a risk. Too afraid you might be the one to break me. So when my team came up with a marketing plan centered on the award, I agreed. I let them make the decisions I should have made, and I lost the one person I need most in my life. The one person who understands me. The one person who makes me stronger. You took care of me in a way no one else had. I miss that. I miss you. The air rushed from her lungs. A lump burned in her throat, and tears stung her eyes. She couldn't think or speak. You're amazing, unique, and everything I didn't realize I wanted, and then I stupidly let you go. 
he scrubbed his face with his hand. I'm sorry for the horrible way I treated you. I was no better than that idiot, wit. But I apologize for agreeing to the award, interview, the dream date, and breaking up how I did. I don't blame you for hating me, because of all I've done. But if you can find it in your heart to forgive me, I'll make it up to you. Even if it takes the rest of my life. You deserve it. She forced herself to breathe. That's why you came here. He nodded. I couldn't spend another day without seeing you. I love you. Her heart melted. Becca could feel the acceptance. Joy. Love. I have two more minutes. Caleb's eyes were earnest, his voice sincere. His smile, practically caressed. Will you give me a second chance? Becca should tell him no, because she wanted to move on without him. But her heart wanted something different, him. Still, she needed some answers first. What about the Bachelor of the Year award? I'm relinquishing my title. She didn't want to know the answer, yet she had to ask. How did your date go? Okay, except I thought about you the entire time. But it was there I realized the mistake I'd made and that I had to get you back. Somehow. I only wish I'd known that sooner. Regret filled his voice. Please don't say we're over. She took a deep breath and then another. For as long as I can remember, I've been trying to prove myself. If I did that, then people might accept me. She inhaled deeply. But, Gertie encouraged me, and so did you. I realized I didn't have to do anything special. I just had to accept who I am, and the rest would happen. It's happening. His words rushed out. More will. I want to be a part of that, if you'll let me. Will you? The question hung between them as if the words were inside a dialogue bubble in a comic book. The answer was clear. For once, her brain and her heart agreed. Yes. I forgive you. The way she'd finally forgiven herself for her past mistakes. I love you. I have for a while and was waiting for you to catch up. I'm ready to try a relationship, but we need to go slow. Whatever you need. And you need to know I'm in this, for the long haul. That I'm committed to you. I'm committed, too. The words were easier to say than she imagined they would be. But, I want the man behind the pinstripes and fancy silk ties. The guy who grew up wanting to be a Navy SEAL. The one who isn't afraid of dog hair or getting dirty. He's yours. Caleb kissed her forehead. But I don't need to try a relationship. I'm all in. My perfect woman is right here. Hunter barked. Do you think he's jealous? Caleb asked. No, that's his bark of approval. Smart dog. Caleb lowered his mouth to hers and kissed her. Joy flowed through Becca, from the top of her head to the tips of her toes. He was returning the Boise Bachelor of the Year award, but his kiss deserved the prize for best in show. The first of many. She couldn't wait. Epilogue. Six months later. Ty Dooley held on to the dog leash, trying to keep his distance from the Norwegian elkhound, who shed worse than a feather-filled pillow with a hole in it. His best friend appeared calm, as if asking a woman to marry him was just another task on his daily schedule. You're really doing this? Caleb's dull look wasn't surprising. I would have done it at the dog show in August if I thought Becca would have said yes. Ty raised a brow. Will she today? Yes. Caleb didn't hesitate to answer. We needed more time to figure things out. She quit her job at the clinic to concentrate on the dog products and handling. But through it all, one thing has remained clear. Becca Taylor is a keeper, and I'm not waiting to put a ring on her finger. She's good for you. Ty had never seen his best friend with a permanent smile on his face. Caleb had always been strung tight, but he had a more relaxed attitude these days, one that affected everything, from his expression to his posture. Makes you happy. Caleb beamed. She does. Near the patio, a pack of dogs chased each other. 
A few barked. Surprisingly, the dog tie held never once pulled against the leash. It looked like Becca knew how to handle dogs, and Caleb. Good for her. Ty dated. Women were never in short supply around teen guys. But none were what he'd call a keeper, or someone he'd bring back to his hometown to meet Caleb and his family. But are you sure a backyard proposal is enough? A bit low key on the splash and romance meter. I send Becca flowers and buy her things, but that's not why she's with me. She's never cared about those things, Caleb explained. As for romance, this location is high on sentimentality. That didn't have anything to do with romance. Huh? I met Becca on this patio, Caleb said without missing a beat. That's why I'm proposing here and invited our families to be present. Being included as part of Caleb's family made Ty stand taller. Well, then, you better get it done. Right. Caleb hesitated, glancing around. Courtney isn't here. Of course, she wasn't. Ty fought the urge to roll his eyes, something he'd done around the spoiled brat for as long as he would remember. All these years later, she still caused trouble, though less now that she'd joined Fairface's product design department. But according to Gertie, Courtney continued to spend recklessly and attend too many parties. Caleb kept glancing around. Where are you, pampered princess? With each passing second, Ty's anger rose. Courtney knew how important this family barbecue was to her brother, the only person who didn't know the reason behind it was Becca and the dogs, though the elk hound didn't appear too surprised when a ribbon was tied around his collar to hold the ring. What was Courtney's excuse? The Fairchilds had treated Ty like one of their own for nearly three decades. He should offer to help get her in line. Tough love was hard for their family, but he wouldn't go easy on her. But right now, he wanted to do what was best for Caleb. What if your sister doesn't show up? Ty asked. You going to keep putting this off until she does? Caleb sighed. You're right. I just wanted her to be here. If Courtney kept acting like a rebellious teen instead of an adult, someone should ground her. There are cameras set up. She can watch the video and see the photographs. As Caleb's face reddened, he straightened his tie. It was red with black paw prints on it. Not exactly barbecue material, but Caleb tended to dress up, not down. I may have gone overboard to make sure we captured every angle. Dude. Ty laughed. When it comes to Becca, overboard is your middle name. Caleb nodded. Remember the cue? Ty bit his tongue. He was a freaking Navy SEAL who blew up stuff and rendezvoused at exact times on a routine basis. Of course, he remembered his cue. Yes. Good luck. Thanks. With that, Caleb moved toward the patio where Becca spoke to her parents and Gertie. Hey. Caleb slid his arm around Becca. Can I talk to you? Not the smoothest move in the manual but her bright grin suggested anything the guy did would be enough to make her go all hard-eyed. Sure. They stepped a few feet away, to the spot that had been decided upon before all the cameras were set up. Caleb lowered his arm and held her hand. It hasn't been a year yet, but the day we met on this patio changed my life. The two of us couldn't have been more opposite, but the more I got to know you, the better I saw how well we fit together. We agreed to go slow and I'm happy we did, but I'm ready for the next step. I hope you are, too, because I've known for months you're it for me, so. Caleb dropped to his knee. Becca gasped and covered her mouth with her hands. Way to go, bro Ty's smile widened. So far, everything was going according to plan except for Courtney's absence. Will you marry me? Caleb asked, his gaze focused on Becca and his tone full of affection. Will you be my wife and my partner and my dog whisperer? Her face was flushed. You're serious. He nodded. I asked your dad's permission and he said yes, so that just leaves you to answer. So, what do you say? I come with baggage. Me, too, but you also come with lint rollers. Caleb kissed her hand. 
more than a fair trade-off in my book. A lump formed in Ty's throat. Say yes. He held his breath. Becca had better tell Caleb yes. Yes. Happiness radiated from Becca's face. Yes, I'll marry you. Ty unclipped the leash from Morris's collar, careful not to mess up the white ribbon holding the engagement ring, a platinum band inlaid with tiny diamonds with bigger diamonds in the shape of a dog's paw at the center. Go to Becca. The elk count happily trotted toward her. Funny, but the dog seemed to know everyone was watching him. Then again, he was a champion show dog, so it might just be in his blood. Caleb removed the ring from Morris's collar. I thought a large diamond would get in the way of all the things you do with the dogs. But if you'd rather have. This is perfect. Her gaze locked on the ring. I can't tell you how perfect. He slid the ring onto her finger. I love you. She sighed. I love you. Something must have been in the air, pollen, perhaps, because Ty's eyes stung. He rubbed them. She said yes. Caleb picked up Becca and swung her around. The dogs came running to join in the fun. Ty laughed. There'd been times he wondered if either of them would find love. But he was thrilled his best friend had. Caleb had given up so much for his family. He deserved this, and Becca. Gertie came up to Ty. She touched his arm. You're next. He shook his head. Not in this lifetime. Never say never. Gertie's eyes twinkled. There could be a keeper right under your nose. Possibly, but Ty doubted it. Still, he knew better than to disagree with Gertie Fairchild. You never know. Thank you for listening to The Tycoon. A Keeper at Heart Romance, Book 6. Written by Melissa McClone. Text Copyright 2020 by Melissa McClone. Production Copyright 2023 by Melissa McClone.